Hey guys, welcome to the first video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about OpenCV. But first of all, let's see what is computer vision because OpenCV is an open source computer vision library. So computer vision is the way of teaching intelligence to machines and making them see things just like humans. So what happens when a human see an image? He will be able to recognize the faces which are there inside the images. So in its simplest form, computer vision is what allows computers to see and process visual data just like humans. Computer vision involves analyzing images to produce useful information. So to give you some examples, a self-driving car it can detect the lanes using computer vision. Or you might have wondered how Facebook detects images when you upload the images of you with your friends. It becomes possible by Facebook's face and image recognition technology. So now let's see what is OpenCV. So OpenCV, which stands for Open Source Computer Vision, is a library of programming functions mainly aimed at real-time computer vision. It is originally developed by Intel and then it was later supported by a developer called Velo Garage and now it is supported and maintained by ITCs. Now OpenCV is available on Mac, Windows and various Linux operating systems. So we can say that OpenCV is a cross-platform library. Now you can work on OpenCV using C, C++ or Python and we will be using Python to learn OpenCV. Now OpenCV is an open source and free library which is licensed under BSD license. And it's said that it is very easy to use and install that we will see when we will install OpenCV on various operating systems. Now because OpenCV primarily deals with computer vision, that means dealing with mainly images or videos, so I wanted to show you how a digital image is seen by a computer. So digital images are typically stored in the form of matrix. Now if you have heard about PPI or pixel per inch, which refers display resolution that means how many individual pixels are displayed in one inch of digital image so when a computer sees a picture it sees it in the form of pixel matrix now there are two type of digital images one are called grayscale images and other are called colored images so in grayscale images each pixel represents the intensity of only one shade that means how bright or dark the pixel is in other words it is said that it has only one channel so on the right hand side you can see a grayscale image and on the left hand side you can see a colored image so in colored images we have three channels that is R, G, B, which stands for red, green, blue. So grayscale images have one channel and colored images have three channels. Your standard digital camera have three channels. That means red, green, blue channels. So we will learn more about images and how we can process images using OpenCV in the later videos. Now there is one more thing which I want to show you is NumPy. So we are going to learn OpenCV using Python. So when you will install OpenCV library for Python on your operating system, NumPy will be automatically installed with this library. So first of all, what is NumPy? So NumPy is a highly optimized library for numerical operations. Now, as I told you, digital images are 2D arrays of pixels and NumPy library is a general purpose array processing package library. So it provides a high performance multi-dimensional array object and tools for working with these arrays which makes the processing of images easier. Now all the OpenCV array structures are converted to and converted from NumPy arrays 
and in addition you can use more convenient indexing system rather than using for loops so when you want to learn open cv using python you need to have some knowledge about numpy also so if you have some knowledge of numpy library it's good but don't worry i will teach you step by step so you will not miss anything so that was a brief introduction about computer vision and open cv in the next video i'm going to show you how you can install python open cv library and then we will see how we can work with this open cv library so that's it for this video i will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorials for beginners using Python. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can install OpenCV for Python on your Windows operating system. So obviously, you need to install Python on your Windows operating system in order to install OpenCV for Python. So first of all, I'm going to show you how you can install Python on your Windows operating system. And then we will see how to install OpenCV using python now if you have already installed python on your windows operating system you can skip about five minutes of this video and go directly to the point where i am going to show you how you can install open cv for python so let's get started so first of all open your favorite browser on your windows 10 operating system and then search for python and the first link which will appear here will be from python.org so we are going to click on that link and once this python.org website is open you just need to scroll down a little until you see this downloads section and you can see at the time of making this video python 3.7.0 is the latest version of python available so we are going to click on this link which says python 3.7.0 and you will be redirected to this page which says python 3.7.0 and now i'm going to scroll down until i see the files here and you will see there are various kinds of installer available here we are going to install the python using the executable installers so we are going to choose this option which says windows x86 hyphen 64 executable installer and now i will wait for this executable to be downloaded and once this executable is downloaded you just need to click on this exe file and i'm going to minimize the browser here so you can see python's 3.7.0 setup window has been started and on the first window you will see two options here one is install now and other is customize installation so what we are going to choose is this option which says customize installation because when you choose this install now option python will be installed at this path which i don't want to use you can see it's a long path which i don't want to remember so i will use uh, this option which says customize installation and i will also check this option which says add python 3.7 to path so now let's click on customize installation and next you will see this optional feature window and you can see there are some optional feature which this python installer will install for example documentation pip it will install which is a python package manager idle ide python test suite and other feature it's going to install so i'm going to leave everything as default and then i'm going to click next and now this next window will open which says advanced option here i'm going to check this option which says install for all users and i'm going to leave other check boxes as checked and then you will see this section here which says customize install location so i want to install python on my c directory so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open the windows explorer and i'm going to go to the c directory here and once the c directory is open i'm going to right click here and i'm going to create a new directory and i'm going to name this directory as python and then i'm going to press enter and this path i'm going to give here in the customize install location so i'm going to just give this path which says c colon slash python and then backslash python 37 
3.7 here means that we are going to install 3.7 version of Python. So now Python will be installed at this location on my computer. And then I'm going to click on the install button here. And then you will see the installation will start and it will be finished in a few seconds. So just wait for the installation to complete. And after some time, I can see this message which says setup was successful. So I'm going to click on this close button which is going to close this installer. So now in order to check whether Python is installed on our Windows operating system or not, we are going to search for Python here and you will see a few options here. One is this Python 3.7 terminal, other is idle IDE. So first of all, we are going to click on this option which says Python 3.7 64-bit, which is going to open this kind of terminal. So this is a Python terminal and here we can, uh, for example, print something. So I'm going to just write print and in the parentheses and in between the double quotes, I can just write hello world and then press enter, which is going to in return print hello world. That means Python 3.7 terminal is working. So I'm going to close this terminal now. And once again, I'm going to search for Python here. And this time I'm going to select this option which says idle. Okay, so just select this option which says idle and in the parenthesis Python 3.7 64-bit. So this idle is an IDE which comes with Python installation. At the time of installation, we have chosen this option to install idle. That's why we can see this option here. And also this is an interactive shell. So you can once again write a print and inside the parenthesis, you can uh, just write, for example, once again, hello world and then press enter and it's going to give you this kind of output here. So now Python interactive shell is working and idle IDE is also working. So I'm going to close this idle IDE and now I want to check whether Python is working using my command prompt or not. So I'm going to right click on this windows button and then I'm going to click on command prompt and here I'm going to first of all write uh, Python and then press enter. And you can see this Python option is working now, even on your command prompt, right? So here also you can uh, just write print and inside the parenthesis, you can just print uh, hello world and then press enter and it prints hello world in return. Now, once Python is installed on your Windows 10 operating system, we are going to install OpenCV using pip. Now, pip is automatically installed on your Windows operating system with the Python installation. So you don't need to separately install pip on your Windows operating system. It comes automatically with your Python installation. So to verify this, first of all, I'm going to check the Python version. So you can uh, just give uh, this command Python hyphen hyphen version and then you can check the pip version. So you can uh, just give this command pip hyphen hyphen version. So just give this command and it's going to give you the version of pip which is installed on your Windows operating system. So to install OpenCV using pip, you just need to give this command pip install OpenCV hyphen Python. And I'm going to press enter. So you can see OpenCV related packages are downloading now. So now OpenCV Python package is installed using pip on my Windows operating system. Now you will observe one more thing here and that is NumPy package will be automatically installed with your OpenCV Python package. So now once OpenCV Python package is installed, we can verify it by just opening our Python shell. So I'm going to just give a Python command to open the Python shell. And then here I'm going to just write import cv2. Okay, so once you give this command, it should not give you any error. And if this import gives you error, that means OpenCV is not correctly installed on your operating system. Now after importing, you can just check the version of OpenCV which you have installed using cv2 dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore and then press enter and it's going to give you the version of OpenCV which is installed on your operating system and in our case this is 4.0.0 at the time of making this video. Now you can check the same by writing your code inside a python 
file also. So here I have opened my Visual Studio Code editor and I have already created sample.py file. And here also I'm going to import the CV2 package first of all. And then I'm going to print the version of CV2 using this print statement. So I'm going to just write CV2 dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore and then save this script and to open the terminal inside visual studio code you can just press ctrl shift p and then type toggle integrated terminal so just type toggle integrated terminal and then click on this first option which says toggle integrated terminal this is going to open the terminal inside your visual studio code editor so here you can run your python script using the python command so python and then name of the script which is sample.py in my case and then press enter and it's also going to give you the version of opencv which is installed on your operating system so this is how you can install opencv for python on your windows operating system i hope you have enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In the last video, we have seen how we can install OpenCV for Python. Now from this video, we will actually start writing some code. Now moving forward, I will be using PyCharm IDE to demonstrate how OpenCV works. But you are free to use any IDE or any other editor in order to use OpenCV. Now on PyCharm IDE, you need to install OpenCV little bit differently. So if you are using OpenCV, you just need to create a project inside OpenCV. And then you just need to click on file and then go to the settings. Now once the settings window opens, you just need to go to the project and then it will uh, say after colon, your project name so my project name is opencv examples that's why it's written here opencv examples so project colon your project name so just click on this section and then click on project interpreter and on the right hand side you will see all the packages which comes pre-installed when you create a project inside pycharm ide now we want opencv python package so to install OpenCV Python package on PyCharm, you just need to click on this plus button here. And then you just need to type OpenCV hyphen Python. Now the first result you can see here is OpenCV hyphen Python. And the version which is available right now is 4.0.0. .0. 0.21 which is the latest version so to install this package for your pycharm ide you just need to click on install package button and then after some time you will see this message which says package opencv hyphen python installed successfully in the green bar that means opencv package is installed successfully so you can close this window and now you will be able to see opencv hyphen python is added to your packages and also numpy is added to your packages which comes with your opencv python package so i'm going to just click ok and now you will be able to import this cv2 package in your python script now in this video i'm going to show you how you can read images and write images using cv2 package now let me show you where you can find some sample images for your project so you can open the browser and then go to this URL github.com forward slash opencv. So just go to this URL and then under this opencv project in GitHub, you will be able to see these repositories. You just need to choose this repository which says opencv and then you can scroll down and all the images you will find inside the samples folder so i'm going to go inside the sample folder and then inside the sample folder you just need to go inside the data folder so here you will find many sample images and videos 
and other files which you can use in your project for the learning purpose so you can uh, use these images in order to develop your example so what i generally do is i just go to this repository which is under the url github.com forward slash opencv forward slash opencv and then i either download the zip file of this project or clone this github repository on my operating system and once you clone or download this repository it will look like this so it will be downloaded as this folder which is opencv hyphen master and once again you can go to the samples folder here and inside the samples folder you can go to the data folder and you will find all those images which i have shown you on the github repository now to start with we will be using this image which is lena.jpg so i'm going to just copy this image for now and then i'm going to go to my pycharm ide and then i'm going to just paste this image inside my project so this jpg image will be directly available inside my project folder now let's see how we can read images using the cv2 module so you just need to use cv2 and there is a method called i am read which enables you to read the images so the first argument which you need to give here is the image name so i'm going to give the image name which is lena.jpg and the second argument here is a flag so there are three flags you can give here you can either give 0 or 1 or minus 1 flag here so this second argument is a flag which specifies the way images should be read so let me show you all the flags here so the first flag is cv2.imread_color or you can give the integer value of it which is 1 and whenever you give this flag as the second argument of i am read function it's going to load the colored image if you give this flag which is cv2. i am read underscore grayscale or if you give this integer value which is 0 it's going to load your image in grayscale mode and the third flag is i am read underscore unchanged or the value minus 1 which is going to load your image as it is including the alpha channel so for now we are going to just give here zero flag which means we want to load our image in gray scale so now let's run the code and let's see what happens until this point so you can see our code runs fine without giving any error now let me give any random name here as the file name and once again run this code and once again you will see that there is no exception which is thrown here so even if you give the wrong file path or file name here this function is not going to give you any error now in case of wrong path or wrong file name let's say i'm going to just assign this value to a new variable which is img and let's print the value of this img using the print method and then let me run the code once again and you can see whenever you will give the wrong file name here or wrong path here as a result of this method you will get none so you can check the value of image and if it is equal to none then you know that you have done something wrong or you have given some wrong file name or wrong path here let's give the correct file name so i'm going to give the correct file name and then run the code once again and now this time you will see it's going to give you a matrix which means that it has read all the pixels from this image and then assigned it to our img variable 
and the result you can see in the form of this matrix so until now we have just read the image now we want to display our image so in order to display our image what we can do is we can use a cv2 dot i am show method so just write i am show here which is going to show your image so the first argument here will be the name of your window in which your image will open so you can give any name here for example i'm going to give image name here to my window and then the second argument is the image variable which you have read using the i am read method so i'm going to just pass img variable which is this variable here so now will it show the image let's check so i'm going to run the code once again and you can see the image is shown for a millisecond and then it disappears so now we need to add something which will wait for the image to disappear so i'm going to add one more method here which is cv to dot wait key so this cv2 dot wait key is the keyboard binding function and the argument which it takes is the number of milliseconds for which you want to show your image window so let's give 5000 value here which means we want to show the image for 5 seconds and at last what we are going to do is after we have done seeing our image we will destroy the window which we have created so you can uh, just give uh, this method cv2 destroy all windows so destroy all windows simply destroys all the windows which we have created there is one more method which is destroy window and this method you can use to destroy a particular window which we will see little bit later but for now we will just use this method which says destroy all windows so now let's run our code and let's see what happens so now this time you can see our image is loaded for 5 seconds and our image is loaded in grayscale mode now if you give here zero as the argument of wait key method then let's see what happens so i'm going to run my code and now you will observe that your window will not disappear after 5 second or any number of seconds it's going to wait for the closing of this window which we can close from this close button and you can see it's uh, loaded in the grayscale mode i'm going to close this uh, window and here as an argument of i am read image the second argument i want to give here right now is 1 which means the colored image and let's run the code and you can see this image is loaded in the colored mode now let's also check the minus 1 argument which is unchanged so it's going to just load the image as it is with alpha channels so let me just close this image once again so now we have understood how we can read an image using i am read function so let's see how we can write an image to a file using a function called i am write so we are going to just use cv2 uh, once again and then there is a method called i am write which you can use to write an image in the form of a file so the first argument here will be the image name whatever you want to give here so here let's say we want to give the name to our image as lena underscore copy dot png so the image will be saved as the file name lena underscore copy dot png file and the second argument which it takes is the image you want to save so let's save the same image which we have read using the i am read function inside this img variable and pass it as the second variable here and let's run the code and let's see what happens so our image is loaded using this i am show function and now when i close this uh, window here you will observe one more file will be created here so let me just close this window 
and now you can see as soon as I close this window this method is called and after this this I am right method will be called and when this method is called this image is created with the name lena underscore copy dot png we can also open this image and you can see it has the same image which we have seen in the case of lena dot jpg so let me close these two images so now we have understood how we can read the images and write the images using i am read function and i am write function so let's make our code little bit better and what we want to do here now is let's say if somebody presses an escape key then only we want to destroy all the windows without saving it into a new file otherwise if somebody presses the s key then we are going to save this file with the new name let's say lena copy dot png file so i'm going to just capture the output of my wait key so just create a new variable let's say k so now when we press any key this key will be captured in this variable now as you know every key has its own value so we are going to just use a if condition and we are going to just check whether the value of k is equal to 27 which means that we have pressed the escape key and if somebody have pressed the escape key we are going to simply destroy all the windows otherwise let's give the second condition which is l if k is equal to ord and this is a built-in function and it takes one argument which is the key name which we want to press so let's say somebody presses the s key and if somebody presses the s key we just want to save the image which we have read using the i am read function to a second image which we call lena underscore copy dot png and then we will simply destroy all the windows which we have created using i am show method so let's run the code and let's see what happens so i'm going to run the code so this image is loaded and as soon as i press escape button you can see this image disappears that means this condition is met and this method is called and all the windows will be destroyed without saving the image let's delete this image and let's see what will happen when we press the save key so let me just uh, delete this image and now let's run the code once again and this time i'm going to press the s key and once again you can see the windows are destroyed but this image is created once again using this function that means this time this condition is fulfilled and this image is created and after that all the windows are destroyed so this code is working fine for me but in the documentation it's also written that if you are using a 64 bit machine it's better to use this notation with your wait key method which is wait key and this mask here and then once again when we run our code it works uh, as it is but in case if it doesn't work you can try uh, using this mask here so this is how you can read and write images using opencv i hope you have enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video hey guys welcome to this course on python programming for beginners so why learn python because using python you can build almost anything python can be used for web development game development computer vision robotics graphical user interface development and also python is the number one language of choice for machine learning data science and artificial intelligence so the goal of this course is to provide you the working knowledge of python programming we will start with the basics starting from the installation of python on your operating system and then we will learn all the basic concepts in python programming like variables data types operators 
control statements, loops, strings, functions, and also Python collections like lists, tuples, sets, and dictionaries. Then we will move to the object-oriented programming concepts in Python. So in this section, we will start with what is object-oriented programming, what are classes and objects, and then we will cover the concepts like encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction, and access specifiers. Also, we will see some advanced object-oriented programming topics like abstract classes and compositions. Next, we will see how we can handle exceptions using Python programming. Then we will move towards some advanced topics like Python iterators, generators, decorators, and also we will cover some functional programming concepts using Python. I will also cover how you can debug your Python code. And also we will see how to use pip, which is a Python package management system to install and manage your software packages written in Python. Now, if you want to see the whole list of topics which will be covered in this video course, then you can see the description of this video and you will be able to see all the topics which will be covered in this video. So by the end of this course, you will be able to apply whatever you have learned in this course in your own projects or for applying for a Python programming job. So what are you waiting for? Let's get started. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about Python. So let's get started. So first of all, what is Python? So Python is a high level dynamically typed programming language. Python support multiple programming paradigms, including object oriented, imperative, functional, and procedural styles. Now, Python is an interpreted language. So what do we mean by interpreted? To understand this, we need to understand the difference between the compiled languages and the interpreted languages. So some languages like C, C++, Java are all translated by running the source code through a tool called compiler. This compilation of source code results in a very efficient byte code that can be executed any number of times. Now, interpreted languages like Python, in contrast, must be parsed, interpreted, and executed each time the program is run, thereby greatly adding the cost of running the program. So, a compiled language takes the entire program as a single input and converts it into machine code or byte code, which is stored in a file called a binary file. On the other hand, interpreted languages like Python takes the single instruction as single input and execute that instruction. Now, compiled languages run faster because compilation is done before the execution. On the other hand, interpreted programs run slower because compilation and execution takes place simultaneously. In case of Python, even though it's an interpreted language, but it's really fast. Now, Python supports dynamic data types. And to understand this, we need to understand the difference between statically typed programming languages and dynamically typed programming languages. So, at statically typed programming languages, do the type checking at the compiled time as opposed to the real time. And dynamically typed programming languages do type checking at runtime as opposed to compile time. So let's say you declare a variable x is equal to 9 in Python. Python will do its type checking at runtime, whether it's an integer or a string or a double value all will be done at the runtime. Now, Python is independent from platforms. That means it's a cross-platform programming language. That means you can run your Python code on Windows, Linux, Mac, or on any other Unix operating system. Now, Python focuses on faster development time. So, Python code has a very natural style to it, which makes it easy to read and understand thanks to the lack of semicolons and braces. So, we don't use semicolons or braces in Python. That means faster development time, especially when you are doing some prototyping work. Python is a highly readable language 
and has a clean visual layout. So if a developer writes a very efficient Python program, it's like reading English language. Now Python have high level internal object data types and have automatic memory management. And at last Python is free and open source. That means you don't need to pay anything to start learning Python. Now let's talk about some history about Python. So Python was conceived in late 1980s and its implementation began in December 1989 by a developer called Guido van Rossum in Netherlands as a successor of a programming language called ABC. Now Guido van Rossum worked at Google from 2005 to December 2012 where he spent half of his time in the development of Python programming language. And nowadays Van Rusem is working in a company called Dropbox. And from where this Python name come from? Rusem chose the name Python since he was a big fan of Monty Python's Flying Circus. So Python was first publicly released in February 1991 and python.org, which is the official website of Python, was released in the time period between 1996 and 1997. In the year 2001, Python Software Foundation was created and Van Rusem remained the principal author of Python. His continuing central role in Python development is reflected in the title given to him by Python community which is Benevolent Director of Life. Now, what is a Benevolent Director of Life? This is a title given to small number of open source software development leaders, typically the project founders who retain the final say in the dispute or arguments within the community. So why learn Python? Because Python is fun to use scripting language. And as I said, Python is a multi-paradigm programming language which supports object-oriented, imperative, functional programming and procedural styles. That means it's highly recommended for the educational purpose. So majority of educational institutes use Python as the first language which they teach to their students. And why it's the first choice of educational institutes? Because it's very easy to learn and it runs on any platform. Now Python is very powerful, scalable, and easy to maintain programming language which enables high productivity and it has lots and lots of inbuilt libraries which a developer can use. Python is also used as a glue language which acts as an interactive front end for the languages like C and C++. So when you develop in Python it reduces the development time, it reduces the code length, it is easy to learn and use as a developer. It is easy to understand codes. It is easy to do team projects in Python. And it's really easy to extend to other languages if you are using Python. So where can you use Python? So because Python is a general purpose programming language, it is used in many web development framework. For example, Django and Flask recently became very popular for web development. Now Python is also widely used in scientific computing, data mining and machine learning. And continued growth and demand for machine learning developers may be driving the popularity of Python. Now as I said, Python is used as a scripting language. That means if you are doing prototyping, it's really efficient to use Python. Python is also used in the development of graphical user interfaces, embedded applications, gaming and DevOps tools. And at last, as I said, because Python is really easy to learn, it's used for educational purposes as the first programming language for teaching programming. Now the question arises, which version of Python should you learn, Python 3 or Python 2? So I would recommend Python 3 since it's more modern and it is a more popular option at this point of time. So I will be teaching this course in Python 3. So this was a brief introduction about Python. From the next video, I'm going to show you how to install Python and how to use Python as a programming language. In this video, I'm going to show you how to install Python 3 on your Windows 10 operating system. 
So let's get started. So first of all, open your favorite browser on your Windows 10 operating system and then search for Python. And the first link which will appear here will be from python.org. So we are going to click on that link. And once this python.org website is open, you just need to scroll down a little until you see this downloads section. And you can see at the time of making this video, Python 3.7.0 is the latest version of Python available. So we are going to click on this link which says Python 3.7.0 and you will be redirected to this page which says Python 3.7.0 and now I'm going to scroll down until I see the files here and you will see there are various kinds of installer available here. We are going to install the Python using the executable installer. So we are going to choose this option which says Windows x86 hyphen 64 executable installer and now i will wait for this executable to be downloaded and once this executable is downloaded you just need to click on this exe file and i'm going to minimize the browser here so you can see python's 3.7.0 setup window has been started and on the first window you will see two options here one is install now and other is customize installation so what we are going to choose is this option which says customize installation because when you choose this install now option python will be installed at this path which i don't want to use you can see it's a long path which i don't want to remember so i will use uh, this option which says customize installation and i will also check this option which says add python 3.7 to path so now let's click on customize installation and next you will see this optional feature window and you can see there are some optional feature which this python installer will install for example documentation pip it will install which is a python package manager idle ide python test suite and other feature it's going to install so i'm going to leave everything as default and then i'm going to click next and now this next window will open which says advanced option here i'm going to check this option which says install for all users and i'm going to leave other check boxes as checked and then you will see this section here which says customize install location so i want to install python on my c directory so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open the windows explorer and i'm going to go to the c directory here and once the c directory is open i'm going to right click here and i'm going to create a new directory and i'm going to name this directory as python and then i'm going to press enter and this path i'm going to give here in the customize install location so i'm going to just give this path which says c colon slash python and then backslash python 37 3.7 here means that we are going to install 3.7 version of python so now python will be installed at this location on my computer and then i'm going to click on the install button here and then you will see the installation will start and it will be finished in a few seconds so just wait for the installation to complete and after some time i can see this message which says setup was successful so i'm going to click on this close button which is going to close this installer. So now in order to check whether Python is installed on our Windows operating system or not, we are going to search for Python here and you will see a few options here. One is this Python 3.7 terminal, other is idle IDE. So first of all, we are going to click on this option which says Python 3.7 64-bit, which is going to open this kind of terminal. So this is a Python terminal and here we can, uh, for example, print something. So I'm going to just write print and in the parentheses and in between the double quotes, I can just write hello world and then press enter, which is going to in return print hello world. That means Python 3.7 terminal is working. So I'm going to close this terminal now. And once again, I'm going to search for Python here. And this time I'm going to select this option which says idle. Okay, so just select this option which says idle and in the parenthesis Python 3.7 64-bit. So this idle is an IDE which comes with Python installation. At the time of installation, we have chosen this option to install idle. That's why we can see this option here. And also this is an interactive shell. So you can once again write uh, print and inside the parenthesis, you can uh, just write, for example, once again, hello world 
and then press enter and it's going to give you this kind of output here. So now Python interactive shell is working and idle IDE is also working. So I'm going to close this idle IDE. And now I want to check whether Python is working using my command prompt or not. So I'm going to right click on this windows button and then I'm going to click on command prompt. And here I'm going to first of all write uh, Python and then press enter. And you can see this Python option is working now, even on your command prompt, right? So here also you can uh, just write print and inside the parenthesis, you can just print uh, hello world and then press enter and it prints hello world in return. So now we have successfully installed Python on our Windows 10 operating system. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use mathematical operators and how to do basic math in Python. So first of all, we will open the idle IDE. So just search for uh, Python once again. I have shown you this method in the last video also. So just search for the Python once again. And in the last video, I have shown you how to install Python. And with the Python installation, this idle is also installed, right? So we are going to open this idle IDE. Now, some of you who are familiar with Python and have some experience with Python may think that why am I using this Python idle IDE? Because there are many better IDEs and editors available for the development of Python. So don't worry, I'm going to show you everything how to install other IDEs which are preferred in the development of Python step by step. But for now, we will start with this idle IDE. So the first thing which I want to do here is I want to increase the font size first of all in the idle IDE because this may be not visible to some of you. You can change the font size by just changing this number and I'm going to change it to, for example, 18 and bold. So we will be able to see our uh, fonts in a better way. So now everything is set. So let's get started with the programming. So let's start with the basic math operations. So let's say I want to add something. So I can uh, just write number plus, which is a operator and the other number and then press enter and you will get the result of this expression. Now let's try the subtraction. So let's say I want to subtract 60 minus 50 and then press enter and it gives the result. Let's do the negative uh, subtraction. So I'm going to just write 60 plus 50 and then press enter and it's going to return me the negative value. Now let's do the division. So for example, I want to divide 50 by 3. I'm going to press enter and you can see it gives me a float value or a decimal value. And if you are familiar with other languages like Java or C++, this may appear a little bit strange to you because when you do the same operation in Java or C++ with this division operator, you will get the different answer, which is 16 and not these decimal float value. So if you want to just get an integer value and not the decimal value out of the division, then you can write this expression, which is 50 double forward slash three. Okay, and then press enter. And now you get 16, which is a whole number or an integer. This type of division is also called the floor division in which you get the whole number as the answer and the decimal value is truncated out of your answer. So if you want to get the exact value out of the division in decimal values also, then you can use uh, this expression, which is single forward slash operator. And if you want to do the floor division, then use these two forward slash symbols. Now it's also possible to divide two decimal values. So decimal values in Python and most of the other languages are called the float values. So here, instead of 50, I can just write 50.0 divided by 3.0, which is also valid. Or I can write 50.0 divided by 10 
and then press enter which gives me 5.0 and when I write the integer which is 50 divided by 10 it will also give me this value which is 5.0 now let's try some multiplication so if you want to do multiplication in Python you use a number and then this asterisk symbol and then second number and then press enter and this is going to multiply these two numbers so this is the multiplication operator which we can use to multiply two numbers now this is what we are doing here is for example uh, multiplying two numbers or dividing two numbers or addition of two numbers or subtraction of two numbers in python it's called expression okay so 50 multiplied by 10 is an expression and i have already told you that these symbols for multiplication or division are called operators now the number on which you are doing these mathematical operations are called operands so 50 here is an operand 10 here is an operand or 3 here is operand and 50 here is operand now here 50 and 10 are also called literals because they are constant values so what we have learned till now this is an expression this is an expression or 50 divided by 3 is an expression the number on which you operate on are called operands and these symbols which you can use to multiply divide add or uh, subtract are called operators and these numbers are also called literals when they are constants now let's try some modulo operations so for example i'm going to just write 10 modulus 3 here what it's going to give us is the remainder of the division of these two values so 3 multiplied by 3 is 9 which leaves the remainder 1 and that's the result we are getting okay let's try it once again so for example i will divide 21 divided by 5 it will give me the answer 4.2 but when I do 21 modulo 5 and then press enter, it's going to give me the remainder of the division of two values. Now there is an another interesting operator which is called exponent operator which you can use for the exponent values. So for example, I want to get the result of 2 to the power 5. How can I do it? So I can just write 2 and then double asterisk and then 5 which means 2 to the power 5 and then when I press enter it's going to give me 32 or I can just write 10 and then I can just write double asterisk and then uh, for example 10 once again and then press enter it's going to give me the result of 10 to the power 10 now it's also possible to do these mathematical operations on more than one number so for example I can write 5 plus 5 plus 6 plus 9 and it will give me the result of the addition of these four numbers and it's also possible to use different type of operator in one expression so I can write 5 plus 9 minus 6 multiplied by 10 for example and it's going to give me the result of this expression now there is one question which may arise here is for example uh, once again I'm going to do 5 plus 9 minus 6 multiplied by 10 and divided by 20 and press enter here it's going to give me this value but how this value is calculated what operation is executed first is the multiplication is done first or is the division done first or the addition took place first or the subtraction took place first so i have this table and here you can see the precedence of these operators so in this table highest precedence is at top and lowest is at bottom that means parentheses have the highest priority and then the exponents have the priority and then the multiplication and division operators have the same priority here and at last the subtraction and addition have the same priority but whenever you use these operators which are in the same box in a same expression then 
whatever operator you use on the left have the highest priority and whatever operator you use on the right have the lower priority so in this table parentheses have the highest priority and the addition and the subtraction have the lowest priority and for example if you use multiplication and division in the same expression then the priority is decided which operator is appearing on the left so if the operator is appearing on the left it has the highest priority than the operator which are on the right side. So let's take an example of that. So for example, so first the addition of these two numbers will happen and then the division of these two numbers will happen because parentheses have the highest priority. And then the result of these two numbers will be multiplied by 6 because multiplication have the highest priority out of these two operators which are minus and multiply. So multiplication operator have the highest priority. And at the end, the subtraction of the result will take place. So let's press enter and let's see what's the result. So the result here is 11. And how we get this result here? So 5 plus 9 is 14 and the division of these two numbers is 1 by 2. So 6 will be divided by 2 which is 3 and then at last 3 will be subtracted from this result which is 14 which will give you 11. Once again for example you use uh, 60 multiplied by 20 divided by 30 and then press enter it will give you 40 but in which order this calculation will happen first of all this multiplication will take place because in the table we have seen that multiplication operator and division operator have the same priority and that's why the priority will be decided from left to right now if you want to learn the order of precedence between the operators then you can use this keyword which is PEMDAS. P stands for parenthesis, E stands for exponents, M stands for multiplication, D stands for division, A stands for addition and S stands for subtraction. Okay, so you can either remember this name which is PEMDAS or you can use this sentence which I have written here. So please excuse my dear Aunt Sally and you need to remember the first letter of each word here. And the first letter of every word, for example, P here stands for parenthesis, E here stands for exponent, M and D here stands for multiplication and division, A and S here stands for addition and subtraction. So for remembering, you can either use this sentence or you can remember this keyword. In this video, we will talk about Python variables and types. So first of all, what is a variable? So according to Wikipedia, in computer programming, a variable is a storage location paired with an associated symbolic name, also known as variable name or identifier, which contains some known or unknown quantity of information referred to as value. Now in simple words, a variable is a named place in the memory where a programmer can store data and later retrieve this data using the variable name. Now the programmer get to choose the name of this variable which is declared and programmer can change the content of this variable in the later statements. So let's see how we can define a variable in Python. So you can define a variable using any name. For example, you can give my int as a name and then using an assignment operator, which is this equal to symbol, you can assign some value to this variable, for example, nine. And when I press enter, this value 9 is assigned to this variable which is my int and now on I can uh, just get the value of this uh, variable using the variable name so when I write my int and then press enter 
it gives me the value which is assigned to this variable. Now, as I told you in the first introduction video of this course, that Python is completely object oriented and it's not statically typed. So you do not need to declare the variables before using them or you do not need to declare the type of the variable. And further, every variable in Python is an object. So if you have learned some other languages like C, C++, Java or other statically typed languages, you may have observed that before writing the variable name, they give the type of the variable. For example, in other languages, for defining integer, they have to first define the data type of that variable and then they define the variable name and then they assign any value to it. But in Python, you don't need to define this data type here. And whenever you define a variable, you need to assign some value to it so that Python will be able to understand the type of data you want to store in this variable. So this type of notation, when I press enter here, it's going to give me error which says invalid syntax because this type of variable declaration is not allowed in Python. Now there are some rules which you need to follow in order to declare a variable in Python. And these rules are a variable must start with a letter or underscore, okay? So you cannot start the variable name with a number or some unknown symbol. The second rule is a variable must consist of letters, numbers and underscores and no other special symbol. And the third rule is variables are case sensitive. So let me show you the demo of all the rules which are related to declaration of variables in Python. So let's say we have defined this variable myInt I cannot get the value of my int when I write, for example, my with capital letter and then int here. And it's going to give me an error because variables in Python are case sensitive. So this variable name is different from this variable name. Now, as I told you, you can define a variable starting with the letter. It's totally valid. So let's define this variable age is equal to 10 which is valid. You can also define a variable with the combination of uh, letters and numbers, and it's also totally valid. But a variable name cannot start with a number. So when you uh, write something like this and assign some value to it, it's going to give you an error, which is a syntax error. So a variable name cannot start with a number. A variable name can start with underscore, and it's totally valid. But apart from underscore, when you use some special character, for example, hash age is equal to 10, it's not valid. So whenever you try to get the value of age, it's not going to give you the value which is stored inside this variable. Also, you cannot use any other special symbol between the variable names. So for example, I can write age.22 here is equal to 22 which is not a valid syntax because we have used this dot symbol in between the variable declaration. So these are some of the ground rule in order to declare a variable in Python. Now, apart from that, there are some reserved words in Python, which also you cannot use in order to declare a variable. For example, these are some of the words which you cannot use in order to declare a variable. For example, and, del, for, is, raise, you cannot use to declare a variable. So let's say I'm going to go to idle once again, and I declare a variable called for is equal to 10. It's not valid. It says it's a invalid syntax because for is a reserved word in Python. So now we have learned some rule about declaring the variables. So let's declare some variables in Python. So first of all, I'm going to declare an integer variable which takes an integer. And then I'm going to declare a float variable which takes 
a decimal value and then I can also declare in Python a complex value for example my complex is equal to 1 j and then press enter and it's also totally valid where j in this value is the imaginary part of this complex number now you can also use e to indicate the power of something so for example i declare a variable my num and you can write this notation like this so 10 to the power 10 is totally valid okay and when you try to access this value of my num it's going to give you the value of 10 to the power 10. You can also write the capital E here. So when I write my num is equal to 10 capital E 10 and then press enter and I try to access the value which is stored in this variable, you can see it gives me the same result. Now in order to declare a string variable, for example, my uh, string, I can use double quotations. For example, I want to write some name here it's totally valid so I'm going to just get the value which I stored inside this my string variable and it gives me this name max I can also use single quotation in order to assign string to the variable so I will use now single quotation and this time I just change the name to Tom it's also totally valid so when I write my string once again it gives me the value tom now you may have noticed one more thing here is reassignment of the variable is possible so first i have assigned the value max to this variable my string and then i have reassigned some other value tom to the same variable my string so reassignment is possible so for example let's say what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my float variable and then what i'm going to do is i want to assign in this variable the value which is stored in my int variable so i'm going to just write my int here and then press enter and let's see what is the value inside my float now and you can see it gives us the value 10 but you may ask that we have declared this variable name as my float so we are expecting the float value inside this my float variable name but it's giving me the value 10 so in order to convert a integer value into a float value you can use type casting so i can just write my float here is equal to then you write a keyword float here and then inside the parenthesis you can write the name of the variable which is my int and then when I access the value of my float here, it's going to give me 10.0, which is a float value. So in order to convert integers into float, you can use this keyword float here. Now, if you want to convert a float value into an integer, you can just write, for example, my int is equal to int. And then inside the parenthesis, you can write the variable name for example my float here and then press enter and then I can uh, see the value which is stored inside this my int variable and it's an integer now let me show you one last thing which is to find out the type of any variable so you use a keyword called type and in the parenthesis you use the variable name for example my int and then press enter and it will give me the type of the value which is stored inside this variable so you can see integer is stored inside this variable my int once again type and then parenthesis and now i want to know the type which is stored in the my float variable and you can see it will give me float as an answer so we know that in my float variable float value is stored once again we will see what value is stored in this my num which is an exponent value right so i'm going to just write type and then i'm going to just uh, write my num now and then press enter and it gives me a float value and at last i want to see what type is stored in this my string variable so i can just write my string here and then press enter and you can see the value which we get here is str which stands for string that means in my string string value is 
stored. Now it's totally possible to use the operators with variables. So I want to add the value stored in my int plus my float here and this will give me 20 because my int have the value 10 and my float have the value 10.10 .10, so the result is 20.0 here. So this is how you can use variables and types in Python. In this video we will see how to use print function in order to print output on the console in various different ways and I'm also going to show you how to take user input using Python. So we have already seen that in Python we can use this print function in order to print something and we have already printed hello world at the time of installation right and when I press enter it's going to print hello world on the console now some of you might wonder what is this print so print is a inbuilt function in Python so Python has a number of inbuilt function and print is one of them so here print is a function and then inside the parenthesis what you give here is called a parameter or an argument okay so hello world is an argument which is a string argument right so let's try to give in this print an integer argument let's say I just provide 25 here and it will print this number once again let's say I'm going to write print and then I want to execute some expression 50 multiplied by 60 and then press enter print function is also able to do this now let's say I want to output some more complex formatted string so let's say I want to print on the console 50 multiplied by 10 is equal to 60 how can I do this so let's see how we can do it so I can write uh, print here and then inside these double quotes you can write your string for example 50 multiplied by 10 and then in print function you can give multiple arguments using this comma separator so here I can just write 50 multiplied by 10 and let me put equals symbol here inside this string and then press enter and now it prints 50 multiplied by 10 equals 500 and you can also provide more than one argument to this uh, print function so for example I can just write uh, hello here and then in the second argument I will just provide the space between hello and world and in the third argument I will uh, just say world here and this print function will concatenate all these uh, string values and give you the output in this format now let's say you want to also provide this value here which is 50 and 10 instead of string you want to provide some value which you take from a variable so for example you declare a variable x is equal to 50 here and then y is equal to 10 and you want to use these two variables instead of this static string so how you can achieve this you can achieve this in various different ways so let me show you the first way so I can write print and then in the double quotes this is your string so whenever you use uh, this double quotes and whenever you write something in between this double quotes it becomes a string so after this string I will provide a dot here and wait for some seconds and as soon as you do this you will be able to see various different hints here which are provided so these are all the inbuilt methods which you can use with the string so you can use find method you can use format method so for now we are going to use this format method with string so you can just uh, click on this format method so let's say I will uh, provide X as the first argument Y as the second argument and I want to see the output of X multiplied by Y in the third argument now how you can print the value of X Y and the multiplication of X Y using this blank string so it turns out that you can use these curly brackets inside this string and you can give some index here so index starts from zero so this index is index zero 
and then I'm going to provide space and then this asterisk symbol to provide this kind of format. So we want to achieve this format here, right? So just write zero in the curly bracket, space, asterisk, and once again, curly bracket. And this time we are going to provide the index one and the result will be transferred to index two. Why? Because here the index starts from zero. So X will be transferred to the index zero. Y will be transferred to the index one and the multiplication of X and Y will be transferred to index two here. So let me press enter here and you can see it prints the string which we desire. Now once again, I'm going to write this print function and once again, I'm going to give this parenthesis and you can see the hint here. So I want to use this SCP keyword now inside the string. So how can I use this? So I will just close this parenthesis and once again, I want to print hello world. So I will just write hello and then I'm going to provide the comma and inside the double quotes, I'm going to just write uh, world here. And then in the last argument, you can provide this keyword SCP is equal to and inside the double quotes, you can provide some separator to separate the hello from world. So I want to just give this string to separate hello from world. And now I'm going to press enter. And you can see this string is separating the keyword hello from the world. Now in Python, you can also use C style string formatting to create a new formatted string. So let me show you how we can do it. So I'm going to declare a variable called name and I'm going to assign some value to it. For example, max here and then press enter. And now I'm going to just write print function. And in the parenthesis, I want to just greet this name so I can uh, just write double quotes hello here and then if you are familiar with C style string formatting then you may know this modulo s symbol which is used to print strings right and then after this double quote you just need to provide once again this modulo symbol and then you need to provide the variable name which you want to replace instead of this modulo s. So in our case, we want to replace this modulo s by name variable. And I'm going to press enter. And you can see it prints hello max. Now let's say I also have the age of uh, this person. So the age is let's say 22. And once again, I'm going to use this print function. And inside the parenthesis, I want to say hello to the name, including the age. So I can just write hello and then modulo s here. And then I'm going to print the age of uh, this person. I can just write r u modulo d, which is used to print the integer values. And then I'm going to just write years old. And after the double quotes, I can just write modulo. And this time I cannot simply provide this uh, name argument like this. I must provide the name in the form of a tuple. And what is a tuple? A tuple is a fixed sized list. And we are going to see in the future videos how to use tuples. But for now, just remember that a tuple is a fixed size list. Okay. So inside these parentheses, once again, I can provide first of all the name and then as a second value in the tuple, I can provide the age variable. And now I'm going to press enter. And now you can see it prints hello max, are you 22 years old? So this is how also you can use these C styled string formatting in Python. I want to give you one more example of float here. So I can just write, uh, for example, this person's marks. So I'm going to just write marks is equal to and let's say I want to provide these marks in the floating point. So I can give this modulo F here. And then after this modulo, I can just give the marks so 92.5 and then press enter. And you can see it prints the marks. Now one more little thing which we can do here is we can limit the number of decimal values which we want to see after this Point. So we can write the same uh, printf function and same argument. And in order to limit the number of uh, digits after the decimal, 
you just need to write after f dot and some number for example 2 oops i don't want to see this output i wanted to see the output after the decimal value so once again i think this should be this point should be before f so i just need to write dot and 2 before f i think and then press enter and now it limits the number of digits after this decimal point now the last thing i want to show here is how you can allow the user to provide some input so for example i will declare a variable called uh, value and then i can use equals and then i'm going to use a inbuilt function which is called input so input is also an inbuilt function which allows you to take user input so here i can just write as the first argument and then i will provide this colon here and that's it you just need to press enter here and now you can see this terminal is asking us the same question which we have written here so let's say i just provide 50 here and then press enter then what's going to happen is this 50 is going to be assigned to this variable which is value so now when you just use this value variable you can see this 50 is assigned to this value variable you will also see that this 50 is a string and not a number right because it's enclosed in single quotes so how you can assign 50 to this value using the user input so what we can do here is once again i'm going to uh, use this value variable and what we can do here is we can typecast the output of input so you can just write int and then here inside the parenthesis you can just write and now when i press enter and provide 50 and then press enter and see the value now it's an integer right so you can typecast the output of this input function which provides us the string and this int method is going to convert this string into an integer and then give us the result instead of this int you can also use a float keyword here so let me show you uh, this example also so i'm going to just copy this and paste it here and instead of using the int i'm going to just write float here okay and then press enter and i'm going to provide this time 100 here and then press enter and then i'm going to just print the value of uh, the value variable and now it prints the answer in floating points so this is how you can use print function to print the output on the console and input function to take the input from the user in this video we will discuss about built-in functions and modules in python so the python interpreter has a number of built-in functions modules and type that are always available that means you can use them at any time and we have already used some of the built-in functions in python so first of all uh, we have used the print built-in function we have already used the input built-in function we have already used the int which is used to typecast a float or a string into an integer right we have already used a built-in function called float which is used to convert an integer to a float value or a string to a float value now python has a list of these inbuilt function and you can find this list by going to the python.org website and then clicking on the docs section and you can choose the version you have installed so we have installed the latest version which is 3.7.0 and you can even choose your language which are available here now when you click on this link which says library references you will be able to see this page which says python standard library and then when you scroll down here you will be able to see the introduction about python and the second section here is about built-in functions so i'm going to click on this built-in function link and here you will be able to see all the built-in functions in python so this is the list of all the built-in functions which you can use in python and if you want to know more about these functions for example i want to know what this max function does i can click on this function and then you can get the help about this function so what this function does 
and how it can be used in Python. All the information is given here. Now let's go to the terminal and let's see how we can use some of these built-in functions. So first of all, how you can list out all these built-in functions and types in Python. There is a built-in function to list out all the built-in functions and types, which is dir and then double underscore and then you write built ins and then once again double underscore and then close the parenthesis and then press enter and it's going to give you the list of all the built-ins available in Python. So for example, from this list, we have already used this function called float print and then we have already used this function int and input also. So let's use some more functions. So in the previous videos, I have shown you how to calculate the power of a number. So you use these double asterisks in order to calculate the power of any number. And you can see you get the power of 2 to the power 10. Now Python also have a built-in function called POW. Here you can give as a first argument the number and as the second argument you can provide the number which you want to use as a power. And when I press enter, it gives me the same result. Let's use some other built-in function, for example, len. Len you can use to find out the length of any string. So I can write len and inside the parenthesis, I can uh, just write any string here, for example, hello, and it will give me the length of the string. So this string hello have five letters inside it. That's why it's giving me length five. Now there is a built-in function called help using which you can get some help about any function. So I can write uh, help here and inside the parenthesis, I can uh, just write the function name. So for example, I want to know what this max function does. So I can uh, just write max here and then press enter. So it gives me the signature of max. So how it's used and then it will provide me some description about the function. So what it does. So you can see here it returns the biggest item, right? So I can uh, just write max here and inside the parenthesis, I can give the list of uh, items here. For example, one, two, eight, nine, four and five. And when I press enter, it's going to give me the maximum value out of this list. So you can use this help built in function in order to know more about all the other built in functions. Now till now we have talked about the built in functions which are available in Python. Now let's talk about some of the built in modules which are available in Python. Now what is a module I'm going to describe in the later videos. But for now, let's see how to import a built in module in Python and how to use them. So there is a built in module called math and to import it, you just use a keyword called import and then the module name, for example, math and press enter and it's going to import this module into our interpreter. Now you can use this math keyword and then you can write dot and wait for some seconds and you can see it gives me all the list which are available inside this math module. So let's say I want to find out the square root of any number. I can use a function called SQRT here and then this gives me the square root of a number. So for example, I want to find out the square root of 100 and then press enter it gives me the answer 10. Now, once again, as I said, you can use a built-in function called help in order to know the signature of this function. So I can just write math.sqrt and then press enter and it's going to give me some help about this function. So you can see it returns the square root of x and the signature looks like this. Now, if you want to print all the methods and types available inside this built-in module, you can once again use this built-in function dir and then in the parenthesis, write the name of the module. So this time we will write math here and then press enter and it gives me the list of all the available functions available inside this math module. 
and you can see all these functions which are available inside this module so you can just use a cos function from here pi function from here radiance or tan function from here so this is how you can use built-in functions and modules in python in this video i'm going to show you how you can write your first python script in the form of .py file and execute it but not just by idle but i'm going to show you various different ways you can execute this python file which you will create so let's get started so first of all i'm going to show you how you can create your python file using idle so first of all open your idle ide and just go to file here and you will be able to see this option here which says new file and then you will be able to see this kind of window opens which is a python file editor now first of all we are going to save this file so let's save this file you can save this file at any directory or any path wherever you want so for this first file i'm going to name it as hello.py so .py is the python extension and hello is the name of our file so i'm going to save this file first of all and you can see it's saved at my desired location so in this file let's write some python code so let's say i want to create a program in which i will ask the user to input three numbers and as the output i want the maximum out of these three numbers which is inputted by the user so how can i do this so as we have already seen you can define a variable in python like this so i'm going to define a variable x is equal to and we also know that there is a inbuilt function in python called input to take the user input and then in the double quotes so we are going to ask the user that he needs to enter the first number so enter first number and in a similar way i am going to ask the user to enter the second number and the third number let me change the variable name here so instead of x this variable will be y and the last variable will be z and this is the third number and this is the second number but when i write the input like this this may give us some problem the problem is input function gives us a string and we need to convert this string into a integer or a float so let's convert this number into a float value so you can use another inbuilt function which is float and then this string will be converted to float so i'm going to do the same for other two numbers now in order to get the maximum numbers out of these three numbers we have seen there is a inbuilt function in python which is called max and we are going to use this max function but first of all we need to print something so we will uh, just write the max value is and then we can calculate the maximum value and print it from here so we can use this comma and then we can use this inbuilt function which is max and then we will uh, just pass these three values which is x y and z so will this program work let's see so first of all before doing anything you need to once again save this file okay so right now you can see there is a little asterisk symbol here in front of my file which means my file is not saved so you need to first of all save your file and then you will see this asterisk is gone that means our file is saved so let's run our code so if you want to run this python file using your idle ide you just need to click on the run button here and then choose the third option which says run module so i'm going to click on run module and after some time you will be able to see this output printed on the idle ide so it says enter the first number which we have written in our code you can see this line is executed first of all so we will enter some number i'm going to just write 50 here and then press enter and then it asks us to provide the second number so let's say this number is 90 and 
Now we need to give the third number. So I'm going to just give 101 here and then press enter. And it says the max value is 101, which is correct. But in real world, you will not have this idle IDE installed everywhere. So how can I run my hello.py file? So I'm going to minimize this idle IDE for now. And I'm going to go to the location where I have saved this hello.py file. Okay. So just go to the location where you have saved your hello.py file. And now you just need to double click on this hello.py file. So I'm going to just double click on this hello.py file. And you can see as soon as I double click on hello.py, it opens this program in our terminal. Okay. So once again, I'm going to close this terminal and I'm going to double click on my hello.py file and it opens our program in our terminal. So once again, I'm going to give three uh, inputs here. Let's say 110, enter, 55, enter, 200 and enter. As soon as you press enter, this window disappears. So why this window disappears? Because after the execution of your program, this terminal immediately closes. So we need to provide something in our program in order to avoid the closing of this terminal. And how we can do this? We can do this using our input method, which is our inbuilt method, right? And here we can just type press any key to exit. So what will happen here is after printing the result, your terminal will wait for the user input. And once the input is given by the user, then only the terminal will exit. So let's test our program once again. But before this, don't forget to save this program. So I'm going to just save my program. And then I'm going to open the folder where I have saved this hello.py file. And once again, I'm going to double click on this hello.py and I'm going to give uh, three numbers here. And then I'm going to press enter and it prints 99, which is the maximum out of three numbers. And at last it asks us to press any key. So I'm going to press any key, for example, Z and then press enter and this terminal disappears. So now the question is, how does this Python file is executed without compiling this file? So the answer of this question I have already given in the introduction video. And the answer is Python is a interpreted language and not the compiled language. So what happens in normal languages like Java, C++, C, you have a source code and this source code you need to compile in order to convert this source code into an executable file. For example, you have a hello.java file. You need to compile this Java file in order to convert it into a hello.class file, which is a executable file. And when you run this hello.class file, hello world or whatever program you have written will be executed. Now in the case of Python, because it's an interpreted file, you just need to create this hello.py file and you just need to run it. You don't need to compile this file. And that is the difference between interpreted languages like Python and the compiled language like Java, C++ or C. Now there is one more way using which you can run your Python file and that is by using your command prompt. So I'm going to open my command prompt. I'm going to right click on this windows icon and then I'm going to open this command prompt from here. So make sure that this command prompt is able to understand this Python command. So first of all, type Python on your command prompt and then press enter. And if it shows you this output like Python and the version of Python, then Python is working on your command prompt. So this command prompt is Windows command prompt and not the Python shell which we have installed. So this is our Windows command prompt, right? Now let me make this terminal a little bit bigger 
so we will be able to see what I'm typing. So I'm going to change the font size to let's say 24 here. So now we will be able to see what's happening. You can just write quit and then uh, these two parentheses and then press enter and you will come out of this command prompt. So you need to come out of your command prompt in order to execute your Python file. Now in here, what you need to do is you need to copy the path of your Python file. So I'm going to right click here and then go to the properties and then in the securities, I'm going to just copy full path of this Python file up to dot Python. Okay, so I have copied full path of this Python file. And now what I need to do is I need to just write Python here. Okay, so just write Python and then paste the path which you have copied. So I'm going to just paste the path which I have copied and then press enter and you can see our program is executed. So I'm going to just give quickly three numbers and it gives us the maximum of these three numbers. Now I will just type any letter here and then press enter and I will come out of this terminal. There is one more way of executing your file and this is you need to just give this command which is cd and then your directory path so up to your directory you just need to copy this path from here okay so you just need to copy this path and then after cd you just need to give space and then paste this path without your hello.py file okay so i haven't given the hello.py file name here and now press enter which will change your directory to your python directory so now we are inside our python directory from here you can directly give python and the name of your file which is hello.py and then press enter and once again the program opens so we can just give three inputs here and the result is shown once again i'm going to just type any key or any letter here which for example R and then press enter and now I'm out of this program. So this is how you can run your Python script on any terminal. You don't need any IDE or any other special software in order to run your Python script. You can run it on your terminal or directly click on the Python file. Till now we have been using idle IDE in order to develop our Python code. Now the reason behind why I was showing to code in Python using idle in the first few videos because I wanted that you get familiar first with Python interpreter. So now whenever you want to test some functionality in Python, you don't need to open any IDE or any editor. You can just open your terminal and then test that functionality until you wanted to test something terminal or Python interpreter was okay. But when you want to develop a big project using Python, we need to use some kind of IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment in order to develop such kind of projects. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to install PyCharm on your Windows 10 operating system, which is the most popular IDE today used by developers to develop Python code. So let's get started and let's see how we can install PyCharm on our Windows 10 operating system. So open your favorite browser and search for PyCharm. And the first link which will appear here will be from jetbrains.com forward slash PyCharm. So JetBrains is the company behind this IDE and this company which is JetBrains is famous for making very good IDEs. So JetBrains has also created some other IDEs like Android Studio, IntelliJ IDEA, WebStorm and many other IDEs which are popular between developers nowadays. So we are going to just click on this link. So now we are inside this JetBrains.com website. And here you will be able to see this logo PyCharm and you will be able to see this download button here. So I'm going to click on this button which says download now. 
and then you will be redirected to this page which is for downloading PyCharm. So here you can select your platform whether you are working on Windows or Mac or Linux and what we want to download is we want to download the community version of PyCharm. This community version you can see is free and open source so you can download and install it with no cost. If you want to download the professional version then you need to pay some money to JetBrains in order to use it. And as soon as you click on download button this download of PyCharm community version dot exe file will start so I will wait for this file to be downloaded so now this exe file is downloaded on my windows operating system so I'm going to double click on this exe file and I'm going to minimize the browser and now you can see PyCharm setup wizard has been started so here you just need to click next and this is the location where PyCharm will be installed on your system so it will be installed inside your C directory then program files JetBrains and then there will be a directory created which will be called PyCharm community edition whatever version you have downloaded so I'm going to click next now on this next window you will see two options one is to create a shortcut so we are going to choose this option which says 64 bit launcher now the second option here is create associations and I'm not going to check this checkbox because I don't want that on my computer every .py file to be associated with the PyCharm. So I will leave this unchecked and the next option here is download and install the JRE x86 by JetBrains. There is no harm in this. So I'm going to check this checkbox and I'm going to click next and now I'm going to click on the install button. So this is going to start installing PyCharm on my Windows 10 operating system. So I need to wait for some time until this installation is finished. So now the installation of PyCharm Community Edition is finished on my Windows 10 operating system. And you can also see there is a PyCharm shortcut which is created on my desktop. Now I will check this checkbox which will start the PyCharm IDE and I'm going to click finish which is going to launch the PyCharm IDE. Now for the first time when PyCharm starts, it will ask you this question whether you want to import any settings from the previous installation of PyCharm. We don't have any previously installed PyCharm. So we are going to just leave this as default which says do not import setting and then click OK. And then you will see this license terms and conditions window. If you agree with all these license terms and conditions then just click accept. And one more window appears here which is for data sharing. So I'm going to just say don't send. And now you can see PyCharm IDE has been launched. So for the first time it will ask you which UI theme you want to use. You want to use the Darkula which is the dark theme or the IntelliJ theme which is the light theme. So I'm going to choose this light theme which is IntelliJ theme. And then I'm going to just click on next. And on this next window you will see some featured plugin. So for now, I'm not going to install any of the plugin. I'm going to just say start using PyCharm, which is going to start the PyCharm. So now PyCharm IDE has been started. So let's create a new project here. So I'm going to click on new project. And now we need to give the title of this project and PyCharm will ask you where you want to save this project. So I'm going to just give the name to my project. So let's name our project as hello world and then I'm going to just click on create button which is going to create our Python project. So now you can see PyCharm IDE has been started. So you can see the first thing you will see here is tip of the day. I'm going to just close this tip of the day and I'm going to maximize my IDE window and you can see our project is shown on the left hand side. So let's create a Python file and we are going to just uh, run some code using this Python file. So we need to just right click on our project and then click on new and then choose a Python file from here. And now we just need to give the name to our Python file. For example, hello without any extension. So you don't need to provide any extension 
when you choose this option which says python file and now click ok and now you can see on the left hand side that this file is created which is hello.py this .py extension is added by pycharm for us and now on this editor for example let's print hello world once again so i'm going to just print the hello world you already know how to print hello world right and once you have written your code you just need to save your code by pressing ctrl s and now you can just right click on your file and choose this option which says run hello so i'm going to just click on this option which says run hello and you can see this output is printed on this run window so this is how you can install pycharm on your windows 10 operating system in this video, we will talk about using strings in Python. But before that, I want to show you something. And that is how to comment your code in Python or how to write a comment in Python. So for example, I have this line of code which is used to print hello world on terminal. Now for some reason, I don't want to execute this line of code, then I can convert this statement into a comment and how do i do this you can just add an asterisk in front of your code and this makes your statement a comment a comment means that now this line of code will not be executed by python so let's run our code and let's see what happens so you can see now it doesn't print hello world because now this is a comment now generally we use comments in order to provide some information about some functionality or what we'd want to do with our code. So let me remove this line and because it's a python strings video we can just write after this hash symbol python strings right and this means that this is a comment and this line will not be executed by the python interpreter. Now there is one more way of giving a comment in python which is by writing the double quotes three times and this is also a comment so when you write for example python strings this is also a comment so this will also not be executed by python interpreter so what is the difference between uh, this hash comment and the comment with these three double quotes so it turns out that using these double quotes you can write multiple line comments so for example i want to write a multiple line comment let's say i want to write python string tutorial i can write this multiple line comment using these triple double quotes so let's get started and let's see how we can use strings in python so i'm going to declare a variable and in this variable i'm going to assign hello world here right and to print this hello world we can just write print and inside the parentheses we can use this x variable and when we run the code it runs so we already know how to use this kind of string in python the second way of uh, creating a string is you can use the single quotes instead of double quotes and this is also a valid string so this will also work so let me just uh, print this also which is hello world using single quotes and when i am going to run this it's going to give me the result let me remove the spaces between the print and these parentheses so let's say you want to add a single quote into this hello world string so let's say i want to just write hello single quote s hello's world so this is totally possible in python so whenever you surround your string using double quotes you can just add this single quote without any problem but when you do the same with this string this will give you a problem because now python thinks that your string starts from here and ends at this place just after hello and this will be seen as some kind of garbage by python so in order to use the single quotes inside the string which uses single quote you use a escape character and the escape character in python is backslash 
okay so when you add a backslash in front of a character python interpreter knows that it's a escape character so this will be treated as a valid string so let me just print the result and you can see it prints the same result now now let's say i want to use a double quote in this string which uses double quote already so i'm going to just give a double quote here and the same problem arises which we have seen in the string with single quote so to escape this you can also use backslash and the problem will be gone and let's run the program and it gives us this hello world with double quote so you can print this double quote using this escape character which is backslash now let's say you want to print a string with a backslash itself so i can add a backslash here and i want to add a backslash here and let's save the code and let's run it and let's see if it runs or not so it turns out that you can use this kind of notation in python also when you use double backslashes here and here let's see what happens so when we run the code it will give us the same result because one backslash is a escape character and other backslash is the part of the string so it will print the same result so you can use this for escaping this character or you can remove this the result will be same so now let me edit these two strings and i'm going to use hello here with the capital h and i'm also going to assign hello to the y variable with a small h here now python provides us some inbuilt functions which you can use with strings so this is a string right so you can use some methods related to strings on the x and y variable so let's see what are these methods so after the x i can just press dot and you can see so many suggestions is given to us by pycharm and this is called intellisense which is provided by pycharm to us and intellisense means that whenever you type something pycharm will try to suggest you some supporting code for whatever you are typing so let's use some method which are suggested to us so i'm going to use this capitalize method so let's use this capitalize method with the x and y variable and let's see what happens so i'm going to run the code and you can see now the upper string is printed same but the lower string is printed with a capital h in front of it so this capitalize method capitalizes the first letter of the string now let's see what are some of the other method which we can use so there is a method called upper and also there is a method called dot lower so let me just uh, rewrite this hello in all capitals and let's run the code now and you can see in the result the upper method has converted our string into all upper letters and the lower method has converted our string into all lower letters now in python everything is an object so using these square bracket you can extract each and every letter based upon their index so for example i write index 0 here and in the y i'm going to use the same square bracket and i'm going to write 1 here which is the index 1 and let me run the code and it prints the first character of the string because it's at index 0 and here you can see the second character of the string which is at index 1 so always remember indexes starts from 0 not from 1 now in python you can also get the substring out of a string so here inside these square brackets i can uh, just write that i want a substring out of this complete string first three letters of this string so i can uh, just start from 0 and i can just say i just want to stop at 3 that means we will get i think the first three character of the string also let me add some spaces into the second string here and in python there is a method called uh, strip so i'm going to just use uh, this strip method and let's run the code first of all and let's see what happens so you can see first of all 
this print has printed first three letter of this string. So you can see this notation means that we are telling Python to give a substring starting from 0 until 2, until the index 2. Okay, And we are saying that we want to stop at index 2, that's why we write 3 here. Now if you want to just print HELL, -L, we can write here 0 to 4 and then we can run the code and then we get HELL. -L. If you want to get only ELL, -L, you can write 1 to 4 here and then it will give you ELL -L out of this string. And this is how you can strip your string. So strip means the spaces from the start and end will be stripped of this string. Now let me show some other method related to the strings. So first method I want to show here is there is a method called is lower and then there is a method called is upper and then there is a method called dot replace which is used to replace some character inside the string. So let's say I want to replace capital H by let's say J. And the last method I want to show is how to split the string but that we will see in a moment. So let's run this code and the first result says false because this string is not lower. When we write all letters in lowercase then only it will give us true otherwise this method is lower will give us false. Now let's rerun the code and now it gives us true because now every letter in this string is lower. Second method gave us true because we were checking whether every letter in this string is capital or not. The next method replace is used to replace the character if it's there in your string and replace it with this character if this character is found in your string. So this capital H is not present in our string, right? So let's just add this capital H into our string and let's see what's the result. So now the capital H is replaced by capital J here in the result. The next method which you can use with the string is a split method. So you can write y dot uh, split and this is used to split your string using any character. So I'm going to once again write hello comma world here and I want to split this string using this character which is comma. So I can uh, just write using single quote this comma and once I run the code you can see it gives us an array of two members. One is hello and other is world with a space right because we have splitted our string using this character that's why the space is here right so that's why you can see this space here also in the second element of this array so there are number of methods which are associated with string which you can use and for knowing all these methods you just need to write your variable which contains a string and then just write dot and you will be able to see the suggestions which you can use with the string. So you can use the title method for example or you can use the translate method or you can use all these method which are available here. Okay, so just see all these suggestions and see what you can use from these method. Also if you don't have any variable in which you have assigned your string, you can directly take your string for example hello and then you can just write dot after this hello and once again you will see all these suggestions because this hello is also a string. Let me show you one last thing which you can use with string very quickly. So you can write print here and then if you want to print this hello for example 10 times, how will you do this? So you can uh, just write for example x comma x comma x. This is how you can do this. Let's say you want to print this hello 100 times how you can do this. So there is a trick in Python which you can use and this is using these asterisks you can print the string multiple times. So for example I want to print this hello 10 times I can just write my string variable name 
asterisk the number of time I want to iterate this string. So let me run the code and you can see now this hello is printed 10 times. Let me provide the space here. So there will be a space between the two hellos, right? Let's say I want to print hello 100 times, then I can just write 100 here and then run the code and it will print this hello 100 times on the terminal. So this is how you can use strings in Python. In this video, we will talk about the Boolean values, comparison operators and the logical operators in Python. So first of all, what is a Boolean value? So in Python, Boolean values are two constant objects which are true and false. Now for this demonstration, I will be using a Python interpreter and in PyCharm, you can open the Python interpreter by going down at the bottom and you will be able to see this option which says Python console. So just click on this Python console option which is going to open the Python console and you can move this bar up and down in order to expand your console, right? So let me just clear this console. So we will start from the top. So in order to clear this console, you can right click and then just say clear all and it's going to clear the console and let me resize this console up to the top and let me just uh, minimize this section also. So as I said, Boolean in Python are two constant objects which are true and false. So how you write true and false in Python? You write true with a capital T and press enter. This is a true value and false you write with a capital false. This is a false value. Now if you write true with small t, this is not recognized by Python. Also when you write false with small f, this is also not recognized by Python. Now generally we use Boolean values in order to find out the result of some condition. Now let's say you have two numbers and you want to find out which number is greater out of these two numbers. You can use a comparison operator to compare these two numbers and the result will be shown as a Boolean value. Now the next question arises, what is a comparison operator? So in Python, these are some of the comparison operators you can use. So you can use this double equals to check the equality between two values. You have this not equal operator with this exclamation mark and equals which you can use to check the non-equality between two values. There is a greater than operator and there is a less than operator and also there is a greater than equals operator and the less than equals operator. Now examples of each of these operators I have given here. So how to use these operators? As I said, if you have two values, let's say two integers x and y to compare these two integers whether they are equal or not you write on the left hand side first variable and on the left hand side second variable and in between you use the comparison operator it can be a equal to operator or non equality operator or greater than or less than or greater than equals or less than equals operator. So let's see how we can use these operators in real Python environment. So let's say I want to check whether 10 is greater than 9 or not. And when I press enter, it's going to give me true because 10 is greater than 9. Now once again, let's check if 10 is less than 9 or not, and it will give me a false value, which is also a boolean result. Also we can check equality between two values. So we can uh, just write 100 is equal to 100 or not and it will give us true. Once again we can check if 100 is equal to 99 it will give us false. In a same way you can also check for the non-equality. So for non-equality you use this exclamation mark 
equals and then press enter it will say true because 100 is not equal to 99 the same operation you can also perform with some variable so let's say i have a variable called x whose value is 20 and i have a variable called y and i assign 30 to it and let's say i want to check whether the value in the x is greater than or equal to the value which is there in y then i can write this kind of a statement and when i press enter it's going to give me false because 30 is not greater than or equal to x so let's assign a value which is 30 into our variable x and now let's check whether x and now let's check whether x is less than or equal to y or not and when i press enter it's going to give me true because we know that x which is 30 is not less than y but it's equal to y and this condition is true now you can also compare two strings using these operators so let's say i have a string called hello and i want to check whether the hello value is equal to some other value for example hello in double quotes or not and it will return me true that means whether you write hello in single quote or hello in double quote both these values are same in python now also we have seen in the last video where we have seen how to use strings that whenever for example i write a string i can use this dot operator in order to call some functions related to strings so some of these functions returns a boolean value so for example we can check whether this hello all letters are in uppercase or not and once i press enter it says false or i can check whether in this hello all letters are in lowercase or not this will give me true or i can test whether in this hello string all letters are alphabets or not this is going to give me true because all letters are alphabets now if i check whether in this string whether there is a alpha numeric value or not i can use this method which says is al num and this will check whether in my string there is a alpha numeric value or not now the next question you may ask is for example i want to evaluate two conditions at the same time let's say i want to evaluate whether 10 is greater than 9 and i want to evaluate whether 20 is less than 15 or not so how can i evaluate these two conditions at the same time so for those type of comparison we use the logical operators and there are three logical operators which we can use in python an and operator an or operator and a not operator so this and operator you can use to evaluate two conditions and it will return true only if both conditions are true okay so let's say you have two conditions x condition and y condition then if you use this and operator then in order to get true out of these two conditions both conditions have to be true in the case of or it will return true if one of these conditions is true so whether x is true or y is true it doesn't matter but if only one condition is true this will give us true value and the not operator will return the opposite of what we have so if some condition returns us true then when we use not operator then not operator will make this false so let's try all these three operators in python so i said i can use an and operator to check whether this value is true as well as this value is true or not so when i press enter it returns us false because even though the first condition is true which is 10 is greater than 9 but the second condition is not true right 
so in case of and both condition should be true in order to get the true result once again when i use the same conditions and instead of and i use the or operator it will return me true because one of these conditions is true which is 10 is greater than 9 even though the other condition is false now let's say we make both conditions true and we use or and when we press enter it's going to still returns us true so the minimum requirement of or is there should be at least one condition which evaluates to true now let's see how we can use the not operator so i can write not and then i can check whether 10 is greater than 9 or not and when i press enter it returns us false because we know that 10 is greater than 9 and not makes it false so it returns us false once again if we check whether 10 is less than 9 or not it's going to return us true because 10 is not less than 9 and this condition will return false and not will make it opposite which is true so in this way you can use boolean values comparison operators and logical operators in python in this video we will learn how to use if else statements in python so first of all what is a if statement so a if statement is used to execute a statement or a block of code if and only if a condition is fulfilled so first of all let's see the syntax of if statement so let's say I declare a variable called x whose value is 100 and then I'm going to check whether the value in x is equal to 100 or not. So I can use this keyword if and then if you have seen the last video in which I have shown you how to use comparison operators and logical operators then you will know that for equality we use a double equal symbol and then I'm going to just check it against 100. Now after the condition you need to give this colon in order to tell Python that this condition is finished and you need to press enter and you will see that there is an indent given to our code and you can see this cursor is here which is four spaces away from the start or one tab away from the start. And here I can uh, just, for example, print the value of x. So I can uh, just say x is equal to and then after the comma x. And let me save this code and run this code. And you can see on the run window here x is equal to 100 is printed because this condition which we are checking using the if statement is true which means whatever code or statement or block of code you will write under if it will be printed. Let's say this condition is not fulfilled. So I'm going to just say that x is not equal to 100 which is a false condition and when I run the code now it doesn't print anything because this condition is not fulfilled and that's why this statement is not executed now let's talk about the indentation a little bit so indentation in python is the way of marking a block of code so you can see i have given four spaces indentation here so one two three four or if you are using pycharm when you press enter after an if condition you will see that automatically this cursor is pointing here which is four spaces away from the starting point so this means that whatever you write after these four spaces or a tab is the part of this if statement now if you are familiar with c or c plus plus this indent acts like a curly bracket in c or c plus plus so in python you don't use the curly bracket to define a block of code you use indentation to define a block of code so i can write this statement like this also so i'm going to just say x is equal to and in the next line i can just 
give one more print function and I will print x from the next line and you can see here also I have given indentation after this starting point and this means that these two lines are the part of this if statement. So let me change the value of x is equal to 99 and when I run the code it will print x is equal to and in the next line it prints 99 using this line of code. So you may ask what happens when I will write this print function here and let's say we want to print finish here okay and let me run the code and let's see what happens. So it prints finish. Now let me just change this condition and I'm going to just say 100 here and let's see what happens now. So now only finish is printed because this line of code is not the part of if condition. Only statement which you write after four spaces will be the part of the if condition like this line and this line of code. But if you don't give any indentation here, that means that this line of code is not the part of the if statement. Now let's take another scenario and this time I want to check whether the value of x is a positive value or a negative value. So I will start from here and I will give one more if statement here and I will just check whether x is greater than 0 or not and then give this colon to indicate Python that I have finished this condition and then if it's greater than 0 then I'm going to print that x is positive. Now if x is not positive and if it has a negative value I need to somehow print that x is a negative value and for this you use a else statement. So here you can write else and once again you need to give the colon here and then under this else statement once again you provide four spaces or a tab indent and you can once again write print and this time we can write x is negative. This means whenever this condition is false and if and only if this condition is false then only the else part will be executed. So whatever code or block of code you write under else that will be executed if and only if the condition here is false. So seeing the value of x which is 100 which is obviously greater than 0 it's going to print that x is a positive value. Now when I change the value of x is equal to minus 100 here and once again I execute the code first of all it prints that x is minus 100 here because first of all this condition is checked and obviously minus 100 is not equal to 100 so this condition is true so these two lines of code are executed because this condition is true and here because this condition is false that's why this statement is not printed and the execution of code goes to the else condition and then this line of code will be executed which is x is negative and you can see here and this line of code is independent of both these if statements and that's why it will be printed always. Now as we have seen from our last video that we can provide multiple conditions using a logical operators. So we can here also write that if x is not equal to 100 or if the value of x is less than 0, let's write here x is less than 0, then only we will want to print this statement. So once again when we run the code, in this case both the conditions are true, that's why this is printed. If we write here that x should be greater than 0, then also this will be executed because one of the condition is true and because in the case of or we only need to satisfy one condition out of multiple conditions. In the case of end, when I write end here and run the code now, you can see this is not executed because one condition is true here and other is false. 
and in the case of end we need to satisfy both the conditions and then only these two statements will be executed or this block of code will be executed so this is how you can use if else statements in python now in this video i'm going to show you how to use l if statement with if else statements and how to use nested if statements in python so let's get started so what i'm going to do is i'm going to declare a variable and i'm going to ask the user to enter some name so i'm going to just write enter a name here and when the user enters this name, I want to compare this name with some predefined names. So in the last video, we have already seen how to use if statement. So I can just write name is equal to, and I can compare it with some name. So let's compare it with a name called Max here. And I will give this colon here. And once the name mas matches uh, this name, I'm going to print a name. So I'm going to just write name entered is and whatever the name provided by the user. So I will just use this uh, name variable here. This we have already seen in the last video. Now in Python, you can also use a L if statement and the signature of L is if statement is you can just write L if here and then you can provide some other condition which returns boolean so i can once again here write if the name matches some other name for example leo and once again i'm going to just print a name entered by the user and this l if condition i can use any number of time after the if let me match this name to some uh, other different names for example roy and the last name will be Ali. So if the name matches Max, this statement will be executed. If the name matches Leo, this statement will be executed. If the name matches Roy, this statement will be executed. And if the name matches Ali, this statement will be executed. Now, if the name entered by the user does not matches any of these names, then we can use a else statement so we can uh, just write else here and we can uh, just print a message here so the name entered is invalid so this message will be printed when the name entered by the user does not match any of the name i am checking here so let's run the code and let's see what happens so now my code is running and i'm going to give the name max here for example and then press enter and it prints this message which says the name entered is max using this statement now once again when i run the program and this name matches let's say some other name ellie and then when i press enter it prints the name entered is ellie which means this statement is executed and let me run the program once again and when i give some random string here it prints the name entered is invalid. Now let's say the name entered by the user is max and this condition evaluates to true, then this statement will be executed and the other conditions which we have given using LF statement will not be evaluated. So let's say we will write max here also. So this condition and this condition is same, right? Checking for the same name and when i run the program and when i write max here only one statement is printed which is this one so we can see when uh, this condition returns true only one statement is executed and none of the other conditions are even evaluated now the important thing to note here is you cannot start with a l if statement you need to start with the if statement so you need to write a if statement and check the condition first and then only you will be able to write l if condition now it's possible to use multiple if condition and then this l if will become the part of this if condition and this will be the separate if condition so when i run the code once again 
and when I write max here, it's going to print two statements. One is using this and other is using this because this if condition and this if condition are two different if conditions. And once you use L if, so I'm going to use L if here, then this L if is the part of this if condition. So this is how you can use if statement with L if statement and else statement. Now let's see how to use the nested if statement. So I'm going to declare a variable called x and the value I will uh, assign to x is 10 and then I'm going to write an if condition and here I'm going to just evaluate whether x is uh, less than a 0 and when x is less than 0 I'm going to just print that x is negative else if the value is not less than 0 so I'm going to just write else then I'm going to just print x is positive. Now let's say I also want to evaluate if the x value is a even number or an odd number if the x value is positive. So under the else I can once again write if and then we can just evaluate this condition that if x modulo 2 is equal to 0 which means that when x modulo 2 returns a 0, that means it's an even number. So we can uh, print x is even. Otherwise, in the else condition, I can uh, just write else x is odd. So in this if condition, I'm checking if the value of x is less than 0 or not. And if this condition is not satisfied, then I'm checking whether x is a even number or x is an odd number. So if you remember indentation here is very important. So this if condition falls under the else condition, right? So this if condition and this else is the part of the else statement. So because we have provided this four space indent here, whatever code you write with this indent is a block of code and what we are essentially doing here is we are nesting one if else condition inside the other if else condition. You can also reverse this condition checking and you can also say if x is greater than or equal to 0 then the value of x is positive otherwise the value of x is negative and this statement you can write under the if condition also and this is also a nested if else statement and let me run this uh, program and you can see x is a positive value because x is equal to 10 and x is a even value so once this condition is true this statement will be printed and whatever if condition is there inside the parent if statement that will also be executed and this condition is checked first of all and obviously this condition is true in this case when x is equal to 10 because when you do x modulo 2 it's going to give us the remainder 0 and that's why x is a even value and that's why it's printing x is even here. So it's totally possible to use one if else statement inside the other if else statement and this type of if else statement are called nested if else statement. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use lists in Python. So first of all, what are lists? So list in Python is a kind of collection which allows us to put many values in a single variable. You can also say that list is an ordered set of values. So let's define a list. So I'm going to just say x is equal to and you can define a list inside these square brackets. And inside the list you provide some values. So for example I'm going to provide the values 3, 5, 4, 9, 7, 10. So this is how you can create a list in Python. And when I press enter, it's going to create a list. And when I just use x to get the list, 
is going to provide me all the values in the list. Now these values which are inside the list are called elements. So three is an element or five is an element or all these values in this list are all called elements. And all these elements are ordered by their index. Now index, as I already said in the previous videos also, always starts from zero. So we can fetch the value which is at index zero using this square bracket once again with the variable name. And then when I write index zero, it's going to give me the element which is saved at index zero. So looking at this list, three is at index zero, five is at index one, four is at index two and so on. So let's say I want to get the value which is at index four, zero, one, two, three, four. So I'm going to just write X square bracket four and it is going to give me seven, which is saved at index four. Now it's not necessary that list must contain all the same data type elements. So for example, I can also declare a variable called Y and in this I can uh, save some name, for example, max, I can uh, save a uh, integer, let's say one, I can save a uh, decimal value, let's say 15.5. I can save other list inside this list using these square brackets, for example, three comma two. So one list can contain different type of data types with any number of elements. So when I press enter, and this time I want to get the value which is at index uh, zero, it's going to give me max. And once I want to get the value which is saved at index three, then it's going to give me this list which I have saved at index three. Now when you try to access the index which is not there, so I'm going to just write y and then I'm going to say 100 and this value is not present in this list at this index. So I'm going to press enter and it's going to give me the error which says list index out of range. Now if you want to get the length of the list, you can use the inbuilt function in Python which is len and then your list name. So for example, I want to find out the length of list X. It's going to give me six. It's going to give me six because you can see here, this list contains six elements. Or I want to get the length of the second list, which is Y, and it's going to give us four because this list contain four elements. Now it's also possible to insert and remove elements from the list. So for example, I'm going to use X, which has six element till now, and I'm going to insert the seventh element. So I can use a method called insert, and you can see this method takes an index and the object name. So I'm going to choose this, and the index at which I want to insert the value is at index two, and the value I want to insert is some string, for example, Tom, and I'm going to press enter, and I'm going to print the values inside the X list, then you can see now this list has seven elements and Tom is inserted at the index two because we have inserted this value at the index two. In a similar way, you can remove something from a list also. So to remove something, you can use your variable name, for example, X dot remove and the value you want to remove. So for example, once again, I want to remove this name which I have inserted at index two. And once again, when I print the value of X, it's going to give me these values. Now let's say the list contains two element which are exactly the same. So I'm going to insert one more element at index one and this element will be three for example. And now my list contain double three here. And if I want to remove this three, so I'm going to just uh, call this remove function once again, and I will say three here and then press enter. You can see only one three is removed from this list. So you can see these three are at index zero and index one. So this value is removed, which is at index zero, and this will remain in this list. So if a list contains duplicate values, it's going to remove the value from the left. And also remove is going to remove only one object, which is 
found first in the list. Now, if you try to remove the element which is not there in the list, so I'm going to re remove something which is not even there in this list, then it's going to give us this error, which says that this is a value error and it cannot remove this value from the list. Now, there is one more function with the list, which is a pop method. And this we can use to remove the values from the last. So you can see our list was previously having six elements and 10 was the last element. And when you use this uh, function, which is pop, it's going to pop this 10 from the list. And now let's see the content of the list. So now this list contain only five element and the last element is now removed. Once again, when you use this pop method, it's going to remove the seven. And now our list only contains four elements. Now let's say you want to delete the whole list. So I'm going to uh, declare a list and this list will contain a few values. And then I will press enter and you can see the values of list. And now I can use a function called del and then the name of the list. And this function is going to delete this list. So I'm going to just press enter and then once again try to access the values inside this variable. And now it says the name Z is not defined because delete function has deleted this list. Now once again, I'm going to create this list Z. And now there is a function called uh, clear, which is used to remove all the values from the list. So I'm going to just press enter and then try to access the value of Z. And you can see this list is now empty because we have used the clear function which is used to empty the list. Let me show you a few more functions related to lists. So let's say I can uh, use X and the values inside X are three, five, four, nine. And I can use a function called sort to sort all these uh, integer values inside the list. And once I press enter now, now you can see all the values are sorted and you can see all the values are sorted in ascending order. You can also use this method x dot uh, reverse and it's going to reverse all the values. So once I use the reverse function and then uh, when I try to get all the values inside the list, you can see all the values are now reversed. There is also a function called uh, append. And here you can append anything to your list. So I'm going to append 10 to my list. And when I try to access this list, you can see at last this 10 is appended in my list. Also, if you want to copy one list into another, you can use, let's say I'm going to declare a variable called uh, S here. And I want to copy all the values from uh, X list. I can use X dot copy. And this is going to copy all the content of my X list into this new variable called S. So you can see all the values are copied into the variable S. So let me append something into my list once again. So I'm going to append 10 once again. And now my list looks like this. And there is a function called uh, count using which you can count the number of element which are there in the list. So I want to find how many number of 10 are there in the list is going to return me two. And once again, I want to count how many threes are there in the list. It's going to return me one. Let's say I want to count how many hundreds are there in my list and it's going to return zero. So this is how you can use lists in uh, Python. You can also use the list name and then dot and see all the methods which are available related to list here and you can use these method which you see here. In this video, we are going to see how to use tuples in Python. So first of all, what are tuples? So tuples are very similar to lists. That is, they are used to store the collection of elements in a single variable, but there is a very important difference between them. And that difference is tuples are immutable. Immutable means once tuples are created, they cannot be changed or the content in them cannot be changed. So let's see how we can declare a tuple. So I'm going to declare a variable called X and I'm going to assign some values to it. Now in case of list, we have seen we used the square brackets. In the case of tuples, we use these parentheses in order to store the list of elements. 
So I can just write 1, 5, 3, 4, and 8 for example, and then press enter, and it's going to create a tuple. Now in order to print the tuple, you can use X, and it's going to print this tuple. Now as I said, tuples are similar to lists in some ways, and that means you can uh, call a tuple element by a index in tuple. So all the tuple elements are arranged by their index and when you want to for example get the first element here you give the index 0 and then press enter and it's going to give you the value which is saved at index 0. Let's get the value which is saved at index 4 and I'm going to press enter and you can see it gives 8 which is saved at index Four. Now when I try to give an index which is not there, for example 100, it's going to give us error which says index error tuple index out of range. Now as I said tuples are immutable that is you cannot change the content of a tuple if they are initialized once. So let's try to test this. So I'm going to just assign the value at index 0 which is let's say 2 and I'm going to press enter and you can see it says type error tuple object does not support item assignment that is you cannot assign any other value to a tuple element if they are once initialized now that also means that you cannot use some of the functions which you used with lists in the tuples for example you cannot remove any element you cannot append any element you cannot change any element so for example, when I write uh, x here and then press dot, you can see there are few methods which are available with the tuple. And most important is this count method. So let's try to use this count method. And I want to know how many number of eight uh, which are there in this tuple. And it will give me one because eight is only present once in this tuple. If eight is present twice in this tuple, here you will see the result 2. Now in order to get the length of the tuple you can use the inbuilt function which is len and then the tuple name and then press enter and it's going to give you the length of the tuple. Now in the previous video I have told you that you can save multiple data type values in lists. Let's see if we can do the same with tuples or not. So I'm going to give the parenthesis, I'm going to give the first value as integer second value as a string, third value as uh, for example the decimal value and I'm going to press enter and I'm going to get the value of y and you can see it's totally possible to save multiple data type values in a tuple. So now I have declared two tuples, one is x and other is y. So let's print x and y once again very quickly and now what we want to do is we want to use a concatenation operators. So as I said, tuples are immutable, but let me define a third tuple here. And I want to add X tuple and Y tuple here. And I want to assign the value to Z. Is it possible? Let's check. So I'm going to just once again, see the contents in the Z variable. And you can see when you use this plus operator, or concatenation operator, it's going to join these two tuple and create a new tuple with the combination of the values of both these tuples. Now there is one interesting thing which you can do with a tuple, which is you can declare a variable and let me uh, define a tuple with only one element and I'm going to just give hi here. And then after this element, I'm going to provide comma here. So this is important, I have provided this comma and I haven't provided the second element in the tuple. And I can use an asterisk here and I can use some value here. So let's say I have provided five here and I'm going to press enter and then I'm going to see the values inside this A variable. And now you can see a high string is saved five times in A variable in the form of a tuple. So you can once again get this uh, value at index 2 for example and it's going to give you the value which is stored at index 2 which is high itself. You can also use an inbuilt function called max here 
to get the maximum value out of a tuple so max and I have provided x tuple here and you will be able to see it will give us the maximum value stored in that tuple and you can see here 8 is the maximum value which is there inside the tuple we can also get the minimum value using min function and it's going to give you the minimum value which is stored inside the tuple and also you can use our del function to delete our tuple so let's say i want to delete this tuple which is z here so i can just write the name of the tuple after del and space and then press enter and now once again when i try to get the value of z it's going to give me error which says name z is not defined so in order to delete the tuple you can use that del function so this is how you can use tuples in python in this video we are going to learn how to use sets in python so first of all what are sets so a set is an unordered collection with no duplicate elements and no indexing so let's see how we can use sets in python so you can declare a variable and then is equal to and you define the elements in set in a curly bracket so you can define multiple values here for example 1 comma 2 comma 5 comma 4 comma 7 comma 9 but keep in mind that set cannot have duplicate values so each value in set must be a unique value so for example what happens when we define a set with some duplicate values so i'm going to just uh, declare this set and press enter here and this set is created now whenever i try to access the values inside the set a then it's going to give me this set and you can see the two which was a duplicate which we have defined here is removed from this set so a set always have unique values and if you define a set with duplicate values it's going to remove the duplicate values and only save the unique values in the set so let's see some of the methods related to sets and the first method is as always len method and you can find the length of a set using this len method and the name of the set which returns the length of a set you can also use a add function so a dot add to add a element in a set so i want to add 10 for example into my set i can use this and then press enter and once again when i try to get the values inside this set a you can see 10 is added to this set but this 10 will only be added if it's already not there in the set if it's already there in the set nothing will happen so let's try to add once again 10 to this set which already have a set and once again you will see that nothing happens inside the set because 10 was already there now if you want to add multiple values in a set you can use a update method so you can call this method which is update and then inside the curly brackets you need to provide these multiple values so let's add some values into this set so i'm going to add 15 18 17 let's say and 14 okay and then press enter and now i will see the values inside the set and you can see all these values are added to the set you can also remove the values from the set so i can use a method called uh, remove and let's say i want to remove uh, 18 from the set i can just give the element and then press enter and once again i will try to access the set and you can see 18 is removed from this set now there is a method called uh, discard also so let's see how we can use this method discard works similar to remove method so for example i want to remove this 17 from my set i can uh, write 17 here and it works fine right so when i try to access the value of a 17 is removed so what is the difference between a discard method and a remove method so our remove method whenever you use our remove method and you try to remove an element which is not there in the set for example i will try to remove 100 which is not there in the set 
it's going to throw an exception and it says key error 100. Now if you try to do the same thing using a discard method, so I'm going to use a dot uh, discard here and try to discard 100 from the set which is not there in the set, it's not going to give me any error. And that's the difference between discard and remove. So remove throws an error when an element is not there, but discard doesn't throw any error. It's not going to do anything if the value is not there in the set. Now there is a pop method also you can use with uh, set. So I'm, I can use this pop method and then press enter. And what it's going to do is it's going to remove any random element from your set. So it's not necessary that it's going to remove the element from the left hand side or the right hand side. It will remove any random element from the set. Also, for example, I will declare a set of names, let's say. And if you want to clear the set, you can use a clear method. So I can use this clear method in order to empty this set. So now when I try to access the values inside the set, you can see it's an empty set with no values. If you want to delete a set, you can use a del function and then the name of your set and then press enter. And once you delete it, when you try to access it, it's going to give you an error that name is not defined. Now you can also create a set using a set constructor. So instead of these curly brackets, you can uh, write set and in the double parenthesis. So you need to provide the double parenthesis here in order to create a set using the set constructor. So this is also going to create this set called name. And when I try to access the values inside the set name, you can see it has created this set of names. Also, you can convert a list into a set. So let me uh, define a variable called Z and then I can use a set constructor and inside these parentheses, I can use the square brackets, which we use generally with lists. And then you can define your list here and then press enter. And this list will be converted to a set and you can see the result here. Now, similar to the mathematical set operations like union, intersection, difference, symmetric difference, you can also use these mathematical operations related to set on the Python sets also. So let's see how we can use this mathematical set operations on our Python sets. So let me once again define a set. I have already one set which is A which contains uh, these values for example and I will define a set B with some other set of values. So I'm going to define a set with for example. So that is the content of the set B. Okay, so now I have two sets and on these two sets I want to perform some set operations which are also used in mathematics. So you can find out the union of two sets using a operator called or. Okay, so when I write A and this pipe symbol which is called or B, it's going to give me the union of these two sets. And what is the union? So union of two sets contain all the elements that are there in the set A or in the set B. So or here is important, right? So I'm going to press enter and you can see it's going to give me the union of A and B. That means this set contains all the elements that are there in set A or in set B. Also, I can use a method called union instead of this or operator. So I can use a variable dot union there is a method called union and then you can write B here and then press enter, which is going to give you the same answer. Okay, so you can either use this union method or this or operator. Now let's see how we can find out the intersection between two sets. So in order to find out the intersection, you use A and this operator end and then your next set, which is B here. 
so what is an intersection of two sets so intersection of two sets contains all the element that are there in both the set that means set a and set b okay so when i press enter you can see it gives me two elements inside the set and these two elements are there both in the a set and the b set that's why we get only two values because these two values are there in set a and set b also again you can use a method called intersection so a intersection and then b which is going to give me the same answer so either you can use this method or you can use this operator now let's find out the difference between two sets so what is a difference between two set a difference of two sets contains all the elements that are in a but not in b okay so you can find out the difference by this minus operator here so when you write a minus b you will be able to get the difference between these two sets and this result will contain all the elements that are in a but not in b you can also use b minus a and then it's going to give you other result because this time it's going to give you a set which contains all the elements that are there in b and not in a so difference between set a minus b is totally different from b minus a and also you can use a difference method so a then you can call a difference method b and it's going to give you the same kind of answer you can see here and also you can call b dot difference a and it's going to give you the another answer of b minus a now you can also find out the symmetric difference between two sets and what is the symmetric difference between two sets a symmetric difference between two sets contains all the elements that are either in set a but not in set b or they are there in set b but not in set a so this is the symmetric difference and you can find out the symmetric difference using this cap symbol and then b so a cap b i don't know what is the exact name of this symbol you can find out by yourself and when you do this it's going to give you the symmetric difference between a and b and whenever you find out the symmetric difference then when you do for example b this cap symbol a it's going to give you the same answer because symmetric difference give you same answer whether you give a cap b or b cap a the answer will be always same also you can use a method symmetric difference so you can uh, use this uh, method called symmetric difference b and it's going to give you the same kind of result now one last thing i want to show here is sets are not indexed or ordered so whenever you want to find out for example a and the value at index 0 it's going to give you an error because there are no indexes in a set and they are not ordered by any index so sets are unordered collection of values now if you want to find out what all other methods you can use with sets you can create a set and then write the name of your set and then press dot here and you will be able to see this is the list of all the methods which you can use with the sets also if you want to list out all the methods which you can use with sets you can use this inbuilt function dir and then you can uh, provide any set name here which is your variable name and then press enter and once again it's going to print the list of all the method which you can use with the sets so this is how you can use sets in python in this video i'm going to show you how to use dictionaries in python so first of all what are dictionaries so dictionaries in python are like associative lists or a map now you can think of dictionary as a list of pairs so let me show you how to define a dictionary so you can define any variable name and to define a dictionary first of all you use these curly brackets and inside these curly brackets you provide a list of 
key value pairs. So let's provide the list of key value pairs. So first key is name and the name is max. The second key is for example age and the age of max is let's say 14 and we can also write here in which year he was born. So we can uh, just write year and he was born in 2004 for example and I'm going to press enter here and once again I'm going to just access the values inside this dictionary which is D and you can see our dictionary is created now. So as I said dictionary is a list of key value pairs and all these values which you see here before this colon are called keys. So name is a key here, year is a key here and age is a key here and whatever values you see after the colon are called values. So max is a value, 2004 is a value and 14 is a value and you can access the values from a dictionary based upon their keys. So for example, I have this dictionary D, I can use the square bracket and the key name for example, I want to get the name value, I can just give the name key here and then press enter and it's going to return me the associated value related to key name. In the same way, you can use other keys also, for example, age and I'm going to press enter and it's going to give me 14, which is the value. So age is a key here and 14 is the value. Now what type of data types you can store in a dictionary? So as key, you can define any data type. So let me define a new dictionary here and I'm going to give these curly brackets. And as I said, you can define a string value as key. Also, you can define a number as a key, for example, 15 colon 15. Let's try the float values. So I'm going to just write 15.1 colon 15.1. This is also allowed in dictionary. So you can use string values, you can use uh, integer values, you can use decimal values as key. And also let's try uh, the Boolean values. So you can use the Boolean values also as keys. And you can use a tuple also as a key. So I'm going to just give a tuple 2 comma 3 and then I'm going to assign a value of 5 to this key. And as values also you can use string values or decimal values or a integer values or a Boolean values or any kind of collection you can use as a value. So I'm going to press enter here. And now to access, let's say we want to access the value for this key, which is this tuple. So I'm going to just uh, enter this tuple inside these square brackets and it's going to return me five. Or I can just provide inside these square bracket true here and then press enter and it's going to return me the value which is associated with it, which is true itself. Or I can uh, just write here 15 and it's going to return me 15 in turn because 15 is associated with this value which is also 15. Now what happens when a key is not there and we try to access it? So I'm going to just access 100 from this e dictionary. It's going to give us error that this key is not present in the dictionary. You can also use the len method to find out the number of items in the dictionary and you can see it says five items are there in the dictionary E and we can count these items. So this is one item, two item, three item, four item and the fifth item is here. Or in other words, you can also say that len function is going to return you the number of key value pairs which are stored in our dictionary. You can also use, for example, I'm going to use my D dictionary now and you can also use a method called get and then you can uh, give the key name here in the parenthesis. So let's say I want to get the value associated with the name key. I can uh, get it like this and it's going to give me the value associated with the name key. You can also add a new key. So this D dictionary, you can see there are right now three key value pairs and I can add one more key value pair. So to add a key value pair, 
you need to just write D and in the square bracket you just need to give the name of the new key. So, I am going to just write uh, surname here which is the name of the new key in the dictionary D and then you need to give the value associated with that key. So, when I press enter and once again when I try to access the values inside the dictionary, now you can see that surname is added to your dictionary. Now, if you want to remove any key value pair from a list, then you can use the dot pop method and then the name of the key which you want to remove. Let us say we want to remove the surname once again which we have added and you can just press enter and now you can just print the values inside D. Now, you can see the surname key value pair is removed. You can also use a clear function. So, let us see what is there in the E dictionary. So, these are the values inside E dictionary. I can use E dot clear to clear the values inside the E dictionary. So, once again when I try to access E, it will give me the empty dictionary. Also, you can delete the dictionary using del function and the name of the dictionary and when I press enter and when I try to access this dictionary E once again, it is going to say that this name is not defined. You can also update the values in a dictionary. So, this is my dictionary and I want to update the name for example. So, I can use the dictionary name and then the key here for example, name and the new name I want to associate with this key is let us say a new name here and when I try to access this uh, dictionary once again, you can see the name is changed. You can also use a method called update to update this key value pair. So, once again I want to change the key value pair which is name. So, I can give this curly bracket and then give the key value pair which I want to change. So, name and the new name will be max once again and once again when I try to access the dictionary it will give me this dictionary and you can see the name is updated now. Now, there is a function in dictionary called keys which is used to list out all the keys of that dictionary. So, you can see it will list out all the keys of the particular dictionary. There is also a function called values which will list out all the values of that dictionary. If you want to list out all the key value pairs, you can use the function called items here and it will give you the key value pair list. Now, the last function I want to show here is let me list out the content of uh, the dictionary first of all. So, there is one more function which you can use here is which is pop item and you do not need to give any argument with this pop item. When you press enter, it is going to remove the last key value pair which you have added or updated. So, here we have updated this name key value pair that is why this is removed and now when you try to uh, see the content of the dictionary, this name key value pair is removed. So, this is how you can use dictionaries in Python. In this video, we will talk about the slice function in Python and also we will talk about how to use negative numbers with index in Python. So, let us get started. So, first of all, I am going to declare a list. So, now we have three variables, first is a list, second is a tuple and third is a string. Now, there is a function called slice which you can use with your lists, tuples and uh, strings to slice something out of your collection. So, to use this slice, I am going to declare a variable and then I am going to use this function which is slice and you can provide some parameters in the parenthesis here. So, the first parameter you can provide here is for example, start. The second parameter you can provide here is the end and the third parameter you can provide here is the step. So, let us say I want to get out of this list the numbers from 0 to 4. So, as a first argument we can define our number 0 which is the first index and at the end index we can define 5. 
and then I'm going to press enter and once again I'm going to use my list variable and pass this x variable which contains the slice object which is returned by this function here and then press enter and you can see here it gives me the values from 0 to 4 so the first argument in the slice function is the index from where you want to start the next parameter is the index of the element before which you want to stop okay so if you want to stop at 4 you provide the index 5 if you want to stop at index 5 you will you will provide the stop value as 6 okay so it will be always one more than what you want now there is a short notation for uh, achieving the same also and for that you can uh, use your uh, list and inside the square bracket you can provide the start value and the end value and then press enter and it's going to give you the answer but instead of comma i need to provide the colon here and then it will give me the answer okay so here you can use colon to give the start value and the end value and also an optional value which you can give as a third parameter which we will see in a moment okay so this is the short notation of uh, creating slice in python so as i said this is the start value and this is the end value plus one okay so let me show you something i have a list here and you can see here i have written you have the variable a it can be a list it can be a tuple or it can be a string and inside the square brackets you give the start value and the end value separated by this colon symbol and what it's going to give you is the items from start through end minus one okay so whatever end value you will give here you will get the value end minus one you can also use this notation so start colon and without giving the end value and also reverse is possible so you can give only the end value and not the start value and also this notation is possible so we will see one by one how to use all these uh, notations so first of all i will give once again i will use the tuple now and this time i'm going to just give the start value let's say i want to start from uh, four here and then colon and then press enter and it's going to give me the result from index four until the end of this tuple once again let me give the end value so instead of using this value before colon this time i will give the value after the colon and i will leave the start value blank and here let's say i just want to go before six so i'm going to press enter and you can see it will give me the result from zero to five that is end value minus one right so until five and also you can give this kind of notation so this time i'm going to use the string variable and you can use colon without giving the start and end value and when i press enter it's going to give me the whole string let's say if with this string i want to provide the start and end value let's say 0 to 5 and then press enter it's going to give me a string from 0 to 4 so this slice functionality you can use with the tuples lists and also with the string or essentially whatever collection which have the indexes you can use this kind of slides notation with those kind of collections now in addition with the start and end value you can also give the step value so let me just print the value of a once again and you can see the values inside the a and let's say i want to get out of this list 0 2 4 6 8 okay so essentially i want the every second value from the list so what i can do here is i can uh, give the variable name and then uh, start to end so from 0 to index 9 and the third argument here you can give is the step so let's say i want to get the every second value so i can give 2 here and then press enter and it returns me 0 2 4 6 8 now let's say i want to get every third value so i can write 3 here and it's going to give me 0 3 6 okay in a similar manner if i want to get the every fourth value i can write 4 here and then press enter and it gives me 0 4 8 also if you don't want to give this range from start to end 
you can leave uh, the start and end value as blank and then press enter and it's going to give you the same result. Now in Python, you can use indexes with the negative numbers also. So let me explain what I mean by negative number index. So let's say I have a string called Python. It have these character P Y T H O N. You already know that you can access the P character or P letter using the index zero and the Y letter using the index one and the T letter using the index two. So this is the positive index, right? You can also use the negative index, which start from the right hand side. So it starts from N and the index you can give here is from minus one. So the last index here will be minus one, then minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five and minus six here. So let's use these kind of indexes and let's see how we can use them. So we have this string here and let's say I want to get this value, which is nine, which is the last letter of the string. So I can use C and here inside the square bracket, I can give minus one and then press enter and it's going to give me the last letter of the string. If I give minus two here, it will give me the second last letter. Okay. So the negative index start from the right hand side and it goes from minus one till the end of the string. Now let's use this uh, negative number index with the list which we have. So we have this A list and uh, we can use A and then we can give a colon colon minus one, which is going to give you all the numbers in the reverse order in the list. So our list was starting from zero to nine it will give us nine to zero in the reverse order. Now let's say if you want to get the first two item in the reverse order. So this is when you use this minus one as the third parameter, it will give you everything in the reverse order. Okay. So minus one as the step value is used to give everything in the reverse order. So when you give, for example, one here and leave the end parameter empty, it's going to give you, you can see one zero. So as you can see, our list starts from zero one and it's going to give us the reverse order values. So it's going to give us one zeros because here we have given one and it's the end value for this reverse string because we have used the minus one here. Let's take some more examples. So instead of the start value, I can give minus three here and then press enter and you can see it gives us eight and nine, which are the last two items of the list in the reverse format. Okay. Because our index in reverse starts from minus one, minus two, minus three, and we, we are skipping the minus three option because we have seen that we uh, just uh, take the end minus one, right? So minus one, minus two, and these will be given to us in the reverse order because we have used minus one here. Now you can also give, for example, minus three as the start value. So I'm going to give the minus three as the start value and then press enter. And it's going to give us zero to seven, right? So zero to seven, except eight and nine in the reverse order. So because three this time is the start value and end value is until the so because three this time is the start value so we go from uh, minus one minus two minus three so minus three is this index and this is the start value so we get zero to seven in the reverse order so this is how you can use slice function and negative values with indexes in Python. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use loops in Python and we will start with the while loop. So first of all, what is a loop? So a loop allows us to repeat over some block of code again and again until and unless some condition is met. Now let's see how to use while loop in Python. So let's say I'm going to declare a variable called i and I'm going to initialize it with the value zero. And to use a while loop, you use this keyword and then you provide some condition. So let's say I want to check 
whether the value inside the i variable is less than 5 or not okay and as in the case of if also we have seen we provide after the condition this colon symbol and then in the next line we write the code which we want to perform again and again until this while loop condition is true so let's say we want to just print something and we will print that the value of i is and then we will uh, print the value of i like this also i want to change the value of i with every step so i will change the value of i using this expression which is i plus equals 1 this essentially mean that we want to just add 1 every time whenever this code is executed also we can say that we want to perform this operation i is equal to i plus 1 so this statement is similar to this statement let me provide some spaces here now in here also you will observe that i have provided some indentation here and indentation means that these two lines of code is the part of while loop okay so when i want to write something outside the while loop i will start from here with no indentation and let's say i want to just uh, print that we are finished and now let me run the code and let's see what's the result and you will see here first of all this string is executed which is the value of i is and then the value of i is printed which is 0 1 2 3 and 4 so as you can see here that we have initialized i is equal to 2 so the initial value of i is 0 now when we come to this code and when this condition is checked here the value of i is 0 which is less than 5 that means this condition is true and that means that these two lines of code which are under while loop will be executed so this line is executed where value of i is printed which is i is equal to 0 and this line of code increments the value of i by 1 so when this line of code is executed now the value of i becomes 1 because previously it was 0 and once again this program flow goes to the starting to evaluate this condition and this time the value of i is 1 which is less than 5 and the condition is true once again and again this line is of code is uh, executed and this line of code is executed and the value of i is incremented by 1 once again and the value of i becomes 2 here and this will happen again and again until the value of i becomes 5 and when the value of i becomes 5 this condition will be false and that means this code will not be executed this code will only be executed when the while loop condition is true and then at last this line of code is printed which is finished while loop now let me give you one more example of while loop and i will start from the top once again and this time i will declare a variable called num and i will initialize this value by zero and also i will declare a variable called sum and initial value of sum is also zero now here first of all i will ask the user to enter a number so i'm going to just write and also i will ask the user if he or she wants to exit from the loop he can enter zeros and then in the next line i will start with my while loop and i will give the condition if the number so if the number i'm going to write number is not equals to zero we want to perform some operations and what operation we want to perform we want to ask the user to provide any number and we will transfer this number into the variable num so here i will first of all write input and then i will ask the user to provide the number and when the user provides the number i want to convert it to a float value so i will just typecast this input to a float value and then this number will be assigned to the variable num now here don't forget to give the colon and in the next line what i will do is i will just use my sum variable and i will just add the number value to the sum 
So, I can uh, just write sum is equal to sum plus num and this means that initially the value of uh, sum will be 0 and then this number will be added to the sum and until this loop runs we will get the sum of all the numbers which is entered by the user and at last I am going to just print the value of sum. So, now what do you think will happen? So, in this condition we are evaluating that num should not be equal to 0 and then only this code will be executed and we have provided the initial value of number is equal to 0. So, this condition will never be met and this statement will never be executed. So, we need to provide the initial value of num is equal to 1 and then whenever the user provides the value this 1 will be overwritten by the value which is provided by the user. So, this time when we run the code you can see first of all the program asks us to provide a number. So, I will provide 100 here and then press enter and you can see the sum is printed which is equal to 100. Once again we will provide some number and then press enter and now you can see sum is equal to 150. Once again we will provide one number and then press enter and now the sum is 1050. Now let us say we provide a number is equal to 0 and then press enter. You can see that our while loop is finished because 0 is not equal to 0 that means a false condition and then the flow of program comes out of the loop and then the other while loop will be executed which is this while loop and that is why this output is printed. We can also write that sum is equal to so we know that this is the sum so sum equals and then after the comma we will print the value of sum and once again when we execute the code and once I want to exit from the code I can use 0 to exit. So, 0 and then press enter and I come out of this loop. Now, Python also supports the else statement to be associated with the loop statement. So, what I mean by the else statement to be associated with the loop statement is that I can use after the end of this while loop condition I can use here else and after the colon I can provide some code which I want to execute once this loop is finished ok. So, I can write here that I want to print for example finished sum. So, let me run the code once again and I will quickly provide some numbers here and which will provide the sum and when I provide 0 here then we come out of the loop and you can see this finished sum string is printed using this else. So, once your program comes out of the loop this else statement will be executed. Similarly, we can go down and here also instead of writing this finished while loop we can also give else statement here. So, I am going to just write else and after the colon here I need to provide the indentation. So, 4 space indentation 1, 2, 3, 4 and everything will be ok and once I run the code and first of all I will provide 0 here to see if this is executed and you can see this else condition is called once your while loop is finished. Now, also you can provide some condition here which is always true. So, for example, I can uh, write true here and this means that while loop evaluates to true every time and this means that this statement will be executed forever. So, this is also possible, but you need to think carefully what do you want to do. Do you want to execute this code infinitely or do you want at some time that this condition will be false. So, this is how you can use while loops in Python. In this video, we are going to see how to use for loops in Python. So, first of all, what are for loops? So, a for loop is used to iterate over a sequence and that sequence can be a list or a tuple or a dictionary or a set or a string. So, for that, I am going to declare some variables and the first variable is A which is a list, second variable is B which is a tuple third is C which is a set, fourth 
is our string and fifth variable is e which is our dictionary. Now before seeing the syntax of for loop, I am going to show you how to use in operator in python because it is used in for loop. So I am going to first of all use print and then I am going to use zero and then use in operator and then I am going to use this first variable which is a which is a list right and let's see what happens when I try to run this code. So it prints true. So in operator will give you true or false depending upon whether this value is present in your sequence or not. So for example when I write 100 here which is not present in the list it's going to return us false. So this you can use with the tuple also let me uh, just uh, use it with tuple and let's use uh, one here and I'm going to run the program and it prints true once again. Also we can use in operator with strings so I can uh, write d here but for that I need to convert this one into a string. So now when I run the code it will give me true. Now let's see how to use a for loop in python. So for loop as I said we can use with some sequence. So let's use it with a which is a list. So I can write x in a and a is a list in this case and then I can just print the value of x and let's see what happens first of all when we just write this kind of a for loop. So we are going to run the program and what it does is it prints the values from 0 to 5 which is the element present inside the list. So for loop is going to iterate over your list one by one and this in operator is going to check whether this value is there in your sequence or not in this case in our list or not. So first of all when for loop start it will transfer the first value which is 0 into x and then it checks whether x is in this list a or not and then it's going to print the value of x which is 0 and once again program sequence goes here and once again the next value is transferred to x which is 1 and once again this condition is validated if 1 is in this list a or not and then the value of x is printed which is 1 and this iteration goes on and on until 5 is reached which is the last value in the list. So 5 is printed and after that there is nothing inside x and then the program flow comes out of this loop. You can also use this uh, for loop with the tuple also. So let's try it with tuple and let's see what happens. And it's going to print the same values. Also with uh, the set let's see what happens. So I'm going to run the program once again and it prints 0 to 5 once again because these are the content of the set also. Once again let's try to use this uh, for loop with the string and let's see what happens and it's going to print out the content of this string which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and it prints them one by one. Now with the dictionary we use this for loop in a little bit different way. So for example I will uh, write the variable name which is a dictionary and then let's say I want to just print all the keys inside this dictionary then I can write e dot keys and then we have all the keys using this function and when I run the code it's going to print all the keys inside your dictionary. Also when you use the function called dot values it's going to print out all the values inside your dictionary. You can see max and the age 20. Now let's say you want to print out all the key value pairs which are there in your dictionary. You can use a function called items and this is going to give you keys and values, right? So I can uh, just write key comma value here and then I can print the value of key first of all key and let's provide some uh, space here and then let's print out the variable value here okay and when I run the code it's going to give you first of all key and then the value once again key and then the value. So in order to print out the keys and values from a dictionary you can use this kind of notation. Now you can also use a function called range so let me show you how to use this uh, function which is range which returns us 
the values starting from zero. So there is a function called uh, range here and in here you can provide a number and this range is going to return the number starting from zero to five. So whatever number you write here, the range will be returned from zero until that number except whatever number you write here. Okay. So let me just try to print out the values which is there in the X and when I try to print this, it's going to return me from 0 to 5. And you can see here 6 is not printed because the range will give us the value except that value which you write here. You can also provide the start value here. So let's say I want to start from 2 and I want to go until 5. I can write something like this. And now you can see now it pr start printing from 2 to 5. Also, you can give a third parameter here, which is a step parameter. So I can give three here, for example, and let's say I want to write 30 here and let's uh, run the code. And now what is going to return is it starts from two because we have uh, given the start value two here and it's going to go until 29 because we have given 30 value here, right? And this is the step. So every third value will be printed after two here. So five will be printed, then eight, then 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, 26, and 29. Every third value, right? If you write here two, then we will increment in the step of two. So this is how you can use range function with your for loop. Also, as I said in the last video, you can use else statement with your loops so I can also write else here and then after the colon in the next line, I can print something or I can execute some statement. So for now, I will just print finished and then I'm going to run the code. And once the loop is finished, you can see this else statement is executed, which prints finished. So else statement will be executed once your for loop is finished. So in this way, you can use for loops in Python. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can use break and continue keywords with your Python loops. So to start with, I have here two loops. One is a for loop and other is a while loop. Now this for loop takes a list and then print every element out of this list using this print function. In a similar way, while loop evaluates the value of i, if it's less than five, then it's going to print the value of i and then increment the value of i by one. Now this is all normal and we have already seen this kind of code. Now you can use a break keyword with your loops in order to terminate the execution of loop immediately. So let's see how we can use break keyword first and then we will see how to use continue keyword. So here I'm going to give a condition inside my for loop and I'm going to just evaluate whether x is equal to three or not. And if x is equal to three, I'm going to use this break keyword. In the same way, I'm going to use this if condition inside my while loop also, but instead this time I'm going to evaluate i is equal to three and if i is equal to three, then I'm going to use this break inside this if condition. So let's run the code and let's see what happens. And you can see in the for loop, it has only printed zero, one, two. Even though this for loop is supposed to print from zero to five, it has printed until two from zero because as soon as this x value becomes three and we call break here, the loop is terminated immediately and our program will come out of the loop immediately as soon as this break keyword is called. In the case of this while loop also, as soon as this i value becomes three, we are calling the break keyword. And as soon as this break keyword is called, our loop is broken and the execution of code will come out of this loop. So until two, everything was okay. But as soon as the value becomes three, this break is called and then we come out of the loop. Let me just print a line here in order to separate these two loops. So we know that from where one is starting, right? So I'm going to once again run the code 
and you can see for loop prints from 0 to 2 and also while loop prints from 0 to 2. If you uh, change the value here, for example here, you want to evaluate x is equal to 2 or not and here you want to evaluate if x is equal to 4 or not and then you break out of the loop and once again when I run the code, you can see the for loop runs only two iteration for 0 and 1 and as soon as the value of x becomes 2, we call the break keyword and we come out of this loop. And in the case of while loop, as soon as this value of i becomes 4, we come out of the loop. So the value from 0 to 3 is printed. Now let's see how we can use a continue keyword instead of this break keyword. So instead of this break keyword, I will use a keyword called continue here and also in the while loop also I'm going to use this keyword called continue and I'm going to run the program and let's see what happens. So now when you see here, so you can see here for loop starts from printing 0, 1 and as soon as the value of x becomes 2, this condition is met and this continue is called and as soon as this continue keyword is called, everything whatever code comes after this continue keyword will be skipped and your program execution goes once again to a for loop for the next value. So you can see in case where x is equal to 2 and continue is called, this statement is not executed because as soon as we execute continue in our loop, then that iteration is skipped and all the code after the continue will not be executed okay so we go to the next iteration so that's why 2 is not printed because this was skipped in case of 2 and then directly 3 is printed and then 4 and 5 is printed in case of while loop also as soon as the value of i becomes 4 you can see 4 is not printed here you can also change this value to 2 and then I'm going to run the program once again and you can see while loop prints 0, 1 and why it prints 0 and 1. So because as soon as the value of i becomes 2, this continue keyword is called and after that this iteration is skipped and also because this iteration is skipped, these two lines of code are not executed and because this line of code is not executed, that's why the value of i is not incremented and the value of i always remains 2 and that's why this becomes a infinite loop, right? So instead of increment the value of i at the last line, we can increment the value of i just after this condition check whether i is less than 5 or not and then we run the code. Now you can see it prints 1, 3, 4 and 5. So now what's happening here is initially the value of i is equal to 0 and this condition is evaluated and then we first increment the value by 1 and that's why it starts with the printing of 1 by using this print function and as soon as i is equal to 2 this continue is called and that's why here 2 is not printed because as soon as the value of i becomes 2 this continue is called and every code or every statement after the continue will be skipped for that iteration that's why 2 is not printed here so in this way you can use break and continue keywords with loop in this video i'm going to show you what is a function in python and how to use functions in python so first of all, what is a function? So a function is a group of statements within a program that performs a specific task. Now functions can be of two types. One is built-in function and the other is user-defined function. Built-in function, we have already seen that print is a built-in function or for example, input is a built-in function or for example, min is a built-in function and so on. Now usually function does one task at a time. So you can see this print function only prints something whatever input you give here it's going to print it. 
Input function takes some input from the user. Min function finds out the minimum out of some values. So a particular function do one task at a time. Now let's see how we can define a function. So to define a function, you use a keyword def and then you give the name of the function. So name of function and after the name of the function, you give these parentheses and you provide number of arguments or parameters. So for example, arg1, comma, arg2, comma, arg3 and so on. So you can give any number of arguments to your function. Now after this ending parenthesis, you give this colon and then under this function signature, you write some statements which you want to execute when this function is called. So for example, if you want to print something, you can uh, print something. Or if you want to calculate something, for example, the product of uh, two or three variables or a sum of two or three variables, you can do under this function declaration. So let's take an example of function and let's see how we can define a real life function. So I'm going to define a very simple function which is going to add two values. So I'm going to name it as a sum. And for example, it takes two values. One is let's say arg1 and other is arg2. And then after the colon, I want to add these two values. So I can just write print here and then I can write arg1 plus arg2. So this is a very simple function which takes two arguments and then add these two arguments and print them. So this is how you declare a user defined function. Now after declaring a function, you need to also call this function. So in order to call the function, you just use the name of the function and then you provide the arguments which is required by the function. So our function requires two argument right now, arg1 and arg2. So we are going to provide these two uh, values. Let's say I want to provide 15 as the argument one, and I will provide 60 as the second value. Now let's run the code and let's see what happens. So when we run the code, you can see our function prints 75, which is the sum of these two values, which we have provided as an argument to this function. Now also, if you remember this plus operator, you can also use to concatenate two strings. So I can use this sum function and this time I'm going to provide, for example, hello as the first parameter and then world as the second parameter. And then I'm going to run the program and it's going to print hello world. In addition, we can provide two float numbers here. For example, I will provide 15.647 and the second argument I'm going to provide is 80.258 and this is also allowed. So I'm going to just uh, run this code and it gives us the sum of these two values. So this function sum is doing one single task, which is to add two values, whether it's a string or it's a number or it's a float value. Now you may also observe that when I provide, for example, as a first argument, I will provide a string and as a second argument, I will provide a number here. Will this work? Let's see. So it's going to give us an error and this error says can't convert int object to string implicitly. So this is a problem. So to solve this problem, we can provide here a simple condition and we are going to check the type of both the arguments. So if type arg1 is not equal to type arg2, this should be arg1, not agr1. So let me just change this here. And if the type of arg1 is not equal to arg2, we are going to just use this keyword, which is return. So this return keyword is used to return something. 
So you can return for example 0 here or any string here and when you write this return function without any value here it's going to return nothing. But as soon as this return keyword is called nothing after that will be executed. So even though you are returning nothing from here then also this statement will not be executed. So whenever return is executed after that all the statements which are under the return will not be executed. Also, we can print a message here that please give the args of same type. Okay, and let's run the code now. And you can see now it prints this message which says please give args of same type. So if these arguments are not of same type, whether it's an integer or a string or a float value if the user provides first argument which is a string type and the second argument which is a integer type then this condition will be true and this statement will be executed which is going to print this message and then return is called and after this whatever statements are there will not be executed. So now as I said you can also return some values from a function and here when you don't give any values after this return keyword, it's not going to return anything. But let's return the addition of two arguments using a return keyword. So I'm going to use this uh, return keyword here, which is going to return the addition of these two values using this sum function. So now what will happen is, let's run the code once again. And you can see this sum is executed, this sum is executed, this sum is executed, but the result is not printed. So in order to get the result out of this function, when it returns something, we need to save this return value in a variable. So let's save this uh, value into a variable and then you can uh, use this variable to print the value of the sum. So I can uh, do something like this. Also, you can directly enclose this sum function inside a print function and then also it's going to print the sum of these two strings. So either you can assign the result of this sum function which is returning the result into a variable or you can use directly this print function to get the result and print it. So I'm going to use print with other two functions also. So first print and the second print here and let's run the code once again. And now you can see what happens. So first of all it prints 75 which is the addition of these two numbers which is returned by this sum function into a variable a and we are printing the sum using this print function. Here in the next result it prints hello world because this sum function now returns the concatenation of these two strings. Similarly this sum function is going to return the sum of these two float values and in the last result because the type of hello is not equal to the type of 15 then this message is printed because this condition is true in the last case and then return will be called and when this return is called we were printing whatever is returned from the sum function and you can see at last none is printed because at last this sum function is returning nothing because the type of these two arguments is not same so we were returning without any value and that's why none is printed here. Now there are few things to note here. Okay, so the first thing is you can define a function using def keyword and then the name of the function and under these parentheses you provide the argument. So these two are called arguments. So this is an argument one and this is an argument two. Also you can use alternatively the name parameters for these two arguments. So this is a parameter one and this is a parameter two. Now it's possible to return from a function like you can return the addition of two values 
or it's also possible to return nothing from a function so when you use return without a value it's not going to return anything now when you use this function somewhere it's called calling a function now at last let's discuss about some of the benefits of using functions so the first benefit is function makes your code simpler because if you don't use function to execute this kind of code then you need to write this code again and again whenever you want to use this functionality at different places the second advantage is function makes your code reusable so the same code is used to add two integer values to concatenate two string values to add two float values and it's also used to give the error if you provide the arguments of different types so that means you write the code once and use it multiple times and that results in faster development of the code so if you use a function you can develop your code much faster than if you don't use a function and the last but not the least advantage is when you declare functions you can test and debug your code in a better way so this is how you can declare and use functions in python in the last video we have seen how to declare functions and how to use functions in python in this video also we will discuss some more properties which are related to functions in python so let's get started so to start with i have a function called student which takes two arguments one is name and other is age and inside the function we just simply print the value of name and age using the print function and when we call this function with the name and age it's going to print this kind of output now python allows us to set the default value of the arguments so after this name you can put uh, equals to symbol and then put the default value whatever you want to set for the name for example if somebody doesn't provide any name then you can just say unknown name similarly we can set the default age here let's say default age is 0 if somebody doesn't provide any age with the student function then the default value will be 0 now instead of uh, using this student function like this let's say i don't provide any uh, argument to this student function and let's run the code and you can see if i don't provide any argument to this student function the default values are taken so the default values are used when you want to make sure that every argument in your function should have some value now let's say i just provide a name here and don't provide the age and let's run the program and now you can see the name is overwritten by the argument what we have provided here right so default value will be this one if no argument is provided similarly if we give the value of age and now we run the program the default age is replaced by the age which is provided using the arguments so this is how you can use default values with the arguments of the function so let me just remove these default values and i'm going to give you the next example which is variable length arguments so let's say with the name and age i want to provide the list of scores which this student has scored for different subjects so as a third argument i'm going to provide a argument called uh, marks and somehow i want to provide a list of marks which is scored by this student and let me print the value of uh, marks using this print function also now in python you can use asterisk in front of your argument and this means that you can provide multiple arguments when you use this kind of notation so let's just provide for example we already provided the 
name and age here and let's provide different marks scored by the student so i can provide 95 for first subject then uh, 70 for second subject then 80 for next subject then 50 for next subject and let's say we don't know how many subjects the student has taken we just have only the information about these four subjects which he has taken so we can provide uh, four values here and then let's run the code and now you can see name is Tom age is 22 and the value of marks is shown as a tuple okay so whenever you provide this asterisk in front of an argument you can provide the values for that argument using normal arguments as you provide for normal argument so first two variables are associated with name and age and all the other variables which you provide here will be assigned to this marks variable because it has this asterisk in front of it so now you can also use a for loop in order to iterate over tuple so x in marks for example and then you can print every value or you can access every value inside this tuple and let me comment this print function and let's run the code once again and you can see for loop has printed all these marks which are there inside the list now if you want to use this type of variable length argument then i will suggest you to use this argument as the last argument of your function so that it will be clearer to the reader of the function that whatever you provide at the end will be the part of this last argument now you may ask that we have provided these marks for this student but for which subject these marks are given to the student now in python you can also use double asterisk in front of your function argument and this means that now you can provide the key value pairs as a marks arguments so instead of using 95 i can also say that 95 is scored in english let's say and then uh, 70 is scored in math and then uh, let's say 80 is scored in uh, physics and uh, the 50 marks is scored in uh, biology so now when you use these double asterisks in front of your function argument you can provide these kind of key value pairs which are separated by this equal to symbol and how you can access these values so let's run the code and let's see what happens and now you can see only keys are printed and not the values of uh, these subjects are printed so let's first uncomment this print function and let's see what type of value we are getting so whenever you use these double asterisks the values are given to you in the form of a dictionary okay so if you use single asterisks the values are given to you in the form of tuple but whenever you use these double asterisks and whenever you try to access this variable then this variable will be of type dictionary and you already know how to print the values of dictionary so you can uh, just uh, write marks dot items here and then here you can uh, just write key comma value and then you can print the value of key and value so i'm going to just print key first of all and then i'm going to just give a space here and then i'm going to print the value right and now when we run the code it will give me first of all the key for example english math physics or biology and the value which is 95 70 80 or 50s now before starting our object oriented programming journey in python let's discuss about what is the difference between the procedural programming and the object oriented programming so you will have the better idea why we use object oriented programming now traditional programming languages such as c or pascal were called procedural programming languages or structural programming languages where the basic unit was functions now programming in these type of procedural languages involves choosing a data structure 
and then designing the algorithm and then translating that algorithm into a code. So if this sounds a little bit confusing, let me try to explain it with an example. So let's say you have been given a task to create a program for a passenger who wants to travel from one place to the another place using a cab service. So if we think from the point of view of procedural programming, what we do in the procedural programming is we create some global data structure which holds the data. So here, for example, we create some kind of data structure which can hold the data. For example, in case of a cab service, uh, which cab service is it or which type of cab is it and at what location this cab is standing. All these kind of data we store in a data structure in a global environment. Now after storing the data, we design an algorithm. So let's see what kind of algorithm we can uh, develop in the procedural programming language for our cab booking service. So this is a pseudo code which I have written. So first of all, the passenger will open the app from which he can book a cab and then he will book the cab and once the cab is booked he will wait for the cab and then once cab arrives he will sit in the cab and then he will reach to his or her destination and at the end he will pay the fare of the cab and this is the pseudo code of that algorithm and then we will translate this algorithm into actual code in procedural programming language. Now in these type of procedural programming languages, we concentrate on creating the functions. And the major drawback of uh, using these functions is that data and operations on the data are separated. That means we need a methodology to send this data to these functions. So here we need to send this data which we have saved globally into these functions and these functions take this data either as argument or as a global variable and then perform some actions on this data and give you some result. Now these kind of functions are passive. What do I mean by passive here? That is these kind of function cannot hold any information inside them. So once you give the data, they are able to give you the result back after performing some operations, but they cannot save or hold the state or the data so that if you want to use that data in some other place in your code, then it will be very difficult using these kind of functions which you use in procedural programming. Now let's look at the object-oriented approach of doing things. So in object-oriented programming languages like C++ or Java or Python, the basic unit is class. Now if we take the same example of a passenger who wants to travel from one place to another using a cab service using object oriented programming thinking which depends upon the creation of object we can create different kind of object for example for a cab we can create a class called cab and then we can create a class for cab driver and the third class we can create for a passenger Okay, so a class you can create for any real life object. It can be a car, it can be a motorbike, it can be a book or employee or a person. So object oriented programming allows us to create object. So first of all, what is a class? So a class refers to a blueprint in which we can have data and methods. Okay, so for example, for our cab class, what attributes this cab class can have for example a cab service which cab service we want to take what is the make of the cab it is it a toyota or a bmw or a volkswagen cab at which location this cab is right now what is the number plate of that cab so the passenger can recognize this cab so all these things 
which I have written here are called data because they can hold some kind of data. Number plate has number plate data. Location have geolocation data. Make have the make data. Cab service can have uh, data like uh, Uber or any other cab service. And the other thing which a class can have are called method. So earlier we have seen that we can create functions and when these functions you use inside a class they are called method. Okay, so functions inside a class are called method. Now the data inside this object or class is called attributes or the member variables which can hold some data and using this class we can create object of the cab class which means we can create different object using a same class and how to create object using classes we will see in the next video in the real life example so don't worry if you don't understand how these things works i will give you a real life example so you will be able to understand in a better way now what is an object an object is a software unit that combines data and methods okay so we have this data here and then we have the methods inside the class and object is able to combine both of them which is data with the methods now these objects for example a cab object and the passenger object can exchange the data between them also so data is interchangeable between for example the passenger object and a cab object so let's rewind once again what we have learned about object oriented programming so the basic unit in object oriented programming is a class and a class refers to a blueprint which can have the data and methods now using a class we can create objects and what is an object object is an instance of a class and each object can have its own data and method and an object is able to store the state of some kind so at which location this cab is right now so this is a state and an object is able to store that state now in procedural programming if you remember there is no relation between the data and the method right we need to provide the data to the method which are separate entities in the procedural programming language now these data members are called attributes or member variables and these functions which you define inside a class are called methods and what are some of the key differences between procedural programming language and object oriented programming language the first is the unit in procedural programming language is function and on the other hand in object oriented programming the unit is class the second is the procedural programming concentrate on creating functions while object oriented programming starts from isolating classes and then they can have data and methods inside it in procedural programming language the data and the functions are separate and in object oriented programming language data and methods are not separate they are the part of a single object of a class now if all this seems to be little confusing to you don't worry you are not alone and I will try to solve this confusion in the next video in which I will tell you how to create the classes and how to use classes in Python. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can create your first class in Python. Now, if you haven't seen my last video in which I have discussed what is object oriented programming and what are classes, I will highly recommend you to watch that video because this will be a continuation of that video. So let's create a class in Python. So for that, I will create a new project. So let's create a new project in PyCharm. So just click on file here and then click on new project. And then the project name I'm going to give here is oops. And then I will just click on create and I will 
choose this option which says open in current window and also this option which is add to currently opened project which is going to create this project in this window itself which is already open so now you can see we have a empty project here and inside this project let's create a python file so right click on the project and then new and then we are going to create a new file and let's create a class called car so i'm going to name the file name as car because we are going to create the car class now in order to create a class in python you use a keyword class and then you give the name to your class so the class name in our case is car and then you give this colon and for example i write here a keyword called pass now when you write this keyword after the declaration of a class this means that it is a empty class you can also use this pass keyword to create an empty method so this keyword pass is used to create an empty class or an empty method now here after the class declaration let's see how we can create an instance of a class so it's really easy to create an instance of a class so let's create a first object and i'm going to name it as ford which is a car brand and then you use your car class name and use these parentheses here okay so this here ford is an object or you can also say it's an instance of the class car in a similar way we can create multiple objects for example honda is another car brand and you can create the honda object using this class car once again you can create a new object for example audi and then you can once again use this uh, car class to create this object so what we have done till now we have created three object from the class car now in the previous video i have told you that you can associate some data with your object so let's associate some data so for example ford we can associate a attribute called speed right so we can assign the speed for example 200 here for honda we can assign speed let's say 220 and for audi we can assign the speed let's say 250 so speed here is called the attribute and whenever you create a empty class using this pass keyword you can add these attributes on the fly so you can see we have added these attribute after the declaration of the class and after the creation of the objects let's add some more attribute to these instances or the object so a car can have the color so i'm going to just write color and the ford has let's say the red color and let me just copy and paste here and let's say the honda have the blue color and we have the audi of black color so once again color is an attribute here now if you want to print these attribute you can use this print method and then for example we want to print the speed of ford and the color of ford then we can uh, do it like this and let's run the code so in order to run this code first of all when you create a new project and a new python file you need to right click on this file and then click on run the file name whatever is your file name my file name was car so you can see now the result is printed here first is the speed and second is the color of an instance ford similarly you can uh, print the color and speed of uh, honda and audi objects also now if you want to change some attribute it's also possible so let's say i want to change the speed of ford object so i'm going to use ford dot speed once again and this time i want to assign 300 speed 
to this attribute. Let's say we also want to change the color of uh, the Ford object. So I'm going to just use Ford.color and this time I want to use the color blue here. And let's once again, uh, we will uh, try to print the color and speed of the object Ford. And now you can see this result. So before the speed was 200 and the new speed is 300 for the object Ford. And before the color was red and the new color is blue for this object Ford. Now if you have followed the last video, this speed and color is the data. So speed and color are the variables which holds some data inside them. But still we haven't added any behavior or methods to our class car and that we will do in the next video. Now let's create a new class because uh, understanding classes in any language is difficult. So let me give you another example. So this time I'm going to create a new Python class and I'm going to name this Python class as a rectangle and then press OK which is going to create this class. And to create a class you already know you use the keyword and the name of the class and then the colon and we will also make this class an empty class using this pass keyword and in order to create an instance i'm going to just uh, write uh, rect1 which is the first object using the rectangle class and then i'm going to create rect2 which is the second object using this rectangle class. And now what are the attributes which we can relate to the rectangle? A rectangle have a width and the height. So let's add the width and height. So let me use the first object and let's say height is 20 for the rectangle one. And then we are going to use the second object. And once again, we are going to add the height for the second rectangle let's say the height of second rectangle is 30 similarly we can add the width to the rectangle so width is equal to let's say it's 40 and rect2 object have the width let's say 10 so what we have done here we have created a rectangle class and then we have created two instances of the rectangle class rect1 and rect2 which are also called objects and then we have added some attributes to our objects which are height and width now let's say you want to calculate the area of these two rectangles i can use the print method and then what is the area of the rectangle it's the multiplication of the height and the width right so i can use this uh, rectangle one object and then i can uh, call the height and width of this object and this will give me the area of the rectangle one using this multiplication operator similarly i will do the same for the object two here and let's run the code and if you remember what we need to do if we create a new python file we need to right click on the file and then click on run right so once the file is running you can choose from here which file you want to run but at least once you need to right click on the file and just click on run whatever file name you have so you can see the area of rectangle 1 is 800 and the area of rectangle 2 is 300 so this is how you can create a very simple class in python in this video, I'm going to show you how to use init method in Python and how to use a keyword called self in Python. So I will continue with the class which I have created in the last video. And this was the class which we have created and we have used this special keyword pass there. And pass we were using to create an empty class. Now I'm going to remove this pass and i'm going to add a method called init here so i'm going to just write def and then underscore underscore init and then press enter 
and you can see this init method is created here. So this is like a normal method with double underscore in front and back of this init keyword. And you will also see the self keyword is already added as the first argument of this method. Now this init method serves as a constructor for the class. So usually it is used to initialize some attributes or some functions because this is the first method which will be called when you create an instance of a class. So here we are creating an instance of a class and this init method will be the first method which will be called when this object or instance will be created. So let's check what I'm saying. So let's say I want to print inside this init method that the underscore underscore init underscore underscore is called. And let me run this code. So I will change this to car and then run this code. And now when I see this result, you will see this line is called three times because we have created three instance from the same class. Okay. So every time this instance is created, this print is called and that's why this line is printed three times and everything else will be printed after that. Whatever we were printing, for example, speed or color of the car will be printed after that. Now, one important thing to notice here is I said in it serves as a constructor. It's not a constructor. Although it would be tempting to call this init method as a constructor, actually it's not a constructor, but it behaves like a constructor because in it is the closest thing we are going to get in Python to a constructor because it is the first method which is called whenever an instance is created. Now, if you are familiar with other object oriented programming languages like Java and C++, there is a destructor also in those kind of languages with classes. Now, Python doesn't have any destructor because Python has an automatic garbage collection. So you don't need a destructor in Python because Python will take care of anything which should be taken care of. Now, as I said, usually init method is used to initialize something. So instead of initializing the value of speed and initializing the value of color, let me just comment this code first of all. So I'm going to select whatever I want to comment and then I can press control forward slash to comment all the line. You can also go to code and then use this option which says comment with line comment and you can see the shortcut for that control plus forward slash. Okay, so this is going to comment your lines of code and now I want to use the speed as the initialization value. So after the self keyword, I can give the next parameter, which is speed here. And then the third parameter is the color here. And now to print the value of speed and color, I can use once again uh, print. And then first of all, I'm going to print the speed and then I'm going to print the color attribute. And as soon as you do this, and when you try to run this program, it will give you an error. So let me run the program and it will give me the error. It says in it missing two required positional argument, which is speed and color. Okay. So once you create an init method and provide any arguments other than self, self is automatically provided by Python whenever you create an instance of a class, but other than self, when you write, uh, for example, speed and color arguments here, you need to provide those argument at the initialization of your class. So here, first we will give the speed inside these parentheses, for example, 200, and then the color, for example, red here, okay? Same we need to do for the other two instantiation 
of the car class so let me do it for the second instance and also for the third instance and now let's run the code once again and let's see what happens so now you can see everything works fine and no error is given to us and you will also see because this print is called first you can see the speed is printed first and then the color and then this line is printed after that and that means we will get the speed color and this line three times for every instance with different values whatever values you have provided for the instantiation of your car class now usually you provide these arguments because you want to initialize the value of speed so let's try to access the value of uh, the ford object speed and color so let me just uncomment this code and let's run this code and it will give us an error you can see this says that car object has no attribute called speed right so what is the error because we have provided these attribute speed and color but we haven't assigned these values to any attribute inside this car class earlier what we have done is we have assigned the speed value to a speed attribute and the color value to the color attribute but we have already commented those codes so how can we assign the speed and color to the car object so it turns out that you can use the self keyword and then using the self keyword you can assign the value to the current object so self is essentially the current object okay it's similar to using this in c++ or java if you are familiar with those two languages so you use self dot and then the name of the attribute for example speed in our case is equal to whatever argument you provide for speed so we have provided the same argument which is speed is itself once again i can use self to set the value of color here so self dot color is equal to color let me remove this semicolon because it's not required and now when i run this code you will see that there is no error now so because we have now used the self keyword to set the attributes of speed and color so we can easily access the values of the speed and color using any object of the car class so let me once again minimize this so now let's talk about the self keyword here so whenever you create a hey guys in this video i'm going to show you how you can download and install opencv for python on your ubuntu operating system so i'm using ubuntu 18.04 lts version for this presentation so first of all you just need to open your terminal you can open your terminal by just pressing ctrl alt t which is going to open the terminal and then first of all you just need to type sudo apt update and then press enter and then give your ubuntu's password i'm going to provide my ubuntu's login password and then press enter and it's going to do the updates plus it's going to refresh the packages index so once the update command is successful i'm going to clear the terminal first of all and then let's give the second command which is to actually install opencv so the default version of python on ubuntu 18.04 is python 3 so let's check first of all which version of python is available on my ubuntu operating system so i'm going to give this command python hyphen hyphen version and then press enter and you will see it's going to give this message which says command python not found but can be installed with these commands now let's check the version of python 3 so just give this command which is python 3 hyphen hyphen version and you will see python 3.6.5 is available at the time of making this video on my ubuntu operating system so that's why we are going to install opencv for python 3 on our ubuntu operating system so i'm going to once again clear the terminal and then give this command sudo apt install python 
free hyphen open cv okay so just give this command sudo apt install python3 hyphen open cv and then press enter which is going to start installing this package and in between you will be asked if you want to proceed just press y and then press enter so now after this installation is finished it's time to check whether OpenCV is working fine with our Python script. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to once again clear the terminal and then I'm going to open the Python shell by giving this command Python 3. And now we are going to import the CV2 library which will be available after the installation of Python 3 OpenCV. So I'm going to just write import CV2 and then press enter and if this import doesn't give any error that means OpenCV is installed successfully on your Ubuntu operating system and now we are going to try to check the version of uh, CV2 package which is installed on our operating system. So just give this command CV2 dot version and it's going to display the version of CV2 which is installed on your Ubuntu operating system, which is at this time 3.2.0. Now, if you go to the OpenCV website, which is opencv.org, on its homepage, you can see at the time of making this video, OpenCV 4.0 version is available. But we can see here that version of OpenCV we have installed is 3.2.0 so if you want to install the latest version of OpenCV for Python which is version 4.0.0 at the time of making this video then you can follow these commands which I'm going to show so I'm going to close this terminal and then I'm going to open the terminal once again and first of all in order to install the latest version of OpenCV we need to install Python pip which is a package manager for Python packages. So in order to install pip for your Python 3 version, you just need to give these commands. So first command you need to give is sudo apt update and then press enter and then provide your Ubuntu's password. So once the update command is finished, I'm going to clear the terminal and then give this command, which is sudo apt install python3 hyphen pip and then it's going to ask you if you want to continue i'm going to press y and then press enter so now the installation of pip for our python version 3 is completed so i'm going to clear the terminal once again and now we are going to check the version of pip which we have installed so just give this command pip3 hyphen hyphen version and then press enter and it's going to give you the version of pip which is available for your ubuntu operating system so once the installation of pip is finished successfully we are going to install a package called opencv python using this pip3 command so just give this command pip3 install opencv python and then press enter which is going to start the installation of this package which is opencv python so once the installation of this package opencv python is completed we are going to just check whether we can import the cv2 version which is available after the installation of this package using pip so i'm going to clear the terminal once again and let's give the python 3 command to open the python shell and then I'm going to import the CV2 package and then press enter. And if it doesn't give any error, that means CV2 is available for your operating system. And to know the version of OpenCV available for your CV2 package, you can once again give this command, which is CV2 dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore and then press enter. And you can see this time that 4.0.0 OpenCV version is available for your Ubuntu operating system. So this is how you can install pip on your Ubuntu operating system. And this is how you can install OpenCV for Python on your Ubuntu operating system. 
I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will see how to read, display and save videos using cameras. So often we have to capture live stream from camera. So first of all, we will see how we can capture the live stream from the camera. The same method you can use to display the video from a video file. So let's get started and let's see how we can capture the live stream from your default camera. So I'm going to just create a variable called cap and then inside your CV2 package, there is a class called video capture. We are going to take this class and create an object of it. And as an argument here, you can provide either the input file name. So for example, if you want to just read the video from a particular file, you can give the file name for example, my file dot avi or mp4 or you need to provide the device index of your camera from which you want to read. So by default, this index will be either zero or in many devices, it's also minus one. So first of all, we are going to try with zero device index, which in most cases works. So if this device index zero doesn't work, try with minus one. Now, if you have multiple cameras and if you want to uh, use the other camera, then you can also try one for the second camera or two for the third camera and so on. So we are going to use the default camera, which is at device index zero. So this is the argument we need to provide here. And then we are going to create a while loop in order to capture the frame continuously. So let's create a while loop here. And this loop we are going to run indefinitely. So we are going to just say that while this loop is true, we want to capture the frames. So we are going to just define these variable ret and frame and then using this cap instance we are going to call a method called read now this read method is going to return true if the frame is available and this frame will be saved into this frame variable so here the true or false will be saved if the frame is available this ret will be true Otherwise it will be false and this frame variable will actually capture or save the frame. Now in order to show this captured frame, we can use I am show. So I'm going to just use a CV2 dot I am show, which is going to show this frame inside the window. First of all, you can give the name to your window, for example, frame. And then second argument will be the frame which you are reading, which is this variable here. Now in the next step, we have seen in the last video also, we are going to use the cv2.wait key in order to wait for the user input. And if this input will be Q, we will quit the window and destroy all windows. So we are going to just say cv2.wait key and the argument here will be one. And I have told you, you need to provide this mask for 64 bit machines. So you can provide this mask and then we are going to just see if this key which is pressed is Q or not. So we are going to use the ORD method for this and we will just check if the Q key is pressed. And if this Q key is pressed, we are going to break from the loop and we will come out of the loop. And after we come out of the loop, the first thing we need to do is to actually release the capture variable. So this is important. After reading your video, you need to release the resources. So you need to 
just call this method cap dot release and then we will just destroy all windows so let's run this script and let's see what is the output so i'm going to run this script and you can see in this window the input from my default webcam of my laptop right now i'm just showing some book in front of this camera that's why you will see this uh, book and as soon as i press q key our window will be destroyed and we come out of this script now let's say you want to change the frames to gray so we want to convert our uh, video input from the colored image to the grayscale image for that what you can do is you can define a variable called gray or anything else and then there is a method called cv2 dot cvt color which is to convert color and the first argument which it takes is the source so in our case the source is the frame which we are capturing from the cap dot read method the second argument is actually the conversion what we want to do so we will uh, just call cv2 dot color underscore and by default the default colored image is captured as bgr image that means blue green red channel images and we want to convert it to a grayscale image so we will just write bgr to gray this means we want to capture the bgr image to the grayscale image and now this is going to give us the grayscale image and this input we can uh, just transfer to the i am show method as the second argument of this i am show method so let's run this script once again and let's see what is the output of the script and now you can see the video captured is in grayscale image and as soon as i press q it's going to release all the captured resources and then destroy all windows now as i said if you want to display the image from a video file you just need to give the name of the video file for example name and then the extension which is let's say avi or mp4 or any other format now using this cap instance you can read few properties about the video which is captured and the first property is if the video is open or not so in case whenever you provide the file name and the file path is wrong then this is going to give you false so there is a method called is opened and this means if the file name of the video which you want to provide here is correct this is going to give us true otherwise this is opened is going to give us false in case the file path is wrong or the index which you give here for the device is wrong so let's give any random index here and then let's see what happens so i'm going to run the script and you will see nothing will happen because this is opened is going to give you false let's print that also and let's verify with the print statement the same thing so i'm going to just uh, use this and then uh, run the program once again and you can see it prints false that means you cannot capture the video using this index so my device is at index 0 by default so i need to give this index name otherwise for example i provide the wrong file name here also it's going to give us the false value there is a method called cap dot open also so if this cap is open gives you false you can try opening your capture video using cap dot open also now there are other properties which you can read using uh, this uh, cap instance and the property you can read using a method called get so you can uh, just write cap dot get and as an argument of this get method you can provide the prop id so there are different prop ids which you can read so let's say we want to read the property which is called frame width and frame height which is going to give you the height and width of your frame so for this you just need to write cv2 dot cap 
underscore prop underscore frame underscore width this is going to give you the width of your frame and if you want to get the height of your frame you can use cap underscore prop underscore frame underscore height and this whole list you can find on the official documentation of OpenCV so I will provide you this uh, link where you can uh, see different values of the prop ID so right now I have used this ID and this ID but there are several number of IDs available here which you can use to read the property of your frame so let's use print method to just print out what property we are reading and let's once again run this script and here you can see in the output you can see the value 640 and 480 which is the width and height of your frame by default now let's see how we can save the image which we have captured from our webcam or the default camera so as we already know that we read frame by frame when we capture the videos from your default camera so for creating the capture you have used video capture class and for saving the video we are going to create the video writer class so i'm going to first of all uh, create a variable called out for output and then i'm going to call a class called video writer so let's call uh, this class which is video writer and now this class takes few argument the first argument is the name of your output file so for example i can uh, just give the name output dot avi the extension of the file the second argument here is the 4cc code now 4cc is a 4 byte code which is used to specify the video codec and if you want to know more about 4cc code you can visit this website which is 4cc.org forward slash codec dot php and here you can find uh, several 4cc codes so for now what we are going to do is we are going to just get the 4cc code using a class called video writer underscore 4cc so i'm going to declare a variable 4cc and then i'm going to use cv2 to call a class called uh, video writer 4cc so as an argument of this class you just need to provide the 4cc code so for example i can uh, give uh, this kind of code so you can provide this argument which is x tricks and then your 4cc code which is x vid in this case or otherwise what you can do here is you can also give this uh, code in this format so for example x comma then second argument is v and then uh, third argument is i and the fourth argument is uh, d so you can either give this type of notation or you can just use asterisks and then in single quotes you can just write uh, xvid or any other code here and then this 4cc code we are going to pass as the second argument the third argument is the number of frames per second so let's say we just want to use uh, 20 frames per second and the fourth argument is the size so we already know that the size in which we are capturing is 640 by 480 so we are going to provide this in the form of tuple so 640 comma 480 so this will be the size of the video which will be saved in this file now inside our loop as we have seen we are uh, just reading the frame here in the frame variable and this is the boolean variable if the frame is available it's true otherwise it's false right so first of all we are going to check if its value is true or false so we can uh, just write if ret is equal to true then only we are going to just save this file into the output file so i'm going to just put everything inside this uh, if condition otherwise we are going to break out of this loop so i'm going i'm going to just say else break now inside this if condition we can uh, just uh, write this frame into a file using a method 
called out dot write so out is the instance of video writer so i'm going to just use out dot write and then we are going to just pass the frame which we have captured which is inside the frame variable and now at last we are going to release all the resources using the out uh, instance which is the instance of video writer so i'm going to just write out dot uh, release and then let's run the script and let's see what happens so one thing to note here is our video will be saved as it is that is in the bgr mode that is in the colored uh, mode so let's run the code and let's see what happens so i'm going to just start my script once again and now i'm going to just press q so you can see here our video is shown in the grayscale and our video will be saved in the original from format because we are saving every frame before the conversion so it will be saved in the original format so i'm going to just uh, close this uh, script and as soon as i close the script you can see the output.avi file and in order to verify this file i'm going to go to the project and here i'm going to start this file using let's say vlc media player and you can see it shows the output of the output.avi file so this is how you can read videos display and save videos using the default camera or the video file i hope you have enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will learn how to draw different geometric shapes using OpenCV. So to start with, I have this code and I have already explained what this code does. So this I am read is used to read an image and then we are just showing this image into a window using this I am show method. And then using the wait key, we will wait for the closing event and the destroy all window will destroy all the windows which we have created. So this we have already seen. Now let's say we want to draw some geometric shapes on this image. So to start with, let's learn how to draw a line on our image which we have read from this read function. So what we are going to do is we will overwrite this image. So we have already uh, created this image variable. So what we are going to do is we will draw a line on the same image. So I'm going to just write img is equal to cv2 dot lines. And you can see in the suggestion, this line method takes few arguments. So the first argument is the image itself. The second argument is the starting coordinates of point one. The third argument is the ending coordinates of point two. And then the fourth argument is the color. And fifth argument is the thickness. So let's use this line method and then give these arguments one by one. So we want to write to the image which we have read using this file. So the first argument is the image variable and the second argument is the coordinates. So the coordinates should be given in the form of tuple. So let's say we start with 0, 0 coordinate and the ending coordinates will be let's say 255, 255. Okay. The fourth argument will be the color and the color you need to give in the BGR format. So if you want to uh, give the blue color, then you can uh, just write 255 comma 0 comma 0 because first is the blue color, second is the green color and third is the red channel color. So if you specify here 255 in the first channel, that means the blue channel, then it's going to draw the blue line. If you give here 255 
and then you make other channels uh, zero then it's going to draw the green line and if this 255 comes at last and the other channels are zero then it's going to draw the red line so let's say we want to draw the red line that's why i have given 255 here and the next argument is the thickness so the thickness you provide in the numbers so starting from one one is the lowest thickness you can increase the thickness two or three or uh, let's say five or ten so it's going to increase the thickness based upon this number so let's say we want to give the thickness to our line five so this is going to draw a red line on our image so let's run the code and let's see what happens so you can see our image is loaded in the gray scale that's why you don't see any color on the line but our line is created here so let's load this image in the colored format by changing this argument to one and let's run the code once again and you will see the image is loaded in the colored format and the line color is red now if you want to change the thickness of this line you can just increase this number and if you want to change the color of this line you can change it using these color channels so let's uh, change the line color to uh, green let's say and I'm going to run the code and you can see the thickness of the line is increased and now the color of the line is green now if you want to draw the line with any other color you can just uh, go to your favorite browser and search for RBG color picker but always remember our image will be loaded in the bgr format so in the reverse order so blue green and then the red channel so let's say we want this uh, color here and it's rbg uh, channels are this so i'm going to just copy all these channels and then i'm going to give these channels in the reverse order so first of all 147 then 96 and then third channel is the 44 and then I'm going to run my code and you can see you get the same color which you have chosen here so this is how you can change the color of your lines now there is a function called arrowed line let's say we want to use this function which is called arrowed line and this is going to draw the arrowed line as it says so let's say we want to just uh, draw this arrowed line in uh, blue color so i'm going to just give uh, the color channels here and then run the code and this arrowed line is overlapping on the previous line that's why you don't see the previous line so let's change the coordinate of this line so let's uh, draw this line in this coordinate which is going to draw the straight line in my opinion let's see what happens when i run the code and you can see it draws the straight line from uh, left to right which is the arrowed line and this was our original line now let's see how to draw the rectangle so to draw the rectangle we will do the same we will uh, just overwrite on the same image so we will uh, just say image is equal to cv2 dot rectangle which is a method and you can see what are the argument it takes so the first argument is the image itself the second argument is the point one and point two this point one and point two coordinate i'm going to explain in a bit the third argument is the color which is same as line and the fourth argument is the thickness so let's use this uh, rectangle function to draw the rectangle so first of all i'm going to just uh, pass the image variable here the second argument is the top left vertex coordinates so let me uh, just uh, draw something here so you will be able to understand in a better way so when you want to draw a rectangle using opencv this here is a top left vertex coordinates which is x1 and y1 and this is here the lower right vertex coordinates 
so the top left vertex coordinates you give in the second argument so let's give uh, some uh, coordinates here so 384 comma 0 and the lower right coordinates i want to give here is let's say 510 comma 128 so let's say we want to give the red color so i'm going to just write uh, 0 comma 0 comma 255 and the thickness i want to give here is 5 and i'm going to just remove this because it will uh, just create problems and now let's run the code and you can see the rectangle is drawn with the red color of thickness 5 you can change the thickness of this uh, rectangle by changing uh, the value of the thickness and then you can run the code and now the thickness of uh, this rectangle line is increased now one more thing you can provide here is instead of giving the thickness value if you write here minus one then it's going to fill the rectangle with the color which you provide here so when we give minus one here let's see what happens so now we get the filled rectangle because we have provided minus one option here so if you provide minus one then your rectangle or whatever shape you are creating will be filled with the color which you specify here so let me just change the thickness to 10 once again and now let's see how we can uh, draw the circle so to draw the circle we once again use cv2 dot uh, circle function and once again you can see what are the argument which it takes so the first argument is the image the second argument is the center of the circle the third argument is the radius of the circle and the fourth and fifth argument is the color and the thickness once again so once again we will provide the image the second argument is the center of the circle so let's give the center of the circle which is the coordinate on which you want to uh, give the center so i'm going to provide let's say 447 comma 63 here and the third argument is the radius so radius we want to provide here is let's say 63 and the fourth argument is the color so let's uh, use 0 comma 255 comma 0 which is going to draw the green color and then let's give minus 1 here so our circle will be filled with green color and let's run the code and let's see what happens so you can see this circle is drawn here and this circle is filled with the green color now let's see how we can uh, put some text into the image so to put the text on our image we will once again use the image variable and overwrite on it and then we will uh, use a method called put text so this is the method which we are going to use the first argument is the image the second argument here is the text which we want to put so let's say we want to just print open cv on our image so we can uh, just write open cv as the second argument the third argument is the starting point of your text so you need to give the coordinates where you want to start your text from so the coordinates i want to give here is let's say 10 comma 500 and then the next argument is the font face so the font face you need to give here using a variable so i'm going to create a variable let's say font and then there are many font faces available using cv2 so you can uh, just write cv2 dot font in capital and you can see what are the options available here i'm going to choose uh, the first one itself which is font hershey simplex font and then we are going to pass this font uh, as the fourth argument the fifth argument here will be uh, the font size so let's say i want to give the font size uh, four here the sixth argument here is the color of your font so let's say i want to just draw 255 255 
255 which is going to give us uh, a whitish kind of uh, color the next argument we will give here is the thickness so let's say i want to provide the thickness uh, 10 here and the next argument you can give here is the line type so let's say i want to give the line type cv2 dot uh, capital line underscore aa and now let's run our script and let's see what happens so you can see here open cv is printed in the white color of thickness 10 and if you want to change this color you can change it from uh, here so i'm going to just put the first channel as zero and now this color is changed to yellow color now one more thing i want to show here is how you can create an image using numpy zeros method so either you can use a image which you read from i am read method or what you can do here is i'm going to just comment this code and we can create an image using the numpy zeros method so i'm going to create this img variable and then i'm going to use the numpy module so just import this numpy as import numpy as np and then we are going to use this mp to call the zeros method now in order to create a black image using this zeros method you need to give the first argument in the form of list and inside this list the first element will be the height second will be the width and third will be three so let's say we want to provide the height uh, 512 we want to provide the width also 512 and the third argument will be uh, three and the next argument you give here is the d type or uh, data type so you can just write np dot uh, u int 8 here so this method is going to give you a black image of the size 512 by 512 so let's run our code and let's see what happens so you can see now you can see the black image and on our black image the line is drawn the arrowed line is drawn and the text and the circle and the rectangle are drawn here so this is how you can draw different geometric shapes on your image there are several other methods you can use for example cv2 dot polyline method or cv2 dot eclipse method to draw eclipse and polygon on your image so just try those uh, method to draw different shapes on your image so that's it for this video and i will see you in the next video hey guys welcome to the next video on open cv tutorial for beginners using python so in this video we will see how to set some properties to our captured images so in the video capture lesson we have seen that when we create a cap variable using the video capture class we can get many properties using the cap.get method so we were able to get the width of the frame and the height of the frame similarly we can use the cap.set function to set some values so you can just write cap.set and then you can set the values of the property generally all the properties which you can read like this you can also able to set those property using the set method now this notation you can also give in the form of number so every uh, property here has a defined number so for example instead of using cv2 dot cap prop underscore frame width you can uh, just write uh, three here and that will work also so every property has a number associated with it so using that number either you can uh, just let's say we want to set the width and height either you can write uh, this as the first argument and the second argument is the actual width you want in the video right or you can uh, just give the number of that property and then give its value so let's say we want to change the width of this video to 
let's say 1, 2, 0, 8. And then let's uh, just set the height. So cap dot set and the associated number for uh, the height parameter will be 4. So 3 for width and 4 for the height. And let's say we want to just uh, move it to 720. And then we will once again print the value of uh, the width and height. And this time we are going to just give their associated numbers which is 3 and 4. So let's run this program. You might already know this program, what this program is doing. So it's just capturing the video from your default device at uh, index uh, 0. And then it's just uh, showing all the frames using this I am show method in a window. So now I'm going to run this script and let's see what happens. So when I run this script, you can see the size of this frame is changed. So let's see in the terminal also, you can see before the original size of the video we are capturing is 640 and 480. So width was 640 and the height is 480. Now once we have changed the width and height, you can see the width is changed to 1280 and the height is changed to 720. So even if I have given here 1208, the default camera will automatically set its value according to its resolution. So let's just close uh, this video and let's say we want to just change this value to some random number. So let's say 700 by 700. Will it work or not? So let's uh, run the script once again and let's see what happens. So the script is running and you can see that even though we have provided the 700 and 700, the camera will automatically take the resolution which is available for your default uh, camera. So the resolution remains the same even though we have set the different value to it. So you need to keep in mind, even though you can uh, give any value here, but the camera will only set the resolution which is available for it. So let's give a very big value here. So I'm going to provide, let's say uh, 3000 here and height also 3000. And let's run the script once again and let's see what happens. So when we run the script, you will see the resolution is changed, but the resolution will change to the maximum resolution of my default camera, which is 1280 and 720. This is the maximum resolution which is available for my webcam. So let me just close this uh, uh, window. So this is how you can set some values. So there are many values you can set using this set method. You just need to go to the documentation and then search for the value you want to set. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. So in the last two videos, we have seen how to capture videos from our default camera device or how to add geometric shapes on the images. Now in this video, we are going to combine the knowledge we have gained in the last two videos. So if you haven't seen the last two videos, I will recommend you to watch those videos and then come to this video. So in this video, we will see how we can uh, just draw something on a video and more specifically, the aim of this video is how to show the current date and time on a live video. So now in the last video, we have seen how to draw shapes on images and we have also seen how to uh, put text on our images, right? So let's say we just want to print the value of width and height on the default camera. And let me just remove this line which we have used to convert the BGR image to the grayscale image. So we will uh, just uh, 
see the colored BGR image. So now what we want to do is we want to print the width and height which we get from these properties on our video which we are capturing. So in the last video we have already seen that we can use a method which is cv2 dot put text yeah so this method we have seen in the last video and first of all we will define the font which we will pass to our put text method so the font i'm using here is cv2 dot font hershey underscore simplex and now the first argument here will be the frame which we are capturing because every frame is just like an image and a video is the combination of multiple images. So the first argument here will be the frame. The second argument here will be your text. So the text which we want to show here is let's say width and height. So let's define a variable which we want to show on our video so let's say the variable name is text and first of all I'm going to define the width so just say width and then we are going to provide the value of the width using the concatenation operator now because this value will be in integer and we want to convert it to the string so we will use the str method to convert the integer to the string and then we can pass the width here inside our string variable once again we will use the concatenation operator and then let's provide some uh, space here and then we will uh, just write the height colon and then once again the concatenation operator and once again we will use this uh, string method and inside this string method we will now take the height okay and now we will pass this text to our put text argument now the third argument is the coordinate so let's say I want to just put this text at the coordinate 10 comma 50 the fourth argument is the font which we have already declared the fifth argument is the thickness so let's say the thickness we want is 1 and then the color so let's say the color we want is 0 comma 255 comma 255 and then the thickness so i think the thickness comes after the color and the value 1 we have set for the font scale so you can change the font scale uh, 1 2 3 4 any font you can uh, change it from here so this value 1 is for the font scale and the value we are providing right now is for the thickness so let's say the thickness is 2 and the last argument here will be the line type so I'm going to just provide the line type as cv2 dot line underscore aa so what do you think will this uh, text will be printed on our image or not so it will not print yet because we need to write on the frame this text so we need to just write frame is equal to and then put the text on the same frame which we are seeing right now so now this will work and let me just break this line so you will see all the code and now let's run the code and let's see what happens when we run the code so let me run this uh, script and you will see here that now we are seeing the width and height on top of this video which is one two 80 and the height is 720.0 so this is how you can show text on your video which you are capturing from the web camera or from the video file now let me just comment these lines of code because they are changing the resolution of our video and it's not uh, fitting this video uh, screencast so i have uh, commented this code and now let's do something more interesting so now let's say we want to show the current date and time on the video and you might have guessed how to print it but let me show you if you don't uh, know how to print the date and time on your live video so first of all we are going to import the package 
which is available inside uh, Python, which is date time. And then we are going to create uh, this date time variable. Let's say the date time variable uh, name will be uh, date uh, t. And then first of all, we are going to use the str method to convert the date and time to string. And then there is a method inside this date time uh, library. So we just need to write date time dot date time once again, and then the method called now, which is going to show you the current date and time. So once we have converted our current date and time to the string variable, then we can pass this variable as the second argument. And now let's run the script and let's see what happens once again. So I am running the script and now you will see that it shows the current time and current date on the video itself. So this is how you can uh, put the text on your video. You can even put some uh, shapes which we have seen in the last video on this video itself. So you can put the line or the rectangle or the circle on your video which you are capturing from the camera or some file. So this was some kind of a mini project which we have created from the knowledge which we have gained from the last two videos. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will learn how to handle mouse event in OpenCV. Now mouse event can be anything, for example, a right click event or left mouse button click event or left button double click event. So there are many mouse event available in CV2 package. Now to list out all the events in the CV2 package, you can write this kind of code. So first of all, I'm going to create a variable called uh, events and then I'm going to just iterate over all the events inside CV2 library. So I'm going to just write uh, i for i in dir inside our cv2 uh, package so this dir method is the inbuilt method which is going to show all the classes and member functions inside your cv2 uh, package okay so we are iterating over all the function names or uh, member variable names and then we want to see what are the events available inside this package? So we can uh, just filter those events using a condition. So we are going to just say that we want to just see the variables or the member properties which have this keyword event in them. So event in i and then we are going to just print out all the events. So I'm going to just print out all the events and then I'm going to run this code. And here you can see the list of all the events which are available inside your CV2 library. So you can see there is an event called event flag R button for the right button for the mouse or there is event for left button double click event or the event for L button down event. So there are uh, many such events available here and we are going to use those events to listen for the mouse events. So this is how you can uh, print all the events which are available inside your CV2 library and now we will create a script or a program to listen for the mouse event. So first of all, we will create a mouse callback function which is executed when mouse event takes place. So 
in order to create this callback function we are going to uh, just uh, define a function and then we will uh, give the name to our function for example uh, click event function and this callback function generally takes few arguments so the first argument will be the event which is taking place when we click our mouse and then it's going to give us the x and y coordinate on the image where we are clicking with our mouse so we are going to get the x axis value and the y axis value whenever we click the mouse at certain position in our image also we will uh, get the flags and we will get the param so for creating the mouse click callback function it has this kind of specific format which is uh, same everywhere so these are the parameter it takes and then inside your uh, callback function you can define the logic so let's say whenever i click the left button down then i want to show the x and y coordinates on the same image so i can uh, just say if the event variable is equal to cv2 dot event and then i will uh, just look for the left button down click event so if this event occurs then i will uh, first of all print the x and y axis values so let's print x comma y and you can also provide some space between x and uh, y coordinates using uh, this kind of string and then what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, put this uh, x and y coordinate values on the same image which we are opening so we have already seen in the last videos how to put text on the videos we just need to create this uh, font variable for the font and then there is a method called cv2.puttext so we are going to just write uh, cv2.puttext which takes few argument first is the image now you can see this image shows error and this error says unresolved reference but don't worry when we write our code fully this error will go so first will be the image the second is the string which we want to put so let's say we want to put the string str for the x and y value so i'm going to just write x y and then we are going to just print the x value then concatenation operator and then comma and then once again concatenation operator y and don't forget to convert these uh, coordinate values into the string using the str function so str function here and for the y axis also you need to uh, use this str to convert it to the string value and then the string we pass as the second argument the third argument will be the location where we want to put the text and this location we already know from this x and y value so it's easy for us we are going to just say x comma y because we already know the x and y coordinate using this callback event the fourth argument will be the font the fifth argument will be the font scale let's say it's uh, one and then the next argument is the color so let's say color we want to give here is uh, 255 comma 255 comma 0 and the last argument i want to give here is the thickness let's say thickness we want to give here is 2 and then we will uh, show this text on the image using cv2 dot uh, i am show method so i'm going to just write i am uh, show and then the name of the image window for example image and the uh, image itself which is img so right now this uh, is showing error to us but when we will uh, call this callback function using 
a standard function called set mouse callback then this error will go so i'm going to define the img variable first of all and let's say we want to create a black uh, image using uh, numpy so we will uh, call np dot zeros method here so np dot zeros and the size of uh, this image will be 512 comma 512 comma 3 and the data type will be np dot u int 8 and once we have this image we are going to show this image using once again the i am show method and this image name will be the same image and the variable we want to pass here is the image variable which is the black image which we have created using this uh, numpy zeros uh, function now the next and the important step here is calling a method called set mouse callback method so this method we are going to use to call our callback function which we have created which is click event function whenever somebody clicks on the image which we are showing using this i am show window so the first parameter it takes is the name of your uh, image make sure that this name here which you uh, take in the i am show method you can see i'm taking the same name here in the i am show method also here so the window name should be the same everywhere then only uh, it will work so here also you need to uh, just give the parameter first parameter here is the window name so the window name is image and the second parameter is the callback function which we want to uh, call whenever this event take place so this is the callback function which we have created now the next step are uh, the obvious steps which we have already uh, seen so first of all we will uh, call the wait key method to wait for uh, the escape event and uh, the second is the destroy all windows so we will destroy all the windows once we are finished so let's run this code and let's see what happens so now you can see the black image which is created by numpy zeros method and when i click on uh, this image anywhere you can see the coordinates of uh, the position where i've clicked is uh, printed here so let's uh, click here you can see when i uh, give this left down button uh, click event then the position of the x and y coordinate is printed on this black image so i'm uh, clicking again and again this left uh, down button and the position is uh, printed okay so let me just close this window now what i want to do is let's uh, just uh, reduce the size of uh, this uh, font to 0.5 then uh, the font size will be a little bit smaller now what i want to do is i want to listen for some other events so i will go to my callback function once again and i will add one more condition here so once again if event is equal to cv2 and this time i want to listen for the right click event so i'm going to just write event right button down event okay so whenever somebody uh, presses this uh, right button down for the mouse then this uh, event is going to be captured inside this condition now if you remember uh, i have told you that image is shown in opencv in the form of bgr format and we already have this image you can see we have declared the image variable that's why this error is also gone so using this image we want to uh, find out the red blue and green channel so now inside this condition what i want to do is i want to print out uh, the bgr channels of the image wherever i click okay so you can uh, first of all declare a blue variable name 
and then we have img uh, variable which is this one and using this image variable we can get the blue channel using the coordinates so first of all you can provide y comma x we already have the y and x coordinates and then the channel for the blue color is channel 0 because it starts from uh, uh, blue bgr so blue and then uh, green and then red okay so i'm going to just copy it two more times the second is uh, green and the channel for it will be the one or index will be one here and for the red channel this index will be two here so i'm going to just write red here and once again i'm going to just copy uh, this code and uh, this time what i want to do is instead of uh, printing the coordinates i want to print the bgr channel so here i'm going to just write uh, blue and then second will be the green channel and then the third will be the red channel so i'm going to just write comma and then concatenation operator str and then red channel okay so this will be uh, the string we are going to name it as bgr and this string we will uh, put here the color also we can change so the color for the coordinates will be different and the color for uh, this event will be different 255 okay so it's going to print the bgr channels on your image now because we are creating uh, the black image whenever i uh, just click the right uh, click mouse event you can see the bgr uh, channels for this black image will be always zero 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 right when i click the left click then these are the coordinates when i click the right click these are the bgr uh, channels so let's uh, change this image from uh, the black image to something uh, visible so i already have uh, the lena image so we can uh, use this lena image using the cv2.im read method so i'm going to just write cv2.im read and the first will be the name of the file which is lena.jpg so now let's uh, run this code once again and now i have this colored image so we will be able to uh, see these functionality in a better way so first of all the left button click event you see the coordinate and when i click the right click button event then you can see the bgr uh, channels are printed once again here you can see the bgr uh, is different here also these uh, bgr colors are uh, different so you can see everywhere they are a little bit different because this is the colored image and the color differs at every pixel level so this is how uh, the mouse click event works in opencv i hope you enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In the last video, we have seen how to use mouse click event in OpenCV using Python. So we have seen how we can create a callback function which listens to a mouse click event and then how to use this callback function using the set mouse callback method. Now in this video, I will show you some more examples about mouse click event. So the first example I want to show about drawing a point and then connecting points using the line. So to start with, I'm going to just remove this if condition for the right uh, down button click event and every time somebody clicks the left button down click event of mouse then what i want to do is every time the mouse is clicked down 
I want to draw a circle, very small circle. And when he clicks on the next point, then I want to join those two points using a line. So for that, I will need a CV2 circle. So I'm going to remove uh, this code, which we don't uh, need right now. We just need this condition, which listens for the left button down click event of mouse. And then what we will do is we will just use CV2 to draw a circle. So we will uh, just write uh, dot circle. And first of all, this uh, circle method takes the image. So we are going to pass the image. And then the second argument is the coordinates, x and y coordinate. So we already have x and y coordinate using this callback function with the second and third parameters. And then the third parameter will be the radius. So I will uh, take the radius 3, which is uh, like very small, which will uh, give you a effect like a point on an image. And then we can give the color. So let's give a 0, comma, 0, comma, 255. And then we will uh, give the thickness. Now the thickness I'm going to give here is minus 1. And you might already know what this minus 1 do. So this minus 1, whenever you give as a thickness, it fills your circle or any closed uh, shape. OK, so your uh, closed circle will be filled with this color which you provide here. Now next what I want to do is I want to create an array of points. So I'm going to uh, just declare a variable called uh, points and initialize it with an empty array. Now this uh, empty array uh, variable we can use inside our callback function and what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, add or append every time this mouse is clicked. So I'm going to just call an append method here. And then we are going to append the x and y coordinate to this points array. So we know that where this mouse is clicked and we are saving the coordinates wherever the mouse is clicked in the form of array. Now in the next step, what we will do is if the mouse is clicked more than two times, so we can uh, just test the length of this array, which is a uh, point. And if the length of this array is greater than or equal to two, because the first uh, click will be only a point. So we cannot connect this point with a line. But when we have uh, two or more points, then we can connect uh, those points with a line, right? So if uh, this points array length is greater than two, then we are going to just create a line between those points or the circles in our case. So I'm going to just call cv2 dot line method and first uh, uh, argument here will be uh, image. The second argument here will be the point one. So the coordinate of point one. Now we want to join the last two points, right? So we are going to just use uh, this points array. And then to get the last value of an array, we use minus uh, one here. So here as an index, we will give minus one, which means the last element of an array. And then we will join the second last element of an array. So I'm going to just uh, give, uh, this will be points variable, not print. So let's give uh, the points variable. And then we are going to pass the minus two here, which will be the second last element. So last and second last element we want to join. And then the next uh, argument will be the color. So let's say the color we want here is uh, 255 comma 0 comma 0. And the next uh, point will be the thickness. So we will give the thickness of 5 here. 
and then we will show this image using I am show method. This code I have already uh, shown you in the last video so I will not explain what this code is doing. If you want to know more about this code you can see the last video and this time I will use the numpy zeros array which will be a black image. So let's run this script and let's see what happens. So I'm running the script and now I click on some position on this image and you can see this red circle is created. This circle is created using cv2.circle method and because the radius is 3 the circle is very small and because the thickness is minus 1 the circle is filled with the color which you provide here. Now we have said that if the point is only one then we don't want to create any line. If there are points which are two or more then we want to connect those points with the line. So let's click here and you can see point one and point two are connected with a line. I click here and you can see the last and the second last points are connected with the line. That's why we have taken this minus 1 and minus 2 argument which means the last element of the array and the second last element of the array. So when I click at any point it will be now connected with this blue line. So this kind of uh, line drawing you can use in satellite images where you want to connect two points together with the line. Now let's see the next example which uh, I want to show you. So in the next example what I want to do is I want to uh, first of all read an image and then I want to click on any uh, point on the image and then I want to uh, show the color of uh, the point which I, on which I have clicked using a second window. So for this instead of using uh, the numpy array which is the black image I will use uh, the normal image which is the lana.jpg image and now I will uh, just uh, remove this uh, code from here. So first of all I want to read the BGR channels so first of all I will uh, just declare these variables first is blue and we have the image and in the last video we have already seen how we can get the BGR channels because we have uh, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate and we also know that blue is the first channel so we uh, use the index 0 here to get the blue channel from this image at this coordinate which is X and Y same we will do for the green channel so green i am g and then x comma y and then the channel index will be one here and then we will uh, just uh, get the red channel from this image and now what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, draw a circle on this point where uh, you will click this mouse uh, down button click event so I'm going to just write cv2 dot uh, circle and now I will uh, not explain uh, the parameters because you might already know what these parameters are. In the next line what we are going to do is we are going to create a numpy zeros image and then we will pass our bgr channels which we got from the particular point on an image. So let's create an image. So I will just say my color image and then we are going to just use np for numpy and then we will uh, just call a zeros method here and it takes uh, three argument in the form of uh, this uh, list which is the size of uh, your image let's say this size will be 512 comma 512 and the channel will be three channels and then the next argument will be the data type so np dot uh, u int 8 
so we have a black image using this numpy zeros and now we want to fill this image with the bgr colors which we got from the particular point of the image so in the next line what we are going to do is we are going to just use this uh, variable and then we are going to just write this kind of notation this means we want to fill every channel or every uh, point of uh, this uh, list and then we will uh, just pass our bgr uh, channel values which we got from uh, the image so blue green and then the red channel values we are going to pass so this will uh, give us the bgr channel which will be the color of the point where we have clicked and now we have uh, the new image with the color so we can uh, show this image using a new window with uh, let's say this is uh, the color window okay so this is how you will uh, get the new window with the color on which you have clicked so let's run this code and let's see what happens so i'm going to run this uh, code and you can see uh, this is the image which is the colored image let's see i click on this point and you can see the same color on which i have clicked is opened in the next window let's click here on the hat you can see it's going to give you the same color on which i have clicked let's click on the eyes and you will get the same color on which i have clicked let's see what happens when we just load a black image instead of this colored image so i'm going to just use this uh, numpy zeros uh, image which is the black image and let's run this uh, code and now whenever i click on this every time i click on any point it will be the black color window which will open so this is how uh, you can use some examples to understand how mouse click events can work and you can uh, use them to develop your applications so i hope you have enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will see some of the basic and arithmetic operations on images using OpenCV. So let's get started. So here I have this code, some of uh, this code you already know. So you already know how to read the images using I am read method and then show it inside a window using I am show method and destroy all windows using this destroy all windows method but this code in between is little bit new so let me explain line by line what this code does so when you have this image using i am read method or any other method you can use these attributes like shape size and d type to get different uh, uh, values from this image so image dot shape is going to return a tuple which contains the number of rows columns and the number of channels in this image the image dot size will return the total number of pixel which are there inside the image and image dot d type is going to return the data type of the image which you have obtained now here if you want to split your image in three channels then you can use cv2.split method and pass your image as an argument and it's going to give you the bgr channel of your image now if you have bgr channels and you want to merge those bgr channel into an image then you can use cv2.merge method and pass these bgr channels in the form of tuple and it's going to give you the image which you can uh, load 
using I am show method. So let's run this uh, code and let's see what we are getting using uh, these attributes. So you can see this uh, messy 5.jpg image is loaded and here you can see first of all the shape of the image. So the shape returns the number of rows, number of columns and the number of channels. So number of rows here is 342, columns are 548 and number of channels are 3 here. The number of uh, pixel which we have calculated using the size is this number which is 562248 and the data type of an image is uint8. So sometimes uh, you need to debug the data type of uh, your image and this uh, attribute will be very useful in those cases when you need to debug if uh, something is correct or wrong. And because we have splitted this method using the split and re-merged these BGR channels using this merge uh, method, so we will at the end get the same image which we have at the beginning here in this code. So there is no change in the code. So once again, let me just load this image. And now let's talk about the ROI of an image. So ROI stands for region of interest. So sometimes you need to work with certain region of the image. So let's say you only want to work with the face here or you only want to work with this ball. Okay. So this is called the region of interest or in short form it's called ROI. So let's say we want to just work with this ball here so this will be our region of interest or roi and i want to just uh, copy this ball to other place in this picture so i want to just copy this ball and place it on the other place let's say somewhere here okay so how we can do this so I al already have the coordinates of the ball, but uh, you already know how to get the coordinates of uh, some place in the image. We have already discussed this in our previous video. So I'm not going to show you how to op obtain those coordinates, but let's say I have those coordinates of the ball. So I'm going to create a ball variable and we have our image. So we will take our image and there are certain numpy indexing uh, features which we can use here so i'm going to just write uh, 280 colon 340 which is going to uh, give you one point on the ball which uh, is the upper left hand side of this ball and then we will give uh, 330 here colon uh, 390 which is going to give us the bottom right hand corner of this ball okay so now we have uh, this ball so this this indexing is going to copy this ball all the pixels uh, of this ball and then now we have the ball so we can place this ball on any place on this messy image which we are reading so what we can do is we can once again use img and using those uh, numpy indexing uh, features we can place this ball at some other place so let me uh, just give uh, those uh, indexes here so let me give uh, 273 colon 333 I have already uh, tested this code so that's why I know exactly where I want to place this ball but uh, if you uh, are not sure where to place this uh, ball then uh, you might have to uh, first calculate or know the coordinates where you want to uh, place this ball and you already know how to find out the coordinates on an image and uh, you will be able to place uh, uh, that ROI or interest of region at some other place. So what I'm uh, doing here is I have just uh, copied the ball and then I am placing the ball on this coordinate. Okay, so I just need to just assign our ball 
on this coordinate and then this ball will be copied to this index on the image. So let's see what happens when we run the code. So now you can see we have copied this ball and we have placed this ball here on the image. So this is how you work with the ROI or region of interest. Okay. So let me close uh, this uh, window. Now the next thing which I want to show here is how you can add two images. So for that I need uh, one more image. So you can uh, see in my project I have this messy 5.jpg and I have this other image which is opencv hyphen logo dot png file which is of the same size as the messy dot jpg image so i'm going to just write i am g2 and then once again cv2 dot i am read method and then i'm going to give the name of uh, this uh, file which is opencv hyphen logo dot png file okay so this is uh, this file so this file we are reading and then there is a method called add okay so we are going to use this method here let's uh, use this method cv2 uh, dot add and this method i'm going to show you what it does in a moment but this method takes two argument first is the first numpy array so let me show you what this method do first of all so this is the add method inside your cv2 package you can also see the documentation on the, the opencv.org uh, and what it does is it calculates the pre-element sum of two arrays or an array and a scalar okay so here we can uh, just pass our uh, two arrays which we got from the i am read method and pass here as the first and the second argument so i am g and i am g2 are the one and two parameter and there are some other parameters also like uh, output array input array mask and int which is the data type which we uh, which are set by default so we are not going to set them so we are just using cv2.add method on these two images and then i just want to uh, assign the new image which we have added to a new variable let's say this is dst for destination image and then we are going to just show this image using this uh, i am show method okay so we have two images let me show you uh, those images one by one first of all so this is the first image I have and the second image is opencv hyphen logo which is like this one okay so those two images we have and when I run this code after adding those two images using add method you will see first of all you will see this error and why this error is coming because you will see here that the size of those two input is not matching okay so in order to add two images you need to have the images or the arrays of same size and then only you will be able to add those two images so let's resize those two images into a size which uh, is uh, common to both of them so you what we are going to do next is we are going to resize those images so once again i'm going to just use img variable so what uh, i get after the resizing i will once again assign to this img variable and there is a method called cv2 dot resize and this helps us to resize the image so first of all we need to give the source which we want to resize and then we are going to give the size which we want to get so the number of columns and number of rows we can give here let's say we want to just resize this image to 512 comma 512 which is the number of rows and number of columns right same we will do with the next image so i am g2 uh, and then once again cv2 dot uh, resize and then the 
source here will be image 2 and uh, the size which we want here is again uh, 512 comma 512 in the form of tuple. So, we have resized this image and this image which are of different sizes to the same size and now let us run the code once again and now you will see that these two images are merged now. Okay? So, you will be able to see the hand here and little bit foot and here the ball of uh, uh, this uh, image 1 which is messy 5 and then we have uh, the second image which is open cv which is added to the first image so this is how you can add two image using open cv now there is one more method which is called add weighted okay so this add method is going to just add these two images but if you want to add the weight for example you want to give the weight 90 percent to the first image and 10 percent to the second image there is one more method so let's go to the documentation once again and there is this method called add weighted method okay so this add weighted method takes uh, several arguments here you can see first is the source of uh, the first array and second argument is the alpha value alpha is the weight which you want to give to the first image okay the third argument is the source 2 so in our case this will be the image 2 the fourth argument is the beta beta is the weight which you want to give to the second image right so this uh, weight you can can give from uh, 0 to 1 anything and this gamma is the scalar value which you want to provide and this uh, second last uh, parameter is the destination and the last is the d type or the data type here okay so this is the formula which uh, this uh, uh, method is going to use so source multiplied by alpha and source 2 multiplied by beta plus gamma so this is the uh, method which will be used using these arguments or simply you will use this kind of method so source multiplied by alpha plus source 2 multiplied by beta plus gamma which is the scalar you can add to the image okay so let's use this method so i'm going to uh, just copy this method and then comment this and go to the next line and instead of using add i'm going to use the add weighted method okay so the first argument is the source uh, which is the first source which is img in our case second argument is the weight so first this is the, uh, the messy image right so we want to just give uh, the weight here 90 or you can just give 0.9 here and for the second image we want to give the weight uh, 0.1 okay so the, so the sum of uh, this weight and this weight will be 1 and also we are going to give the gamma value here as 0 so we don't want to add any scalar value to uh, this add weighted method so the next uh, value here will be 0 which is the value of gamma and let's run this code and you can see now now we have uh, our messy image which is dominant here because it has the weight 0 0.9 which is 90 percent of uh, the two and the open cv image have the weight 0.1 which is 10 percent of the two okay so the open cv image is light and the messy image is a little bit uh, uh, you know dominant here you can uh, just give uh, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 so the weight of the two images will be the same and now you will see those two images in the same domination okay so 50 50 percent now let's say we want to increase this value of open cv to 0.8 and the messy image uh, weight will be 0.2 then the dominant image here will be open cv and in the background kind of thing you will see this messy image so this is how you can add two images with their weight and the scalar and uh, that's it for this video so in this video you have seen some of the basic operations on the images and some of the arithmetic operations on the images which you can do using OpenCV. so i hope you enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video
Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will talk about bitwise operations on images using Python and OpenCV. So bitwise operations can be very useful when working with masks. Masks are binary images that indicates the pixel in which an operation is to be performed. So let's see how we can perform bitwise operations on images. So to start with, I have here one image, which is image underscore one dot PNG file. And let me show you the image also. So this image is half black and half white. Now the second image I'm creating using NumPy. So first of all, I've used NP dot zeros and I'm just creating this image with the same dimension as this image underscore one is having. So 250 comma 500 is the dimension of this image and the number of channels are three. And this code is going to create a black image as you might already know from our previous videos. Now this code is just creating a white rectangle inside the black image which we got from NumPy's zeros array, okay? So this is the dimension of the rectangle inside your black image and the color of the uh, rectangle will be white because this is 255 comma 255 comma 255 and we are taking thickness as minus one that means your rectangle will be filled with white color. Now here I'm just uh, showing both the images using I am show method and this code you might already know what this is doing from our previous videos. So let me run this code and let's see what happens first of all. So when we run this code, you will see first image is this one which we have created using the numpy is zero so this is img1 and this is the black image and we are just creating a white rectangle inside this uh, numpy zeros image and this is the second image which is half black and half white now we want to perform some bit wise operations on these two images so let's see how we can perform these bitwise operations on these two images. So to perform these uh, bitwise operations, we have some methods inside the OpenCV library. So the first method will be bit and. So I'm going to just create a variable called bit and with uh, let's say like this and the method inside OpenCV is cv2 dot bitwise underscore and. So this bitwise underscore and takes several arguments as you might see here, the source of the first image, the source of the second image and the destination which is none by default and the mask which is also optional. So we are going to just provide our images here. So I'm going to provide the img2 here, first of all, as the first argument. And the second image will be img1. And once we perform this bitwise and operation on these two images, we are going to show the result in the form of window. So I'm going to create one more window, which is cv2.imshow. And I'm going to name this window as, uh, let's say, bit and. And the second argument will be our variable bit and, which we got from the operation bitwise and on these two images. So let's run this code once again and let's see what happens. So now, as a result, we have the third image. So let me just open all the images. So this is our first image. This is the second image and the last one is the result which is the bit and operation on these two images. So now you might already know how the logical end works but those of you who might not know how the logical end works, 
let me show you the truth table of logical end so this is the truth table of logical end and if the input a and input b b is zero then we get the result zero okay if input a and input b either of them is zero then also we get zeros right the result one we will only get when both the sources are one so a and b are one then only we will get a one in case of and logic so same and logic will work here so this is the zeros array right so we have created this black region from the zeros so here in these images black is performing as zeros and white part is performing as one so when zero and zero the result will be zero right so from this truth table we have seen when the input is zero and zero the result is zero same here we are seeing so when the image is black and black we get the result black when the input is white and black this means zero and one the result will be once again zero using the logical end but when the input will be white and white that means one and one the result will be white that means the one okay so the only reason region white here is the result of this white and this white and the resulting image you can see here and all the other part is uh, black because the end operation on zero and zero is zero and zero and one is also zero so this is how uh, bitwise end works let's see how bitwise or and other operation works so i'm going to just comment this code and now we are going to just create the bitwise or operation so for that i'm going to just uh, instead of writing bit and i'm going to just write bit or and instead of bitwise and we are going to just write bitwise or here and then we will simply call this uh, image using i am show method so we are just calling here bit or now let's run the code once again and let's see the result so you can see the result here so let's see the truth table so in the logical or if only one input is one then the result will be one so either a or b is one or both are one then the result will be one and if both inputs are zero then the result will be zero so same you will be able to see here so when the first source and the second source is zero the result is zero but when the first source and second source is one or white the result is white when the first source and the second source is uh, zero and one or black or white the result is once again one or white here okay so this is how the logical or works on the image now let's uh, see how uh, the xor operation work on those images so i'm going to once again uh, comment this code and this time i'm going to just perform the xor operation on these two images and now we are going to run this code once again and you will see this kind of uh, result so once again let's see how the xor logic works so when both the inputs are zero or both the inputs are one then we will get the zero and if either a or b is one then only we will get the result one so same you will be able to see here so when uh, both uh, first and second source is zero the result is zero 
when uh, both the first and second source is 1 you can see here and here the result is once again 0 here right but when the input is 0 and 1 result will be 1 and in this case also the black and white will result in the white image which is the logical XOR operation so once again let's uh, close this and now let me show you how the NOT operation work so I'm going to just comment this code and then I'm going to just use the bitwise NOT so here bit NOT let's say we will perform the bit NOT on the first image and the second image so I'm going to just write uh, bit NOT on the first image because it only takes one argument bit not is just the opposite of the source so if you get the input 0 then the result will be 1 if you have the input 1 the result will be 0 so the opposite of the input so let's perform this operation on image 1 and image 2 and let's comment this code and we are going to just show these two result windows using the I am show method and also I need to change uh, this name otherwise we will face problems and here also I haven't changed the name of uh, these I am show windows so let's uh, change the name of these windows and let's run the code once again and now you will get these results so we will get the first result so the first bit not one is the not of uh, the first image and bit not two is the not operation on the second image so you can see wherever we have white we got black and wherever we have black we got white so just the opposite of the input here also wherever we have the black region we got the white uh, image here and wherever we have the white pixel we got the black pixel so, so this is how bitwise not operation works on the images so these are some of the bitwise operations which you can perform on your images and as I said bitwise operations can be very useful when working with masks which we will see in the later videos so stay tuned and keep watching these videos and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will talk about track bars in OpenCV. Now, track bars are really useful whenever you want to change some value in your image dynamically at runtime. So, let's see how we can use track bars in OpenCV. Now, to start with, I have this simple code which you might know what it does. So, first of all, I have imported CV2 as a CV. And then I'm creating an image using uh, the NumPy zeros array with these dimensions. And then I'm creating a named window with the name image. So this might seem uh, new to you because I haven't created a named window in the previous video. So the named window you can uh, use to create a window with a name. And this time we have given the named window name as image. Now in this while loop, we are just using this uh, I am show method to call this window and then loading this image inside this named window. Now you might already know what this code does. It just wait for the key. And if the key is escape key, then we will break out of this loop. And in the last, we are just destroying all the windows which we have created. Now, in order to create a tracked bar, you just need to use CV and then call a method called create track bar. 
Now the first argument here you need to give is the track bar name because you can create multiple track bars in your image window that's why you need to provide a name which is unique to this track bar so i'm going to uh, just give the name to my track bar as b because what i want to do is i want to change the bgr values of the image using the track bar so the first track bar will change the b channel values that's why this uh, first argument is uh, the track bar name which is b and the second argument here we will give is the name of the window so that why that is why we have created this named window so that we can provide the name of the window which is image in this case and that is how we know that in which window we need to add the track bar so in the image window which is this one we want to add the b track bar now the third argument here will be the value which is the initial value at which your track bar is set and the next value here will be the count which is the final value you want to set for your track bar now there is this last thing which we want to set here and this is the callback function which will be called whenever your track bar value changes so here for example i'm going to create a callback function called nothing and this callback function definition or signature i'm going to create here so we can uh, just create a callback function with a name nothing and this function can take uh, this value x and this is the value of the current position of your track bar so we will see uh, what it does little bit later and what we are going to do is we are going to just print the value of x so we will know the current position if this track bar is changed so this is the callback function which will be called whenever your track bar value changes same we will do with the other track bar so we will create the three track bars in the same window with the name b and the next track bar name will be uh, the g and the last track bar name will be r okay so this will be capital r so now let's run this code and let's see what happens when we run this code so i'm going to right click and run this uh, script and you can see here inside this named window with the name image we have this black image which we have created using numpy zeros array and now we have three track bars here with bgr names so these track bar values you can change using this uh, scroller and as you can see here let me show you in this terminal whenever you change the value of uh, any uh, bar the corresponding value will be shown here using this callback function and inside this callback function we have the print statement okay so as i said whenever you change this value this callback function is called and it will print the value of the current uh, track bar okay so for this functionality what we want to do is we want to get the current position of the track bar and because we can change the value of bgr channels from 0 to 255 that's why i have uh, given the range between 0 to 255 to the track bars also so that you can change these bgr channel values so now in order to get the current value of uh, your track bar first of all we will uh, just check the value of uh, the b track bar so we will uh, just use cv dot get track bar position which is this method tra get track bar pos and then we just need to give the name of our track bar so let's say we want to check the position of uh, track bar b then we will just say we want to have a 
this track bar position uh, with the name B and the second argument here will be the name of your window. So in which window this uh, track bar is present. So the, our track bar is present inside the image window, right? So same we will do for the G and R values also. So Now we have the values of B, G, R channels from the track bar. So now we want to set these values to our image. So what we can do here is we can just write, uh, for example, I am G. Inside these square brackets, you can just uh, give this kind of notation and then give the BGR channel values. So I'm going to just write B comma G comma R. That means we want to set the current B, G, R values to this image. So let's run this code and let's see what happens now. So I'm going to run this code. And now when I change the blue channel values, you can see this image becomes blue uh, colored, right? Let's bring it to zero once again. And now let's change the value of uh, G. So you can see this image color is changing to uh, green. And then we can try changing the red color. And you can see when it goes to 255, the color of the image is red. You can uh, change the values uh, of different track bars and the corresponding color will be displayed in this uh, window here, right? So you can see the color is changing. You can change any track bar here. One more example I want to give here is how to add a switch using a track bar. So for that, I'm going to use one variable called uh, switch. And then here, I can uh, add, first of all, the name of the switch. And in the next line, we will once again call cv2.createTrackBar with the name switch. Okay, so now the name of our trackbar will be switch. So now we have added one more track bar to our named window. And now here we will get the current position of this uh, switch track bar. So I'm going to name it as S and the name of the window is switch. So we will just give the first argument of this get track bar position as switch. Okay. And uh, the window name is image itself. So now we can add some condition here. So let's say if this position of the switch, which we have, if this position is equal to zero, because we only have zero and one in this last track bar. So if this position is equal to zero, what we want to do is we want to set I am G and then uh, in the square bracket, this colon and we don't want to change any value. So we will say that I am G uh, this square bracket colon is equal to zero, which means that we don't want to do anything or in the other condition, which is when your uh, track bar is at position bar one, then only we want to change the BGR channel of the image. Okay. So let's uh, run this code and let's see what happens. So I'm going to run this code. And now you can see uh, the position of uh, this track bar switch is zero. And when I change it to one, so let's change this position to one, you can see the value to one. And when this position is at zero, you can change anything here, any track bar, nothing happens because this condition is met, which means that we don't want to do anything. As soon as we change the switch to one, that means we want to change the BGR values. You can see this color 
is changed inside the image. So the zero is just like off switch. So we don't want to change any color and one is like on switch. So when it's one, the value of RBG channels can be changed. Now I want to give one more example of trackbar to you. So that's why I have created one more uh, file which is py Python OpenCV trackbar example two. And this time I'm going to use uh, just two trackbars here. So that's why I'm going to delete some of the code here. So using the first trackbar, let's say I want to just change some values inside our image and I want to print that value on that image. So let's say now our uh, range is between 10 to 400. Okay, so the lower range is 10 and the upper range is 400. And using this track bar, I want to print the current value on our image. And also I want to have a switch which I can toggle and I want to change the color of the image from uh, the colored value or colored image to the grayscale image. So now our switch is between color to the grayscale image. Now in here what we want to do is we want to just assign this I am show value to the image variable itself and then we want to get the current position of the track bar so we will use this method to get the current position of the track bar and I'm going to name this current position as POS variable and the name of this track bar let's change this name to something else let's say CP for current position and also here CP for the current position and the name of the named window is image itself so we are not changing uh, it so now we have the current position so first of all we will uh, just create the font and then we will just use the cv dot put text method you already know what this uh, method does it just print the text on your image and then we will provide the parameters first argument is the image the second argument is the value which we get from the track bar so this is the position and because it's a number we need to convert it to the string using str method and then the position at which you want to show this uh, text so let's say it's 50 comma 150 and then next is the font so i'm going to just give the font and then the next value is the font scale which is 4 and the next value is for the color of the text. So let's say the color here will be 0, 0, 0, 255. And this should be CV dot font Hershey complex. Let's change this font also. Let's say this is just the simplex font. Okay. So this code is going to just print the color current position of the track bar on your image and then inside this condition what we want to do is we want to get the switch value so let's uh, use this s variable and then get the current position of the switch using uh, this switch name from the image window and then if the switch is at zero position then we want to do nothing so we will just pass this situation and in case the value of uh, this switch is one, then what we want to do is we want to change the image value from color to the grayscale value, right? So we can just write uh, CV dot uh, CVT color. And the first argument is the image which we are loading. And the second argument is CV dot color BGR to gray which is to convert this colored image to grayscale image. But you can see here we are just creating a black colored image and in our project we also have this image. So let's uh, read this image. So I'm going to just write uh, cv.im read and then give uh, the name of the image which is lena.jpg. So this is our uh, colored image and this way we will be able to see 
uh, the change of uh, color to gray scale image in a better way. So let's run this code and let's see what happens. And uh, you can see image appears and disappears and there is an error. So let's see what is the error. So the error here is coming from uh, this line. So we need to uh, read this image inside the while loop. Okay. So this is why our error is coming and at the last we want to load this image after this if condition. Okay. So now let's run this code once again and you can see this value is printed on our image which is 10 which is the value of CP and if we change this value it is changing on our image also right and once we change this uh, 0 to 1 then our image is converted from colored image to the grayscale image you can uh, also change the font size here for example let's say it's 6 here and the thickness also if you want to change you can change it using this parameter let's say it's uh, 10 and let's run this code once again you can see the thickness and the size of the font is changed and you can see this uh, value in a better way okay so this is how you can use track bars in OpenCV. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will see how we can perform object detection using HSV color space. Now we have already seen how to work with BGR or colored images or gray scale images. And we have already seen how we can convert from uh, colored images to gray scale images. So there are more than 150 color space conversion methods in OpenCV. And one of them is colored image to HSV image. Now what is HSV color space? So HSV stands for hue, saturation, value. So H stands for hue, S for saturation, and V for the value. Now generally, RGB in RGB color space are all correlated to the color luminance. That is what we loosely call intensity. In other words, we cannot separate color information from luminance. So HSV or hue saturation value is used to separate image luminance from color information. So this makes it easier when we are working on or we need luminance in our images. That is why generally we use HSV in the situation where color description plays a very important role. Now, as I said, HSV stands for hue, saturation and value. But what is the meaning of each and every single word in HSV? Now, HSV is also known as the hexcon color model. So this color space can be described in this kind of cylindrical cone model where hue is this circular angle, which varies from 0 to 360 and hence just by selecting the range of hue you can select any color so you can see different colors are available at different angles so these colors are basically red yellow green cyan blue and magenta so hue is this angle in this cylindrical cone now we have saturation so the saturation is amount of color that is the depth of pigment or the dominance of hue and this value is described from the center towards the outer layer of this cylindrical cone. So you, here you can see at the center this saturation start at 0 and it can go up to 1 at the end of this 
cylindrical cone and this saturation can be increased from 0 to 100 percent similarly the value is basically the brightness of the color so this brightness can be increased from 0 to 1 from the bottom of the cone to the top of the cone so all these three value hue saturation and value can be used to pick any color as we can do with the BGR color space. So this is the brief introduction about HSV color space. And now let's see how we can use this HSV color space to detect an object in an image. So here I have this simple code to load an image using IM read method and show it inside a window. So by now you might already know how this code works so let's run this uh, code and let's see what does this code do so i have this uh, image which is called smarties.png and here are some circles in different colors so we have blue circles or green or red orange and brown circles here inside this image so let's say we somehow want to detect only the blue circles or balls or green circles or balls how can we uh, just detect only uh, these balls? Let's say we just want to detect the green balls. How can we achieve this using OpenCV? We are going to see this using this HSV object detection. And here we have one more window, which is the tracking window, which is coming from this code, which is CV2 dot named window. And the name of the window is tracking. So this tracking window we are going to use little bit later when we uh, will uh, add the track bars to our image. But let's say we want to uh, use this image and detect these colored balls. So first of all, uh, after this image is read, what we want to do is we want to convert our colored image into our HSV image. And by now, you might already guess how to convert an image. You can just write HSV is equal to CV2 dot CVT color. And then your uh, frame name, which is frame in this case. And then CV2 dot whatever color space uh, you want to convert from and whatever color space you want to convert to. So you can just write color underscore BGR to HSV. So this is the property we are going to use. Now in the next step, we will threshold the HSV image for a range of blue color. So we are going to just define L underscore B for lower blue color. And then we are going to use uh, the NumPy array. So NP dot array. And inside this array, we are going to define the lower range of blue color. Now, by experience, I know that these HSV value for lower blue color will be 110, comma 50, comma 50, right? But you might not have uh, every time the idea of what is the lower color range or the upper color range of uh, some color. So that is why later in this video, we will use the track bar in order to perfectly uh, define the lower and upper values for uh, this HSV color space, right? So right now I'm just uh, going with my experience. So for the upper value, I'm going to define the next variable, which is UB is equal to NP dot array. And then once again, I'm going to define uh, these uh, three uh, color channels, which is 130 comma 255 comma 255 so, so this will be the upper limit for the blue color for our hsv image now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to threshold the hsv image to get only the blue color let's say so i'm going to just define a variable called mask here and then i'm going to use cv2 dot in range method where i will provide first of all my hsv uh, variable or image and then I will provide the upper and lower range for uh, this function. So my lower range is uh, this numpy array for uh, the blue color. So I'm going to just say L underscore B is my lower range and 
u underscore b is my upper range. Now we have already seen how we can use bitwise and or bitwise operations on images. So what we are going to do next is we are going to define a variable called res and then we will uh, just call cv2 dot bitwise and to mask the original image. So here the first value will be our frame which which is the colored frame right. So this is the uh, frame which we have read from this image which is the smarties image. So this is the source one. Source two will be the same. Uh, so the frame itself will be the source two. And what we want to do is we want to uh, provide the mask of the lower blue color and the upper blue color values right. So here we can uh, just say mask is equal to whatever mask variable we have uh, created. So this is the attribute we can set in order to apply the mask for the lower blue value and the upper blue values. So once we have uh, this uh, result uh, frame, what we can do is we can uh, use this uh, cv2 dot im show method in order to show the mask, let's say. So we are going to show the mask and we are going to show the result using res variable. So this is going to open three windows and let's see what happens when we run this code. So we are going to run this code and this opens three windows here. And now you can see the mask first of all. So we are just detecting the blue colored uh, balls using this mask. That's why we have defined the lower boundation of the blue color and the upper boundation of the blue color, right? So that's why it's only detecting, you can see the blue uh, ball is here, here and here. And uh, here also you can see the mask also detects only the blue values here, right? And then in the result, you can see when we have applied this mask and we have masked all the other things other than the blue colored ball, you can see only the blue balls here. So the same method you can apply to detect any other colored ball from this image. Now, as I said, it's not easy to detect uh, these uh, lower and upper boundation for uh, the colors. So that's why you can use the track bar for uh, adjusting these lower and upper boundation of any color. So for that, what we are going to do is, first of all, we will create a named window and then we are going to create a new window which we will use to adjust the lower and upper boundation of HSV values. So now I'm going to just use uh, CV2 dot, we have already seen how to uh, create a track bar. So I'm not going to explain in detail how this works, but let's say uh, this uh, track bar name is lower hue for LH, okay? So this is the lower hue value and then the name of the window, which is uh, tracking, which is this one. So we are going to provide the name of the window and the next argument will be the starting and the ending value. So we are going to define the start value zero and the end value, let's say we are going to define the 255 here, okay? And the last thing we want to give here is the callback function, which I have already created, which is this uh, function, which is uh, just no, doing nothing. We are going to just uh, provide this callback function as a dummy function. So it's not going to uh, do anything. So this is the track bar for the lower hue value. Similarly, we are going to define the track bar for lower saturation and lower uh, value and upper saturation, upper value and upper hue, okay? So this will be lower saturation. This will be lower value. And then this will be UH, which is upper hue and then this will be U as for upper saturation value, and this will be upper value, right? So HSV uh, lower values and HSV upper values. 
so here we are going to set the initial value for the upper value so let's say everything is set to the maximum so 255 255 and 255 here okay so the lower values are set to zeros and upper values will be set to uh, 255 now you already know how to get the values from a tag track bar so you can use for example l underscore h for the lower q values is equal to cv2 dot get track bar position so just use get track bar position method and then first of all uh, give the name of the track bar from which you want to get the position so let's say we want to get the position from uh, the LH track bar and then the name of the window which is tracking in our case so here is the second argument and similarly what we are going to do is we are going to define the other uh, uh, lower values and upper values so and also the name of uh, your track bars So once you have the values of lower HSV and upper HSV, you can provide these values here in place of uh, these uh, static values. So first uh, element of this array will be LH and then the LS variable and then the LV variable. Similarly, for the upper boundation, we will uh, provide these three upper boundation variables. And now, when we will run our code, let's see what happens. So we are running our code and you can see these uh, windows, these three windows. One is the mask, other is the result and the third one is the frame. And we also have these track bars in order to change the value of lower and upper HSV values. So first of all, let's set this mask for uh, the blue color. So I'm going to just move it to 110 as we have done in the last uh, step. And then this will be around 50. And this also will be around 50. Okay, so let's move it to 50. And upper value here will be around 130, right? So you can see once again, using this track bar it's easier to adjust these lower and upper boundation and now you can see all the three uh, blue colored balls so you can refine uh, this object detection by moving uh, these track bars little bit uh, left or little bit right you can see here now let's uh, adjust this value to detect some other uh, balls so let's say we want to detect the green balls so let's see what happens when we just uh, change the saturation values here and you can see now you almost see the green values and uh, the blue color is almost uh, disappearing so you can see now there are only green uh, uh, balls which are detected and all the other uh, balls are masked so you just need to play with this track bar for the lower uh, HSV values and the upper HSV values and you will be able to detect the object whatever colored object you want to detect from the image now this is the object detection from the image similarly we can use the same method in order to track an object from a live video so I'm going to just uh, escape to just close all the windows and in order to change this code for uh, the video input what we can do here is we can just add uh, this code so, so we are going to just uh, add the cap variable which is the capture variable is equal to cv2 dot video capture so we are going to use this one and we are going to uh, capture the video from our default camera which is at uh, the index zero and then you already know how we can read the values from the camera input. So I'm going to just uh, comment this code. And instead of reading the image, what we are going to do is we are going to write underscore comma frame. 
is equal to cap dot read which is going to read the frames from your default camera and at the end when you are done playing with your images you can just uh, destroy this uh, cap using the release method so you can just write cap dot release which is going to release all the cameras you are uh, just capturing right so now this is the three line code you need to, to use in order to capture the camera input and then uh, track any uh, uh, object of any color so i'm going to run this uh, code now and you can see i'm just uh, holding a blue colored uh, object here and i'm moving this object on the left and right and you can see only blue colored object is detected and every other uh, frame value is masked so this is how you can do the object tracking of any color using the hsv color space so you can see the uh, real image which is captured from the camera and then the mask and then the result of the mask and the real image in this blue colored object tracking so this is how you can do object detection and object tracking using hsv color space i hope you have enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video hey guys welcome to the next video on open cv tutorial for beginners using python in this video we will see how we can perform simple thresholding on images using OpenCV. So first of all, what is thresholding? So thresholding is a very popular segmentation technique used for separating an object from its background. The process of thresholding involves comparing each pixel of an image with a predefined threshold value. And this type of comparison of each pixel of an image to a threshold value divides all the pixels of the input image into two groups. So the first group involves pixels having intensity value lower than the threshold value. And the second group involves the pixels having intensity value greater than the threshold value. And using the different thresholding techniques which are available in OpenCV, we can uh, give different values to these pixels which are higher than the threshold value and which have the intensity lower than the threshold value. So let's see how we can use simple thresholding techniques on an image. So to start with, I have this simple code which loads an image on a window and this image is called gradient.png. So let me show you how this image looks like. So this image looks like this. So as you can see in this image, we have on the left hand side, the black values. And when we gradually move from left to right, we move towards the white value. So on the left hand side, the pixel value are closer to zero. And on the right hand side, the pixel values are closer to 255. So now we are going to uh, just involve some thresholding techniques and we will see how these, uh, this image is affected by the thresholding techniques. So first of all, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, define two variables. One is underscore because uh, the result of the thresholding gives two result. One is RET value and the second is the thresholded value of an image. So I'm going to just say the second value which is given by the thresholding technique is TH1 is equal to CV dot threshold. And this threshold method takes several values. The first is the source. So our source is image. 
the second is the threshold value so as we have seen that our image have on the left hand side zero pixel value and when we move towards the right its uh, pixel value uh, increases to 255 right so let's say our threshold here is 127 and the maximum value of the threshold is 255 which is the white color on the right hand side and then the fourth value here will be the threshold type so there are several threshold type in simple thresholding we are going to see them one by one so the first thresholding type is cv2 dot thrash binary so first of all let me show you how the result looks like and then i will explain what does this thrash binary uh, type does so what we are going to do is we are going to use one more cv2 dot im show method to show this thresholded value into a new window so we are going to just show this uh, value into a new window and we already have uh, the original image in the image window so let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see in this binary thresholding we are comparing each and every pixel of this original image to 127 and if the value of the pixel is less than 127 the value is assigned to 0 and if the value of the pixel is greater than 127 the pixel value is assigned 255 that means white so if the value of the pixel is 0 it will look black and if the value of the pixel is 255 it will look white so this is how binary thresholding works and by the name itself uh, you can uh, understand that this is just a binary uh, thresholding so it's either 0 or 1 now let's see the other type of thresholding technique so now I will uh, just change the name of this variable as th2 and the next type of uh, thresholding is called thresholding binary inverse and as the name suggests the thresholding binary inverse is going to give the inverse result of what you get from the trash binary so I'm going to once again use the I am show method to show the result of this thresholding binary inverse value and let's run the code and let's see what happens so this is the original image and then we have the thresholding one image and the thresholding uh, inverse image so this image you got from the first thresholding which is by using trash binary and the second image you got from uh, this method which is trash binary inverse and this trash binary inverse image is just the inverse of what you get using the trash binary so if the pixel value is lower than 127 which is our threshold the pixel is assigned 255 otherwise if the value is greater than 127 then the pixel value is assigned 0 which is the inverse of what we got in the previous step now let's change this threshold to let's say 50 and here also let's say we change this threshold to 200 and let's see how this result changes when we change the threshold value so I'm going to run this code once again and you can see this is the result of thresh binary and now because our threshold is up to 50 that's why our result is like this so until the pixel value is 50 it's black otherwise if the pixel value is greater than 50 it's going to give you the white uh, pixel value and the trash binary inverse is going to give you the inverse value of what you get in the trash binary uh, step so I'm going to once again uh, just close these windows 
and let's see the next uh, thresholding type so I'm going to name my variable as uh, th3 so the next thresholding type is called thresh trunk so this is this type and let's first of all uh, see what is the result of uh, this thresholding uh, technique and then I'm going to explain what it does so we are going to just show this uh, thresholded image into a new window and run the code and now we have the result so let's move it like this and we have here the original image and the result of the thresh trunk is this th3 so here what happens is up to the threshold the value of the pixels will not be changed so up to 200 because our threshold is up to 200 so when the pixel value is up to 200 the pixel value will not change and after the threshold which is 200 the pixel value will remain the same which is 200 so from uh, here to here the pixel value will remain 200 let's change this threshold to some other value let's say 127 and then let's uh, run this code and you will see that now from black to 127 pixel value the value of this image will not change so original image up to half is the same and after the pixel value 127 the value remains 127 okay so the pixel intensity value will remain 127 until the end so if the value is uh, greater than 127 the value will remain 127 and if the pixel value is lesser than 127 then the pixel value will remain unchanged so this is how the trash trunk works and let's see the other method which is let's say th4 and this is the method which is called trash20 so we are going to just use trash20 and then we are going to open this th4 into a new window and let's run this code and let's see what happens so now we have uh, this result let's move this to the left and the result of the thresh to zero is this one so in thresh to zero thresholding whenever your pixel value is lesser than threshold the value assigned to pixel will be zero okay so when the pixel value is lesser than the threshold the pixel value is assigned to zero that's why you can see half of the image is black and when the pixel value is greater than 127 which is our threshold value the image or pixel value will remain the same so after 127 all the pixels will remain the same let's see the other technique which is called thresh to zero inverse which you uh, already understood i think what it does so this is thresh to zero inverse and uh, we can just change this variable name to th5 and here we can just open it into a new window and i'm going to run this uh, code once again let me move this here and the result here so you can see this thresh to zero inverse is just the opposite of the thresh to zero so if the value of the pixel is greater than the threshold value which is 127 the value will be assigned to zero otherwise if the value of the pixel is lesser than threshold the value of the pixel will remain the same so this is how some of the simple thresholding techniques works in OpenCV. We will see other thresholding techniques in the later videos. So stay tuned and I will see you in the next video.
Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In the last video, we have seen how we can perform simple thresholding in OpenCV using Python using various thresholding techniques. So we have used thresh binary, thresh binary inverse, thresh trunk, thresh to zero, thresh to zero inverse. So these were all the simple thresholding techniques. Now in these thresholding techniques, we were setting a global value of our threshold. So in this example, for example, here the global value of threshold is 50, here 200, here 127. So we were setting in simple thresholding the global value and this means that it is same for all the pixels in the image. Now, in this video, we are going to learn how to use adoptive thresholding. So adoptive thresholding is the method where the threshold value is calculated for the smaller region. So the threshold is not global for every pixel, but it's calculated for a smaller region. And therefore, there will be different threshold value for different regions. Now, why do we need this type of adoptive thresholding? So using simple thresholding might not be a good idea in all the conditions. So there might be conditions where the image has different lighting conditions in different regions. And in those cases where the lighting conditions in the images varies from point to point, in those cases, we might want to use adoptive thresholding. So as I said, adoptive thresholding calculates the threshold for a smaller region of images. So we get different thresholding values for different regions of the same image. And as a result, adoptive thresholding gives us better results for images with varying illumination. So let me show you the problem with simple thresholding for the image which have different illumination at different regions. So I have this image called sudoku.png which I'm loading using I'm read method and then I'm just showing uh, this image using I'm show method. And then let's use the simple thresholding technique which is thresh binary for this and we have set the global threshold value of 127 here and then we will see the result after this threshold is applied to the image so i'm going to run this program and let's see what happens so this is our original image and then this is the result which we got so on in the result you can see when we apply a same global threshold value some of the region of this image is black and other region of this image is visible right so because the image have different illumination value at different regions that's why we see half of the image which have the good illumination and we don't see half of the image which doesn't have the better illumination so in that case, it's a better idea to use adoptive thresholding. So let's see how we can use adoptive thresholding. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a variable called th2, and then we use cv dot adoptive threshold. So this is the method which we are going to use for performing adoptive thresholding, and this takes few arguments. So first is the source. So our source is the image variable now the second parameter here is the max value so the max value is the non zero value assigned to the pixels for which the condition is satisfied so in our case the maximum value which we can provide to a pixel is 255 and we cannot go more than that right now the third parameter here is the adoptive method so this adoptive method is going to decide how the thresholding value is calculated. And there are two types of adoptive methods which we can use. So the first method is called cv2.adoptive 
thrash mean C. So what is the meaning of this adoptive thrash mean underscore C? So using this method, the threshold value is the mean of the neighborhood area. And here is the documentation of uh, these two methods. So adoptive thrash mean C gives us the threshold value using this function and this is going to give us the mean of the block size multiplied by block size neighborhood of x comma y minus c which is the constant and the second adoptive threshold type is this one which is adoptive thrash gaussian underscore uh, c and in this adoptive thresholding the threshold value is the weighted sum of neighborhood values where weights are the Gaussian window. So let's use the first adoptive method, which is the adoptive thrash mean underscore C. Now the next parameter here is the threshold type. So the threshold type which we are going to use is the thrash binary, which we have also seen in the last uh, video also. And then the next value is the block size. So block size decides the size of the neighborhood area. So here we are going to give the block size 11 and the next parameter here is the value of C. So we have seen that we need to uh, give the value of uh, C also when we use the adoptive thrash mean C and adoptive thrash Gaussian C. So this is the value of C which we are going to give and C is just a constant which is subtracted from the mean in the case of uh, this adoptive thrash mean method or the weighted mean in the case of Gaussian adoptive threshold. Okay, so constant we are going to give here is 2 and now what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, load this image which we got after applying this adoptive thresholding and let's uh, just comment the other window so we will just see the original image and the adoptive thresholding result so i'm going to run this code and you can see the original image here and the result of adoptive thresholding which looks much better than the simple thresholding technique so let's uncomment uh, this also so i'm going to uncomment uh, this so we will see all the three results at the same time so this is the original image and you can see the simple thresholding gives us this uh, value using the global threshold of 127 and adoptive thresholding gives us this value or this image which is much more readable than the simple thresholding technique image. So this is how you can use adoptive thrash mean C method. In the same way, we are going to use the other adoptive thresholding technique, which is called adoptive thrash Gaussian C. So instead of uh, this, we are going to use adoptive thrash Gaussian C and then all the parameters we are going to leave as same and let's load the result of uh, this type of thresholding which is stored in th3 so let's run this code and let's see what happens so we have already seen uh, this image which is uh, the simple thresholding this is the result of the adoptive thresholding mean c and this is the result of adoptive thresholding Gaussian underscore C. So both of the result looks good because the adoptive thresholding algorithm calculates the thresholding value for different regions. So the thresholding value is not global for each and every pixel of the image. And we have seen uh, the two adoptive methods which are available in adoptive thresholding. So in this way, you can use adoptive thresholding in OpenCV using Python. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video.
Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will talk about a library called matplotlib, which you can use with OpenCV images. So first of all, what is matplotlib? So matplotlib is a plotting library for Python, which gives you a wide variety of plotting methods. And on the official website, which is matplotlib.org, you can see matplotlib is a Python 2D plotting library which produces publication quality figures. So it's primarily a 2D plotting library, but it's widely used with OpenCV to display graphs and images and histograms. So we will see how we can use matplotlib with OpenCV. It's also written here that for simple plotting, the PyPlot module provides a MATLAB-like interface. So first of all, let's see how we can install matplotlib and then we are going to see how to use matplotlib with OpenCV. So to install matplotlib using pip, you just need to open your terminal and then just give this command which is pip install matplotlib and then press enter and in some seconds this matplotlib library will be installed using pip. So now you can see matplotlib is installed on my windows operating system and to check it I'm going to just give the python command and here I'm going to import matplotlib. So I'm going to just write from matplotlib import pyplot as plt okay and then press enter and if this import doesn't give you any error that means it's imported successfully and you can start using matplotlib now as we are using pycharm ide let me show you how you can install matplotlib on pycharm so just open your pycharm ide and then here just click on file and then settings and then go to project colon your project name my project name is opencv examples and then click on interpreter and you can see other uh, packages are already there and we just need to install the matplotlib package so just type here in the search matplotlib and you will be able to find matplotlib here in the result so just uh, click on matplotlib and then just click on the install package so i'm going to just click on the install package and in some seconds matplotlib library will be installed in your pycharm ide so you can see this message which says package matplotlib installed successfully that means we can close uh, this uh, window and then you will be able to see matplotlib is available in your project interpreter so everything is fine and I'm going to just close this and now I will be able to import matplotlib so I'm going to just write from matplotlib import pyplot as plt now in order to show the image which you read using the opencv I'm read method you can use uh, this uh, code so just write plt dot i am show so there is also a method inside your pyplot uh, library which is available inside matplotlib and this method you can use to uh, show the image which you have read from the opencv i am read method so for now just write this kind of code and to show the matplotlib window you just need to write plt dot show so this is going to show this image using the matplotlib library so we are opening this image using the opencv i'm show window as well as matplotlib window also so let's run this code and let's see what's the result which we are getting so you can see this is the image which is loaded using the matplotlib and this was our original image which is loaded using the OpenCV library. 
and straight away you can see some difference. So this is the original image which is the colored image and in the matplotlib uh, window we also want the same result but it's giving us the different result. And the reason behind this is OpenCV reads the image in the BGR format and the matplotlib reads the image in the RBG format. So in order to show this kind of colored window using matplotlib, you need to convert your image from BGR to RBG and then only you will be able to see this kind of colored image using matplotlib. So I'm going to just uh, close these windows and now after I'm showing this image using the CV2 I'm show method, I'm going to convert this image. So I'm going to just write IMG is equal to CV2 dot CVT color. And then I'm going to convert this image from BGR image. So I'm going to just write CV2 dot color underscore BGR to RGB. Okay, so our matplotlib library shows the image in the RGB format and uh, the OpenCV reads the image in BGR format. So now we have converted our image from BGR to RGB image and now we are showing this image using the matplotlib and let's run this code and let's see what happens now. So now when we run this code, you see both the image looks the same right now let's see the advantages of using matplotlib so you can see this is a quite static uh, window but when you see in matplotlib when you hover over this image you can see x and y coordinates of uh, the mouse point and this is helpful you can also save this image in the form of a png file so you can just press this and save this image wherever you want. You can also zoom this image if uh, this feature is available. There is also configuration subplots options. So you can, uh, you can just increase uh, these values left, bottom, wherever you want to uh, place your uh, image, you can uh, do that. These are some options which are available here. You can also reset these options and you can see uh, the coordinates here. So because matplotlib is primarily a 2D plotting library, so you can see the X coordinates and Y coordinates. And because this image is about 512 by 512 uh, pixels, that's why here it's showing 0 to 512 and here also on the Y axis 0 to 512. So this is how you can load your uh, image using matplotlib. And now I'm going to show you one more thing. And this is when you write plt dot x ticks here. And then when you pass empty array here, which is empty square bracket, comma plt dot y ticks. And also here you pass uh, empty array. This is going to hide the tick value on x and y axis. So now when I run this uh, code and you can see now that these x ticks and y ticks on x and y axis are gone. So let me just uh, comment this out once again and you will be able to see this x and y coordinates here on the image and when you use this uh, code which is to hide the ticks on the x and y axis then you will see the image without these uh, x and y axis ticks so if you remember in the last video we have seen how to uh, use simple thresholding in opencv and we were using six windows to show these six different images using opencv now let's say you want to show all these six uh, windows in one matplotlib window, how you can do it with the use of uh, matplotlib, I'm going to show you. So first of all, we are going to import matplotlib, uh, import 
pi plot as plt and then what we are going to do is we are going to define the titles and then we are going to define these six different uh, titles for six different images so first one is our original image second was uh, the trash binary third was trash binary inverse fourth was trunk fifth was two zero and six was two zero inverse in the same way we are going to define a variable called images and inside this square bracket we are going to pass first of all our original image and then uh, th1 comma th2 comma th3 comma th4 comma th5 okay so these are the six value we want to show and these are the six titles of these uh, uh, images and now we are going to use the for loop so for i in x range so using the python x range we are going to just iterate over these six values so i'm going to just write x range and then the range we are going to provide here is six and then inside this for loop we are going to just call plt and we are going to call a method called subplot okay and this subplot method takes few arguments so first argument is the number of rows which we want to show in our matplotlib plot so because we have six images so we are going to divide these images into two rows and three columns so the first argument here is the number of rows and the second argument here is the number of uh, columns and the third argument here will be the index of the image so the index of the image will be i plus uh, one and then we are going to write comma plt dot i am show so this is going to show this image and the index of the image so we are going to just write uh, images and then square bracket i so this is going to give you a particular image at index i and then we want to show this image as a grayscale image so anyway when you use thresholding you use the grayscale image so you just need to write uh, gray here then we are going to show the titles of these images so we are going to just write plt dot uh, title and then this title method takes uh, the title name which we are getting using this titles array and then at the index i this is going to give you uh, the title name which we have declared in this title array and at last if you don't want to show the ticks on the images you can give uh, these two method which is plt dot x uh, and the argument here is the empty list and also plt dot y ticks and the argument is the empty list and at the end what we want to do is instead of uh, using this kind of code we just want to show our uh, window so we can just say plt dot show and this is showing us uh, this error unresolved uh, reference yes so this is when you are using uh, python 2 but in python 3 this x range is changed to a method called range and that's why it was giving us the error so let's run this uh, script once again and you can see six different results and six different titles so these are all the titles which are shown here and then the result are shown under these titles so using matplotlib you can include multiple images into one window and this is very useful when you want to show multiple image at the same time in the same window so this is how you can use matplotlib library with opencv images and there is a lot of things which you can do with matplotlib so if you want to learn more you can just go to the official website which is matplotlib.org and then uh, you will be able to see more uh, documentation here so that's it for this video and i will see you in the next Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorials for beginners using Python. 
In this video, we are going to discuss about morphological transformations in OpenCV. So we will discuss different morphological operations like erosion, dilation, opening and closing methods, etc. But first of all, what are morphological transformations? So morphological transformations are some simple operations based on the image shape. Now morphological transformation is normally performed on a binary image and when we perform morphological transformation there are two things which are required. First is the original image and second is called a structuring element or a kernel which decides the nature of the operation. Now there are different type of morphological transformations and we are going to see them one by one. Now to start with I have this simple code which reads the image using OpenCV IM read method and we are just loading or showing this image using matplotlib. Now if you are unfamiliar with matplotlib and how to use matplotlib to show images in the last video I have explained this topic in details so if you uh, want to see that video about matplotlib you can see it and this is the code I have used in the last video also and, and I have explained this code in details in the last video so if you are confused what this code is doing just see the last video now there is one important thing to notice here is I am reading this image in a grayscale mode okay so either you can uh, provide here as the second argument of I am read cv2 dot I am read underscore grayscale or you can provide simply zero here in order to read this image in grayscale so let's run this code and let's see what it does so as expected it's just opening the image in the grayscale mode using matplotlib now as I said normally we perform the morphological transformations on the binary images so that's why we need to provide a mask to our image using the simple thresholding so let's just do that so I'm going to uh, just write underscore comma the mask so I'm going to name my uh, variable as mask here and then I'm going to just write cv2 dot threshold and this threshold take few argument as you might already guess first is the image itself second argument is the value of the threshold so for uh, now I'm going to just provide the threshold of uh, 220 here the maximum value of threshold will be 255 then the next argument here is the type of the threshold so we are going to provide cv2 dot thrash binary inverse so this is our mask so let's load the mask in the matplotlib uh, uh, window so i'm going to just provide in this titles array one more uh, title which is mask and then we are going to see how this image looks like after the mask okay and here the range I'm going to increase it to 2 because now the array is of two elements and the subplot is also let's say 1 by 2 so we want to show two images and I'm going to just run this code and you can see this was uh, the image which was the grayscale image and the second image is the masked image now if you see this image carefully let me just uh, just increase the size of this image and if you see this image carefully after masking there are some black dots here on the balls and let's say we want to remove these dots which are there in between this uh, white area this black dot or this black dot or you can see some black dots are there inside your uh, ball in the white area and we want to remove uh, these dots from the balls for this we are going to use the dilation 
transformation. So first of all, what we are going to do is we are going to just write uh, dilation, which will be our variable name. And then we are going to use this method called CV2 dot dilate. Okay. So this method uses the source, which is mask in our case. And then the second thing is the kernel. Okay. So let me uh, explain what the kernel is. So a kernel is normally a square or uh, some shape which we want to apply on the image. So we are going to define a kernel of numpy ones, which means we want to apply white uh, square on our balls. So you can see when we run our code once again, it shows us error because this kernel uh, is undefined. So let me define this uh, kernel first of all. So I'm going to just say kernel is equal to np dot ones. And then we are going to define the shape of uh, this kernel. Let's say this is of 2 comma 2 size. And then we will just say np dot uint 8. So this is our kernel and kernel in this case is nothing but a 2 by 2 square shape. And this square shape kernel is going to be applied on our image wherever these black dots are there. So now we have defined this kernel. So let's see after this kernel is applied on our masked image, how it looks like. So I'm going to just add one more title here, which is dilation. And then I'm going to add uh, the image after the dilation is applied on our image. And then we are uh, just going to increase the range to three because now we have three images. And let's say this plot contains images one by three. So one row and three columns, right? So I'm going to just uh, run this code once again. And now you can see all these three images. First was the original image. Second is the masked image. And the third one is the image which we got after we applied the dilation. Let me just in increase the size of uh, this image somehow. So now you can see that, for example, here there was a black dot and now it's reduced, right? The size of this black dot is reduced. Here also there was a black dot, but its size also is reduced. But still, we can see these black dots here, right? So how we can uh, remove these black dots completely? So there is a third parameter which we can provide to this dilate method, and it's called iterations. So number of iterations. So we can uh, just provide iterations is equal to whatever uh, the number of times we want to perform dilation on our image. By default, it's one. And you can provide, let's say, two here. And let's see what is the result now. So I'm going to just run this uh, code again. And now you can see those black dots, which we can see here on the masked image, are now gradually gone, but still, I can see some little dots on the images. The small dots are already gone, right? So now what we can do here is we can increase the size of the rectangle. So this rectangle is applied to our uh, area which have these spots. So we can increase the uh, size of the rectangle. And the bigger the rectangle is, the better the result will be, but there will be a problem which I'm going to show you. So let's run this code. And you can see now all the black dots from our image is gone. So there was a black dot here, which you don't see anymore. And there was a black dot here, 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 and here. And we don't see these black dots here. But you might also observe 
that the size of this white area is also increased after we applied the dilation on this masked image. So now this ball and this ball in the result after the dilation is merging here, right? So you can see it's merging because the size of our kernel is uh, big and when we apply dilation, the pixel element is one if at least one pixel under the kernel is one. That's why the shape of uh, these balls are increasing. So let's see how our next morphological transformation works, which is called erosion. And after that, I'm going to explain you how uh, this erosion works and what is erosion. So I'm going to just declare a variable called erosion and then I'm going to just uh, call a method called cv2 dot erode. So the method name is erode and the first argument here is the source. The second argument here is the kernel as we have seen in uh, dilate method. And the third argument is the optional argument which is uh, the iterations. So for now we just apply one iteration which is by default uh, also one and now we are going to just add this uh, image to our matplotlib uh, window so i'm going to add the title and the image and now i will increase the range of the array to four and let's say now we want two by two uh, metrics of uh, these images right so let's uh, run this code and let's see what happens so now you can see four uh, results here and first was the original image second was the masked image third was the dilation so all the spots in the balls which are black are gone using the dilation but the size was increased and using the erosion you can see the sides of the ball eroded so the basic idea of erosion is just like soil erosion. It erodes away the boundary of the foreground object. So when this erosion is applied, the kernel which we have defined slides through all the image and a pixel in the original image, either one or zero will be considered as one only if all the pixels under the kernel is one otherwise it is eroded and this means this value will be set to zero which means this will be a black area so let's increase the number of iterations here so let's say we want to apply the erosion two times on the same image and i'm going to just uh, run this code once again and you can see now these balls are eroded more. Let's say we want to increase this to five times and then run the code. And you can see now these balls are really small because we have applied this erosion multiple number of times. So let's uh, say this is uh, one once again. And let's uh, make this size of our kernel small two by two uh, rectangle size right so you can see now our result is better because all the spots from these balls are gone and uh, these balls are not so much eroded now there are two more morphological transformation methods which are called opening and closing so we are going to first of all uh, see how opening works so I'm going to uh, define a variable called uh, opening and then I will call cv2.morphologyx, okay? And then we will provide the source, which is mask. The second method is the type of morphological operation which we want to perform. So in this, we are going to just call cv2 dot and then we can specify which type of uh, morphological operation we want to perform on the image. So just write morph and then the type of operation. So we want to perform the morph open for the opening, right? And then the third argument here is the kernel, which we have defined. 
and now we are going to just add this uh, opening to our matplotlib uh, window let's add this and then let's do 5 here and then let's say our uh, matplotlib is going to show these images in a 2 by 3 format okay so let's run this code and let's see what happens and let me increase the size of this uh, image now and this is the result of the opening so what is opening in morphological transformations so opening is just another name of erosion followed by dilation so when you perform this opening morphological operation first of all erosion is performed on the image and then the dilation will be performed on the image so you can see the effect of uh, the erosion followed by the dilation still you see some spots here which can uh, go if you can just increase the size of uh, this block so let's rerun the code let's see what happens so now this image somehow looks better than the older image so opening is the erosion followed by dilation now there is a closing method also which is just the opposite of opening in the closing morphological transformation dilation is performed first on the image and then it is followed by the erosion so let's see if uh, we get the better result when we perform the closing morphological operations and the morphological operation here will be close and run this code and now you can see the result here so in closing as i said first of all the dilation is applied and then the erosion is applied in the opening first of all erosion is applied and then the dilation will be applied now there are different type of morphological operations you can apply using this morphology x so for example i'm going to just use uh, some of them so the main um, morphological operations other than opening and closing is let's say morphological gradient so i'm going to just uh, say mg for morphological gradient and you just need to change the second argument here so cv2 morph underscore morphological gradient so we are going to just uh, call this morph gradient and it's going to apply the morphological gradient and then the next is the top hat and the black hat so there are different uh, uh, morphological techniques you can apply so I'm going to show you one more and then I will leave you uh, with the other techniques so th for top hat and here also the second argument you just need to uh, change it to top hat right otherwise you can see there are so many number of techniques you can uh, apply on your image so there is gradient close open we have already seen black hat cross dilate uh, ellipse erode hit miss rect and then top hat which is uh, we are going to use right now right and then we can uh, just add these two things to our list of titles and list of images so mg and then we have th for top hat and now we have eight images so range is increased to eight and let's say we just want to show them in two by four uh, matrix here in the uh, matplotlib window so you can see this is the result of morphological gradient so morphological gradient is the difference between the dilation and erosion of an image and this is the result of top hat 
that means it is the difference between the image and the opening of an image so this is how you can perform some of the morphological operations on the images now i will show you one more example i have a image called j dot png so i'm going to just uh, load this image also and because this j dot png is already a binary image i don't need to apply this mask here so instead of uh, this mask i can just directly use our image variable so i'm going to just uh, write this and let's load this image two times because uh, we already have defined this mask variable inside our uh, title list and image list and now i'm going to just run this code so the original image of this j.png looks like this and after we applied the dilation you can see the dilation increases the area of uh, this j the erosion just erodes away the corners of uh, this uh, j right opening is going to apply the erosion first followed by the dilation and closing is going to first of all perform the dilation followed by the erosion this uh, morphological gradient is going to give you the difference between the dilation and erosion of the image so it's going to give you this kind of a result and you can see the top hat uh, result here which is the difference between the input image and the opening of the image so this is how you can use different type of morphological transformations on your images using OpenCV. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will discuss about smoothing or blurring images in OpenCV. So smoothing, which is also known as blurring, is one of the most commonly used operation in image processing. The most common use of smoothing operation is to remove noise in the images. Now when smoothing or blurring images, we can use diverse linear filters because linear filters are easy to achieve and are also relatively fast. Now there are various kinds of filters available in OpenCV, for example, homogeneous, Gaussian, median or bilateral filters, which we will see one by one. So first of all, we will see the homogeneous filter. So homogeneous filter is the most simple filter. And in homogeneous filter, each output pixel is the mean of its kernel neighbors. Now in homogeneous filter, all pixels contribute with the equal weight. And that's why they are called homogeneous filters. Now, those of you who don't know what the kernel is, I have explained about kernel in the last video. So you can see the last video. And in simple word, a kernel is a shape which we can apply or convolve over an image. And you can use, for example, NumPy to create this kind of uh, squared kernel. So in homogeneous filter, the kernel looks like this image which you see on your screen. So in homogeneous filter, kernel k is equal to 1 by the width of the kernel multiplied by the height of the kernel. So let's say we want to use a kernel of 5 by 5. Then using this formula, we will have k is equal to 1 by 25. And then we will have our kernel matrix of 5 by 5 ones. So let's create this kernel first of all. And then we will see how to use this kernel for the image filtering using 2D convolution or homogeneous filter. So what I have right now here is the simple code which loads this image using matplotlib. And this code you might already know because I have explained in detail how matplotlib works and how to read the images using OpenCV. 
one thing to note here is I'm just converting the image from BGR to RGB because matplotlib reads the images in the RGB format and OpenCV reads the images in the BGR format. So this conversion is necessary. So let's define our kernel. So I'm going to just say kernel is equal to NP dot once and then we are going to take the kernel of 5 by 5. So we are going to define this kernel 5 comma 5 of once. So I'm going to just say NP dot float 32 here and then we are going to divide uh, this kernel by 25 because our kernel is of 5 by 5 because the formula which we have seen in that formula we have uh, the kernel which was a matrix of uh, ones and then we have the multiplication of one divided by the width and height of the kernel so that's why the multiplication of the width and height is 25 that's why i have taken 25 here so now we have our kernel so we can define our uh, destination image using this kernel and we are going to use cv2 dot there is a method called filter 2d which we are going to use which is used for this homogeneous filter so here the first argument is the image the second argument is the desired depth of the destination image so for now we are going to uh, take it as a minus one the third argument is the kernel so now when we have applied this uh, kernel on our image using 2d filter let's see what the output will look like so i will name this uh, image as uh, 2d convolution and the destination is the final image which we got using filter 2d and let's increase this range by 2 and let's say we want to show this image on matplotlib in 1 by 2 uh, format okay so i'm going to just run this image so this is the result on the left hand side is the original image and on the right hand side is the 2d filter applied image so this is the image which we got by applying the homogeneous filter using filter 2d function so you can see on the corners here there is a little bit noise and after applying this uh, 2d convolution over this image you can see all the corners are now smoothened and overall this image is now smoothened or blurred a little bit so these uh, noises are removed or suppressed by this blurring so this is one way of blurring an image using filter 2d right filter 2d function now as in one dimensional signals images also can be filtered with various low pass filters or high pass filters etc so low pass filter helps in removing the noise or blurring the image etc and high pass filters helps in finding edges in the images now when you want to achieve image blurring we need to convolve over the image with the low pass filter kernel now there are some algorithm as i said there are various kind of algorithm available in opencv so we will also see them one by one so first algorithm is the blur method or it's also called the averaging so what i'm going to do is i'm going to define a variable called blur and then i'm going to call a method called cv2 dot blur okay so this is the method which we will use to apply averaging algorithm for blurring the image and this takes two argument one is the image and second is the kernel so the kernel we are going to apply is once again five by five and now we are going to just see the result of this uh, blurring method so we are going to just uh, load it using the matplotlib so range i'm going to increase it 
by one once again and let's see this uh, these three images in one by three format on the matplotlib uh, window so this is the result and you can see the original image the result which we got using the filter to the method and the result we got using the blur method which is also called averaging so the result is more or less uh, looks the same to me because we have applied the same kind of kernel to uh, both the functions so this is the result of filter 2d function and this is the result of uh, the blur function now there are more uh, functions which are available in OpenCV, so let's see uh, them. So the next algorithm which we are going to see is the Gaussian filter algorithm. So the Gaussian filter is nothing but using different weight kernel in both X and Y direction. So in the result, pixels located in the middle of the kernel have the higher weight or bigger weight and the weights decreases with distance from the neighborhood center so pixels located on the side have smaller weight and the pixels located on the center have the higher weight so when we take a 5 by 5 kernel its result is going to look like this which is shown in the image and now let's see how we can use uh, this uh, Gaussian blur in our OpenCV code. So I'm going to remove this semicolon which I somehow added here and let's uh, declare a variable called g blur for Gaussian blur and then we are going to use cv2 dot Gaussian blur. So the method name is Gaussian blur and the argument here are same as the blur method. So first argument is the image itself second argument is our kernel we are going to take the same kernel of 5 by 5 and the third argument here is the sigma x value which we are going to take 0 for now and let's see the result of the gaussian blur method when it's applied to an image so i'm going to just define one more title which is g blur or gaussian blur or let's take this uh, name which will be more clear and then our result image is g blur and let's increase the range to uh, 4 and let's say we want to show this image in 2 by 2 format so two rows and two columns so i'm going to run this code and for opencv uh, logo the results looks the same you can see uh, for uh, the 2d convolution or filter 2d method or blur method Using the Gaussian blur, you can see there is a little bit different between uh, the blur method and Gaussian blur method uh, uh, results. The Gaussian blur result is more better in my eyes than the blur method. Let's try this Gaussian blur method with another image. So I have this image called half tone underscore Gaussian underscore uh, blur and I'm going to run this uh, code now with the new image and you can see the result now so this was the original image which have uh, too much noise here so you can see uh, the pixels here which have too much noise and after applying the Gaussian blur you can see this eye image in a much better way and all the noise is removed so the gaussian blur method is designed specifically for removing the high frequency noise from the image like uh, this one now let's see the next method which is called the median filter so median filter is something that replaces each pixel value with the median of its neighboring pixel so this method is great when dealing with something which is called salt and pepper noise now if you don't know what the salt and pepper noise is you can open the wikipedia and uh, under this url or just search for salt and pepper noise uh, wikipedia page and you can see uh, more details about salt and pepper noise so you can see 
this is an image and there are uh, some pixels which are distorted here. So there are uh, some pixels where uh, the white uh, dots are there or white noise is there and there are some places where the black noise is there. So that's why it's called uh, salt and pepper because we have uh, white pixels which are distorted like salt and we have the black pixels which are uh, which looks like pepper so that's why it's called salt and pepper uh, noise so i have this uh, same image which i'm going to use as a source now so it's called uh, water.png in my case and now let's see how we can use the median blur method so i'm going to just define a new variable called uh, median and then i'm going to use uh, cv2 dot median blur method so this method is called median blur where the first argument is the image and the second argument here is the kernel size now one thing to note here is that the kernel size must be odd here so uh, this must be a 3 or 5 or 7 or and so on except 1 okay so when you uh, just give one it's going to show you the original image and let's say we uh, just give three here as the kernel size or in our case we have the kernel size of five so let's take the five kernel size here so let's just show this result of the median filter in the matplotlib window so i'm going to just increase the range five and let's say this is two by three matrix now and I'm going to run this code and now you can see the results of all the filtering method and you can see the best result you get using the median filter method so when you have this kind of salt and pepper dots on your images then you can use the median filter now let's see the last filter which is called the bilateral filter so by using all uh, these filters for example homogeneous filter or averaging or the gaussian or the median filter we not only dissolve the noise but we also smooth the edges and sometimes we need to preserve the edges that means we need that all the edges must uh, remain sharper even if uh, the image is blurred so let me uh, show you one example so I have this uh, Lena dot uh, PNG image so I'm going to define a variable called bilateral filter and then uh, there is a method called CV2 dot bilateral filter and this bilateral filter takes the first argument which is uh, the image the second argument is the diameter of each pixel neighborhood that is used during the filter so let's take it as a nine the third argument is the sigma color and the fourth argument is the sigma space so the sigma color is the filter sigma in the color space and sigma space is the filter sigma in the coordinate space so for uh, this we are going to take this filter sigma color and sigma space as 75 and 75 here and uh, let's see it in the result window so bilateral filter and then uh, the result bilateral filter and this gives me error because this image is called lena.jpg not png so jpg and then uh, we need to increase this range by one to see all the six images and let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see the result now so let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see them and from here also so now you can see by applying the bilateral filter the edges are preserved in a much better way so here you can see the hat border is blurred but here you can see in the result the border of the hat are pres preserved so the images in which you need to uh, preserve the borders then you can use the bilateral filter so bilateral filter is highly effective in noise removal while keeping the edge sharp so these are some of the methods and algorithms you can use to 
smoothen or blur your images using OpenCV. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will talk about image gradients in OpenCV. So first of all, what is an image gradient? So an image gradient is a directional change in the intensity or the color inside the image. Now the image gradient of an image is one of the fundamental building blocks in image processing. For example, we use image gradients inside the image to find the edges inside an image. Now there are several image gradient methods available in OpenCV and we are going to see three of them. First is the Laplacian derivatives, second is the Sobel X method and third one will be the Sobel Y methods. And all these methods which I mentioned are different gradient functions which uses different mathematical operations to produce the required image. So the Laplacian calculates the Laplacian derivatives whereas Sobel method is joint Gaussian and differentiation operations. But don't be overwhelmed with the details, you just need to keep in mind that these are just the functions which we use for finding out the gradients of an image to analyze the image. So let's use the first method which is called the Laplacian gradient. Now to start with I have this initial code and you might already know what this code is doing. So first of all I'm just reading this image messy5. Uh, jpg in the grayscale mode using the im read method and then i'm just uh, loading this image using the matplotlib window so let's first see how the result looks like so this is going to look like this this is just a normal image of messy and let's see how we can apply the laplacian method to find out the laplacian gradient of an image. So for that we are going to declare a variable called uh, lap and then there is a function available inside your CV2 uh, library which is called Laplacian and this Laplacian method takes few argument. First argument is the image the second argument here will be the data type which uh, we are going to uh, use which is called cv2 dot cv underscore 64 f. So cv2 dot cv underscore 64 f is just a data type and we are using a 64 bit float due to the negative slope induced by transforming the image from white to black. So you just need to keep in mind that this is just a data type which is 64 bit float and it supports the negative numbers which we will be dealing with when the Laplacian method is run on our image. Now in the next line what we are going to do is we are going to take the absolute value of our Laplacian image transformation and we are going to convert this value back to the unsigned 8-bit integer which is suitable for our output. So I'm going to just write lap and then using the numpy uint method so np.uint8 and as an argument we are going to pass np dot absolute and then inside the absolute method we are going to just pass our image which is going to give us the absolute value of our Laplacian image transformation which is going to convert uh, this 
into the unsigned 8-bit integer. Now let's see the result of uh, this Laplacian gradient. So I'm going to just add a new title to my title array which is called uh, Laplacian and also inside the images uh, list I'm going to add uh, this lap uh, variable which contains uh, this image right after the Laplacian gradient is applied here and here the range will be 2 and uh, we are going to see it in 1 by 2 format on the matplotlib window. So here you can see the original image which is this one and after the Laplacian gradient uh, method is applied on this image you can see all the edges which are detected by this uh, method when we applied this method on this messy 5jpg image and an image gradient as i said is the directional change in the intensity or the color in an image so let's close uh, this window and there is one more uh, argument you can provide here which is the kernel size so you can uh, just say k size is equal to 5 this is the kernel size and I'm going to just run this uh, program once again and you can see uh, the kernel size is increased but our uh, result is deteriorated right so let's uh, reduce it to 3 and then once again run this program and the result looks uh, fine and if you uh, apply k size is equal to 1 let's see the result and you can see you get the better result I think so for now I'm going to just use k size is equal to uh, 3 and now let's use the other two uh, image gradient methods which are Sobel X and Sobel Y so these methods which uh, are called Sobel X and Sobel Y are also called Sobel gradient representation so let's just use them and then we will discuss uh, how they are uh, useful so first of all I'm going to declare a variable called uh, Sobel X and then I'm going to use uh, the method inside this uh, CV2 library which is co called Sobel so this is the method which takes again few arguments first is the image second is uh, again this data type which is cv2 dot cv underscore 64 and the third argument here will be the dx so when you write one here this value can be one or zero so when you write one here that means we want to uh, use the sobel x method okay and then the fourth argument here is the dy value okay so this is dx which is for the x direction and this is for the dy which is for the y direction and dx stands for the order of derivative x and the dy stands for order of derivative y now once again we are going to uh, declare uh, the sobel y variable so let's declare uh, the sobel y and then uh, cv2 dot sobel and this also takes a uh, few arguments here the difference will be only the third and fourth argument so i'm going to just use uh, the second argument same the third argument will be 0 for Sobel y and the fourth argument will be 1 right so this is the order of derivative x if it's uh, 1 this is called the order of derivative which is uh, in the x direction and in the second case it is in the y direction and the fifth argument here can be the k size as we have seen in the Laplacian method so if you want you can provide the kernel size also here as the fifth argument but we are going to uh, skip it for now now again we are going to convert these values into the unsigned int as we have uh, done 
in the case of uh, Laplacian. So what we are going to do is we are going to once again overwrite this uh, variable Sobel x and then we are going to use np dot u int 8 and in the parenthesis we are going to just write np dot absolute and then we are going to just pass uh, the value inside the Sobel x variable. Same we, we are going to do with the Sobel y variable. And now let's see the result, how the result looks like. So I'm going to just uh, add these elements inside the title and the image list. So let's add Sobel x and Sobel y here and here also. So Sobel y and now let's increase the range to 4 and let's see it in the form of 2 by 2 uh, matrix on the matplotlib window. So I'm going to just run this code and you can see the result here. So original image Laplacian uh, gradient and then Sobel x and Sobel y. So you can see uh, when you apply the Sobel x uh, gradient method the direction or the change in direction in the intensity is in the x direction and when you apply the Sobel y method the change in direction in the intensity is in the y direction so this is like horizontal and this is in the vertical direction I have uh, one more image which uh, will illustrate this uh, Sobel X and Sobel Y gradient method in a better way I think and this is called uh, Sudoku. So I'm going to just write sudoku.png file and hopefully I didn't do any mistake in the naming. Yes, it works. So you can see uh, the Laplacian result here and then Sobel X and Sobel Y uh, result here. So in the Sobel X you can see more vertical lines so because Sobel Y is good for uh, the directional change in the vertical direction so you can see more uh, change in intensity in the vertical direction and uh, using the Sobel Y you can see the directional change in the intensity in the horizontal direction or the y axis. You can also combine the result of Sobel x and Sobel y images and how we can do this let's see. So to combine these two uh, results I'm going to just create one more uh, method which is called Sobel combined is equal to cv2 dot we are going to uh, use the bitwise or operator in order to uh, merge these two images. So we are going to just write bitwise or and then we are going to provide the two sources one is Sobel X and the other is the Sobel Y image. So this is going to give us the bitwise or uh, result of these two images and then we are going to just add this into the title list. So let's uh, say Sobel combined and also in the image list so like this and let's just increase the range to 5 and let's see it in the form of uh, 2 by 3 on matplotlib. So I'm going to just uh, run this uh, once again and you can see the result now. So this here is the combination of Sobel X and Sobel Y method and you can see now you can see the directional change in the vertical as well as in the horizontal direction because this is the combination of Sobel Y and Sobel X images. So this is how you can use the image gradients inside OpenCV. In the next video we are going to see how we can use Kenny edge detection method to find out the edges in an image. So stay tuned and please rate, comment and subscribe and I will see you in the next video.
Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorials for beginners using Python. In this video, we will talk about Kenny Edge Detector in OpenCV. So first of all, what is Kenny Edge Detector? So the Kenny Edge Detector is an edge detection operator that uses multi-stage algorithm to detect a wide range of edges in images. Now this Kenny Edge Detector was written and developed by John F. Kenny in 1986. That's why it's named after his name, which is Kenny Edge Detector. Now the process of Kenny Edge Detection algorithm can be broken down in five different steps. The first step is to apply Gaussian filter to smooth the image in order to remove the noise. The second step is to find the intensity gradients of the image. The third step is to apply the non-maximum suppression to get rid of spurious response to edge detection. The fourth step is to apply double threshold to determine the potential edges and the fifth step is to track edges by hysteresis that is to finalize the detection of the edges by suppressing all the other edges that are weak or not connected to strong edges so this seems little bit complicated but in OpenCV it's really simple to use so there is a built-in function in OpenCV which is called Kenny and we are going to use uh, this function. So to start with I have this uh, sample code which loads this image which is called messy.jpg using the matplotlib library. I'm going to just run this to show you the results. So this is the image and we want to uh, detect the edges of this image so what we are going to do is we are going to first of all declare a variable called uh, Kenny and then there is a method as I already said inside your CV2 library which is called Kenny method which takes few arguments so the first argument here is the image source itself the second argument and the third argument as you can see is the first threshold value and the second threshold value so this first threshold value and the second threshold value you need to provide for the hysteresis procedure so there is the last step as I mentioned and in that step hysteresis take place and for that procedure we need to provide the values of the threshold 1 and the threshold 2 so for now I'm going to uh, provide 100 as the threshold 1 and 200 as the threshold 2 but later you might want to add a track bar in order to see the changes in the edges when you just move the track bar from left to right for the threshold 1 and the threshold 2 so this might be a small assignment for you you can just add the track bar and see how the edge detection changes when you change the value of threshold 1 and threshold 2 and I have already explained how you can use track bars with OpenCV so just watch that video and you will be good to go so now we have the result of Kenny edge detection function so we are going to just add it to our list first to the list of titles and then second to the list of images and the range we are going to increase it to uh, two and this we are going to just uh, see the images in one by two format so i'm going to just run this uh, python script and see the result so you can see we have uh, the uh, original image here which we have loaded in the grayscale and on the right hand side you can see the result of the Kenny edge detection methods so you can see uh, all the edges which are available here on this messy 5.jpg image you can use uh, this on the other images also so for example I have the 
lena.jpg image let's see the result of that and this is the result of uh, the Kenny edge detection method on this lena.jpg method so this Kenny edge detection is really useful because in the last video we have seen how to find out the image gradients and let's see in comparison to those image gradient methods how Kenny edge detection method performs so these are all the methods I have explained in the last video Laplacian Sobel X and Sobel Y and I have shown you how to combine the result of Sobel X and Sobel Y and additionally I have added this uh, line to the previous code which I have shown you in the last video which is edges is equal to cv2.kenny which gives us the result on the same image uh, using the Kenny edge detection method and I have added it to the title and the image right so let's run this uh, script once again and let's see the differences in the result using all these uh, methods so you can see all the six results this is the original image this is the result of the Laplacian method this is the result of uh, Sobel X and this is the result of Sobel Y and this is the combination of Sobel X and Y and you can see Kenny edge detection gives us the result which contains lesser noises so you can see there is a lot of noise present in the other matters you can see here all the noise is present which is uh, removed using Kenny edge detection or in the Laplacian method also you can see uh, some noises around but in the Kenny edge uh, detection method you can see you get the proper edges and more precise edges without any noise so this is the benefit of using Kenny edge detection so this is how you can use Kenny edge detection in OpenCV I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will discuss about image pyramids in OpenCV. So till now, normally when we have used images, we have used the images of constant size. But sometimes we need to work with the images of different resolution. So for example, if I have an image and I want to search the face inside an image this face can be of different sizes so using image pyramids we uh, just create the images of different resolutions and then we search for the object for example face in all of uh, these images so pyramid or pyramid representation is a type of multi-scale signal representation in which a signal or an image is subject to repeated smoothing and sub sampling so a normal pyramid when you create a pyramid of images it will look like this so let's say this is the original image at the bottom then when you uh, downscale an image using a pyramid function it's going to give you uh, this image which have the half resolution than the original image and then when you further go up it's going to give you the one fourth of the original image and then so on so one eighth or one sixteenth of an image now there are two types of uh, image pyramids which are available in OpenCV first is called Gaussian pyramid and second is called Laplacian pyramid so first we will discuss about the Gaussian pyramid so Gaussian pyramid is nothing but repeat filtering and sub sampling of an image now there are two functions available for the Gaussian uh, pyramid which is called pair down and pair up 
So let's uh, see them one by one. So I have this uh, sample code which is just reading an image and then showing it using the I am show method. Now in order to uh, use this uh, pair down function you can uh, just define a variable let's say LR for lower resolution and then you can use cv2 dot pair down so there are two functions you can see pair down and pair up so first of all we will see pair down and then we are going to pass our image as an argument here so I'm going to just pass our image as an argument and we are already showing the original image and let's show the image after we have reduced the resolution of this image using the pair down method so pair down is going to reduce the resolution of an image so i'm going to just uh, use lr here and let's say this is the pair down one image okay so let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see this is the original image and this is about you can see one fourth of this uh, original image right so this pair down method is going to reduce the resolution of an image when you apply the same uh, method on the second image so let's say this is lr1 and then we create a second variable lr2 and when we pass lr1 as an argument for this method to create the lr2 method image then let's see what happens so this will be lr1 and let's uh, just say this is going to give us lr2 the resolution of image will reduce further so let's see what happens so this was the original image this was uh, the image which we got from the first pair down method and then we get this image which we which is further reduced in resolution so this is the image after applying the pair down method second time on the lr1 image okay so you can see the resolution of image is reducing and it's creating a kind of pyramid and that's why it's called the image pyramid now there is a method called pair up also available in OpenCV. so let's see what this uh, pair up method do so as you can expect it's going to increase the resolution of the image so here i'm going to just say hr for higher resolution and then i'm going to just say cv2 dot pair up okay and it's going to increase the resolution of an image now let's say we want to increase the resolution of an of this image which is the smallest image which we got using the pair down method right so we are going to apply the uh, pair up on the last image which we got using the pair down method and let's see what happens so when i'm going to use this hr2 here and this we got from uh, pair up method and let's say this is the pair up one and i'm going to just uh, run this code and you you are going to see that we have converted this image which was the smallest image to a higher resolution which resulted in this image but when you see this image carefully so let me just move this uh, to this side and this was the original image so let me just uh, minimize this so this image we have converted to this image using the pair up method so ideally this image should look like this but you have to remember that this pair up image is not going to be equal to this image because once you decrease the resolution using the pair down method you lose the information about that image so when you uh, use pair up to just increase the resolution of this image 
then you can see the result looks little bit blurred because some of the information is loosed using the pare down method so you have to keep this in mind that when you want to increase the resolution after you have reduced the resolution you're not going to get the same result as you might expect that this image should look like this but they are not equal images so this image is just a higher resolution of this image and it has nothing to do with this image so these are the two methods which are available in gaussian pyramid now if you want to uh, create a pyramid of uh, multiple resolution instead of uh, just using this pair up or pair down method repeatedly what you can do here is i'm going to just uh, remove uh, this and remove uh, this code also so what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy uh, the image into a new variable so i'm going to just say uh, layer is equal to img dot uh, copy there is a method available for copying uh, the image which is uh, copy and then i'm going to create the gaussian pyramid array okay so i'm going to just create a variable called gp for a gaussian pyramid is equal to then in square bracket i'm going to just pass this uh, image here as the first element of uh, this list then what i can do is i can use a for loop instead of just re rewriting this pair down method again and again and you might already know how to use for loop in python so for i in range and here we can provide any uh, range so let's say we want to create five uh, image pyramid okay so five time we want to reduce the uh, resolution so we are going to give uh, six here because range goes uh, the number minus one so whatever you give here minus one right so now what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, use our layer uh, uh, parameter once again and then we are going to just call cv2 dot pair down method so pair down and then we want to just uh, say layer okay and then we want to append to the gaussian pyramid list okay so we are going to just say gp dot append and we are going to append the result of uh, this pair down to our list which we have created here okay so this is going to uh, just append this image to our list of images and then let's uh, just uh, show this image using cv2 dot i am show method so cv2 dot i am show and here we can just say str for converting the integer to the string because uh, the first parameter you give to i am show is a string parameter that's why i'm converting the integer to the string and the second parameter is the image so let's uh, pass this layer here okay so you have the original image which will be uh, shown using this line of code and then you will see multiple number of images of different resolution using this code so let's run this code and let's see what happens so i'm going to run this code and you can see there are uh, different images uh, resulted using uh, that code which we have uh, written so this was uh, the first image which is a zero and then this is the second image and then uh, this is the third fourth fifth and sixth so sixth you can see have a very small resolution so this is how you can uh, use uh, pair down method multiple times using a for loop now what are laplacian pyramids so laplacian pyramids are formed from the gaussian pyramids there is no exclusive function for uh, creating the laplacian pyramid so as you have seen that uh, in gaussian pyramids 
there are two methods available pair up and pair down but there is no exclusive function for creating the laplacian pyramid so how we can create a laplacian pyramid if there is no function available for creating them so you can create a laplacian pyramid or a level of laplacian pyramid is formed by the difference between that level in the gaussian pyramid and the extended version of its upper level in the gaussian pyramid so this definition might be confusing to you guys so let me explain you with the code what i mean by this definition so what i'm going to do is first of all i'm going to take the top level layer of the gaussian pyramid so top level layer of the gaussian pyramid is the last image which is generated using this uh, for loop so let's say we have uh, six images or five images using uh, this for loop so what we are going to do is because we have appended each and every image to this list right so we have all the images inside this list so we can uh, just get the last image using the indexing so again i'm going to use uh, the layer variable and then i'm going to uh, just say gp for gaussian pyramid list and then there is the index 5 because last image will be available at the index 5 of uh, this uh, list so we get the last image of uh that gaussian pyramid and then let's show this image so i'm going to just say cv2 dot uh, i am uh, show and this is the upper level or the last image so i'm going to say upper level gaussian pyramid and then we are going to pass uh, this layer variable here so this is going to show just the last image of uh, this list and let's uh, just comment this code out because we don't want to see all the images and then i'm going to create a new list for laplacian pyramid so i'm going to just say lp for laplacian pyramid and then i'm going to create a list uh, using the layer uh, variable itself as we have done for the gaussian pyramid list also so the first element here is uh, the layer variable itself and now we are going to use the for loop and then i in range and this time what we are going to do is you might already know how to use uh, the range function and if you don't know you can see uh, you can give the stop integer here or you can give a multiple uh, uh, parameters here so you can see there is one more implementation of this range function so you can give the start parameter and the stop range so start is the starting point stop is the stopping point and also you can give the steps so this step means uh, in what number you want to reduce okay so let's say we want to start from 5 and then we want to go until 0 and we want to reduce in the step of minus 1 okay so 5 4 3 2 1 so let's uh, print the value of i first of all if you uh, might be interested in the result of this range function then uh, let's uh, just uh, run this uh, code and let's see what happens so this is uh, the images which we get but we are not interested in these images we are interested in the print function output so you can see the output of uh, this uh, print function code is 54321 as i said uh, the lower limit is not reached so if you give 0 here then it's going to go until 1 and not 0 if you give 6 here then it's going to go until 5 not 6 so let me repeat the definition of laplacian pyramid once again so laplacian pyramid is formed by the difference between that level in the gaussian pyramid 
and the extended version of its upper level in the gaussian pyramid so let's first create the extended version of that level so we are going to just create a variable called uh, gaussian extend or extended and then we are going to extend the level of uh, that image which are there in the gaussian uh, pyramid list by using cv2 dot dot pair up method and here what you need to give is the gaussian pyramid list and then we just need to get the index i from this so this line gives us the extended version of the upper level in gaussian pyramid now let's create the laplacian pyramid so laplacian is equal to cv2 dot subtract because we want to find out the difference between uh, that level in the gaussian pyramid and the extended version of its upper level so i'm going to just say gp for gaussian uh, pyramid and then we are going to just say i minus 1 as the first parameter and the second parameter is the extended version of uh, the gaussian upper limit and now we can use the i am uh, show method to show all these laplacian images so i'm going to just say cv2 dot i am show and once again i'm going to use str function to convert uh, from a number to string and then in the next parameter i'm going to just pass the laplacian uh, parameter here as an image source so what do you think will this code work so let's see what happens when we are going to run this code so you can see the laplacian pyramid looks just like the edge detection so all the edges are shown here on every uh, image this is the first level this is the second level third level fourth fifth level so these images are called the laplacian pyramid now what is the use of uh, creating those laplacian pyramids or the gaussian pyramids so the laplacian and gaussian pyramid helps us to blend the images and the reconstruction of the images so these are the two uh, benefits of creating those laplacian and the gaussian pyramids so in the next video we are going to see how we can blend the images or how can we reconstruct the images using the open cv and the image pyramids so stay tuned and i will see you in the next video Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to show you how you can create a standalone executable file using your Python scripts. So let's say I have a project and it contains uh, some Python scripts or a Python script. And let's say I want to convert this uh, test.py into an executable file. So on Windows, it will be .exe file or on uh, Linux, it will be a binary file, which I can execute uh, by double clicking. So for that, for converting your Python scripts into an executable file, we can uh, use a utility called PyInstaller. So you can see uh, there is a website called pyinstaller.org and you can find more about this PyInstaller utility on this website. And PyInstaller is a Python application which creates standalone executable file under windows linux or your max operating system so for using py installer you need to have pip installed on your operating system so what is pip first of all if you don't know what is pip you can uh, just go to this website py py.org pypi.org and pip is a package management system which is used for the management of 
the Python applications. So for using PyInstaller, you need pip and how you can uh, install pip on your operating system. You just need to install Python on your operating system. Pip will be automatically installed with the installation of Python. So you don't need any extra strap to install this pip uh, on your operating system. So if the Python is installed, the latest version, then pip is going to work. I have already created a video about how to install Python on your Windows operating system, let's say. So I will just put the link in the description so you can see that video and move ahead. So once you have installed Python, you can just uh, open the command prompt and once the command prompt is open you can check if pip is installed or not using this command uh, just give pip hyphen hyphen version and if this command gives any uh, useful reply for example in my case it says pip and the version of pip which is installed on my system and which python version it's using so this is the python version it's using and this is the pip version which is installed on my system so once this command works then what i can do is i can go to the pi installer website and you can see it's a simple uh, command to install the pi installer so you just need to give this command pip install pi installer in order to install pi installer so let's uh, copy and paste this command pip install pi installer and then uh, press enter and it will take a uh, few seconds uh, to install pi installer utility using pip so once this installation command is finished successfully you can see it's uh, finished uh, successfully on my uh, terminal what i will do is i will just uh, go to pi installer website and see how to use it so it's a it's a very simple uh, usage of this pi installer command you just need to uh, give the pi installer command and after that the name of your python script so let's uh, do that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to this folder where my python script is there so i'm going to just restart my command prompt and once the command prompt is open i'm going to just uh, copy the path of uh, this python script and then i'm going to just say cd and the path and then press enter let me just uh, make it little bit bigger and let me uh, just uh, move this uh, folder explorer so in order to convert this test.py script into the executable file you just need to give this command pi installer space the name of your uh, python script which is test.py in my case and then press enter and uh, it's going to take some time and you can see some folders and files are created by pyinstaller inside the project folder for you so once this pyinstaller command is finished you will see uh, in addition to your python script there are a few folders which are created so the interesting folder for you will be this folder which is the dist or dist folder so i'm going to go inside this dist folder and then i'm going to go inside the test folder so this name will be uh, the same as your python script name so i'm going to go inside this folder and here you will be able to find an exe file with the same name as your python script so because my python script name was test.py that's why the executable file name is test.exe file so let me just uh, double click this file and you can see when i double click this executable file it will give me the same output as my python script is going to give me so this is how you can convert your uh, python script into a executable file so let me also show you the output of the python script so let me just clear this uh, console here and then uh, I'm going to just say python and then test.py and you can see the executable file gives me the same output as this uh, command is giving me. Now you might observe one uh, minor issue here and this issue is you can see there are a lot of uh, dependency files uh, which are created by pyinstaller 
for the just running this test.exe file. So what if I just need to create this test.exe without all these dependencies. So let's go back to my uh, project. So this was the project and I'm going to delete all these uh, generated files and folders which were created by PyInstaller. And once again, I'm going to give the same command which is PyInstaller test.py but I'm going to add one extra flag here which is hyphen hyphen one file flag. So what this uh, flag will do is it's going to just create one exe file without the dependency files. So let me just give this command and let's see what happens when I uh, give this pyinstaller command with one file flag. So now you can see all these folders are recreated but when I go to the dist folder here you can see this time only test.exe file is created without uh, any extra dependency right so all the dependencies will be uh, bundled with this exe file and only one file will be created and this is much better than uh, creating all the dependencies and uh, just uh, transferring all the dependencies to your client or anyone. So let me just double click this also and uh, you will see it's going to give you the same result. So if you want to create only one exe file without any dependencies, you just need to give this flag which is hyphen hyphen one file and you will just get only the exe file. Once again, let me uh, just give the cls command to clear the terminal. Now I have uh, one more uh, example for you. So let me uh, show you the second example and let me go inside this uh, folder which is tkint uh, project and let me uh, just run this uh, project. So I'm going to just uh, go back one folder and then I'm going to cd into the kinter underscore uh, project and let me just run this uh, python script real quick. And this is the output of uh, this uh, Python script. So this is a window which I want to open. And I want to convert this uh, Python script into an executable file. So this uh, Python script uses uh, Kinter for uh, creating this window. So there are some uh, dependencies which you need to import inside your Python script. Now in order to convert this into an executable file, you might already uh, know the answer how to convert it. You just need to give this command pyinstaller space hyphen hyphen one file and the name of your script which is going to uh, create an executable file using this uh, Python script. And once again when I go inside this uh, dist folder you can see this main underscore window.exe file is created and when I double click on this window then there is a terminal which is opened first and then after a few seconds your real application will start. So now the real application which is this Kinter window is started now. So you can see a little problem here which is this terminal window always opens before opening your real application which is this window. So how uh, can I uh, just remove this terminal and I just want to open this registration form without this terminal. So there is one more flag which you need to add in order to achieve this. So I'm going to just uh, close uh, these two uh, windows and terminal. And for now, let me just uh, remove all these uh, directories. So delete and let me just clear the terminal. And in addition to your uh, hyphen hyphen one file uh, flag what you need to do is you just need to give one more flag which is hyphen w okay so pi installer hyphen hyphen one file space hyphen w and then your script name and then i'm going to just uh, press enter which is once again going to create these directories so once this command is finished i'm going to go once again to the dist folder and run my main underscore windows.exe file and this time no terminal will open only your application window will open without opening any 
console terminal so you can see only my real application is opening without opening any extra console terminal so minus w is for uh, opening your real application without any console output now there is one more thing which i want to show you here is for example your uh, project contains uh, some extra dependencies on uh, some extra uh, things which are uh, related to for example your chrome extensions or any other uh, thing what you can do is you can use a utility called nsis which is a open source utility so you can just go to uh, this website which is nsis dot sourceforge.io i'm going to give you uh, the link in the description and when you reach to this page you can see the download uh, button on the right hand side so i'm going to click this uh, download button which is going to open this page and then i'm going to just uh, click on the download link here and after a few seconds this uh, executable file for nsis uh, utility will be downloaded on my system you can see it's about 1.4 megabyte so it's not a big file so you can directly uh, install it and then uh, run this executable file and uh, once you run it let me just minimize the browser and also let me just minimize these windows and uh, this is the installer window so i'm going to just click next i agree and then uh, leave everything as default next and this will be the location click install and once this uh, NSIS uh, utility is installed you can just uh, leave this checkbox checked which says run NSIS which is going to run your NSIS application so this is the NSIS menu what you need to do is you just need to click on this uh, link which is installer based on zip file so just click on this link installer based on zip file and provide the path for your directory so what you can do here is once you have created your exe file so there is this exe file you can name uh, this uh, folder anything for example i will just leave it as a dist folder and then you just need to convert it into a zip file so let me convert it to a zip file so i'm going to just say add to archive and then i'm going to create a zip file and then i'm going to just say okay which is going to create this zip file and inside this zip file you already know my exe file is there so once you have created your zip file just copy the path of this uh, directory and go to this window which is opened using nsis and then just give the path of your zip file so this is the zip file i'm going to just give the path of this zip file and then i'm going to just click on this generate button which is going to generate you can see this dist.exe file okay so once this dist.exe file is created using your zip file you can test this using this test button so just click on test and it's going to open this kind of installation windows so this uh, dist.exe file you can uh, just uh, give to your clients or your colleagues in order to install this exe file on their operating system obviously it should be a windows operating system so i'm going to just double click on this uh, exe file and it will work like a normal installer now one thing to note about py installer utility is if you want to create a windows exe file you need to run py installer on your windows operating system so if you want to create a linux binary using your windows operating system py installer it will not work okay so if you want to create a executable file use windows operating system with py installer if you want to create a linux binary then uh, just run that python script with py installer using that operating system so that's it for this video this is how you can create a standalone executable file using your python script i hope you have enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next video
Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In the last video, we have seen what are image pyramids and I have told you there are two kinds of image pyramids in OpenCV. One is called the Gaussian pyramid and the other is called the Laplacian pyramid. And we have seen in the last video how we can create the Gaussian pyramid and the Laplacian pyramid. Now, in the last video, I have also told you some applications of image pyramids. And one of the application of image pyramids is the image blending. So let me show you one example. So here in this code, I have two images. One is of apple and other is of orange. And I want to blend or merge these two images. So let me just run this code first of all. So you can see there are two images. First is of apple and other is of orange. And I have also printed the shape of uh, these two images. So you can see the shape is similar, 512 by 512. And orange image shape is also 512 by 512. So here what I want to do is I want to blend half of the orange to half of the apple. So let's say I want to just blend right hand side of this orange to the left hand half of this apple. So how can I achieve this? Now you might say that I can uh, just uh, cut these two images into half and then I can stack these two images side by side and I will get the half and half of uh, the two images and that's how I can uh, just get the result. So let's first of all try this uh, technique. First of all we are going to just uh, create the half and half of the apple and orange images and we are going to just uh, stack these images side by side. So let's say I'm going to create uh, the variable called apple underscore uh, orange and then here there is a method in numpy so i'm going to just say numpy dot h stack so there is this method called h stack and here what i can do is in the form of tuple i can uh, provide the half of my apple image so apple is the image variable name and then what i'm going to do is the half of uh, this image because this image is 512 by 512 so I'm going to just give this kind of expression colon comma and then colon 256 which is the half of the apple image on the left hand side right and then I'm going to just do the same with the orange image so I'm going to just take orange and then colon comma 256 colon so one thing to observe here is i have taken colon before 256 in the apple image and i have taken colon after 256 in the orange image and then i'm going to just uh, show this apple orange image and let's see what result we get when we run our code so these two are the apple and orange image and this is the result of adding the two halves of the orange and the apple image. But still you can see this line which is clearly visible and from this line you can say half of this is orange and half of this is an apple. So in image blending what we need to do is we need to blend this line also so the orange and the apple image should be merged or blended in a perfect way so for blending this half apple and half orange image what we can do is we can use the image pyramid techniques to blend these two images now in order to blend two images using image pyramids technique we need to follow five steps the first step is to load two images 
in our case these images are of apple and orange which we are already doing so first step is to load these two images the second step is to find out the gaussian pyramid of our apple and orange image the third step will be from these gaussian pyramids find out the laplacian pyramids okay so we will find out the gaussian pyramid in the second step and then in the third step we are going to find out the laplacian pyramids now in the fourth step we are going to join the left half of the apple and the right half of the orange in each levels of laplacian pyramid and finally in the fifth step what we are going to do is we are going to just join these image pyramids and reconstruct the original image so let's follow these steps one by one and let's see what result we get so as i said first step is already done which is just loading these two images and the second step would be to find out the gaussian pyramid so let me just uh, just write this step generate gaussian pyramid for uh, apple first of all and then we are going to find out the gaussian pyramid of the orange so first of all what i'm going to do is i'm going to just copy the apple image so i'm going to just say apple underscore copy is equal to apple dot copy so there is a method called copy which you can use to copy the this image so from this copy what we are going to do is we are going to generate the gaussian pyramid so i'm going to once again name my variable as gp uh let's say underscore apple and then we are going to just pass our image which we have copied in the form of list so i'm going to just say apple copy here so these steps we have already seen in the last video how to create the gaussian pyramid and the laplacian pyramid of an image so i'm not going to explain this in detail if you want uh, the detailed explanation you can see the last video next what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a for loop and i'm going to just say for i in our range so i'm going to use the range function and we are going to uh, use the six levels uh, in this example so i'm going to provide the range up to six and then what we are going to uh, do is we are going to just say apple copy or you might have uh, named this variable as apple layer also because we are uh, just creating multiple layer of the apple image for the gaussian pyramid right and then we are going to use the cv2.pair down method to create the gaussian pyramid okay this we have already seen in the last video and now as an argument we are going to pass our apple copy a variable here and in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to just uh, append to our gp underscore apple variable which is our gaussian pyramid for the apple image and then we are going to just append this apple copy after we have applied pair down method on the same image so this is just giving us multiple layer of the apple image right the same method we are going to apply for the orange also so i'm going to just copy uh, this code and then we, i'm going to just paste this code once again and this time this will be for orange and i'm going to just say this is the orange copy and we are going to copy from the orange uh, image and then we are going to just generate the gaussian pyramid for the orange image and this will be passed here and also here and also here and also here and this gaussian pyramid orange will be passed here okay so we have generated the gaussian pyramid for the apple and the orange now we are going to generate the laplacian pyramid for apple and orange so this also we have seen in the last video 
so I'm going to just comment uh, generate Laplacian pyramid for uh, Apple first of all and to find out the Laplacian pyramid for uh, the Apple what we are going to do is we are going to once again uh, take our uh, Apple copy and then using our uh, Gaussian pyramid so let's uh, take Gaussian pyramid for uh, the Apple and we are going to use the fifth element of uh, this list so what we have learned in the last video how we can find out the Laplacian pyramid a level in the Laplacian pyramid is formed by the difference between the level in the Gaussian pyramid and extended version of its upper level in the Gaussian pyramid so this difference we are going to find out in this step so I'm going to just say this is LP for the apple which stands for Laplacian pyramid for the apple is equal to in the list we are going to just pass the apple copy and then we are going to use the for loop so for i in uh, the range so we are going to take the range and in the last video i have shown you how to take the range for uh, the Laplacian pyramid so we want to go from uh, 5 until 0 in the steps of minus 1 and then in the next step we are going to create the Gaussian extended uh, variables Gaussian extended is equal to CV2 dot pair up this time we are going to use the pair up method and then we are going to pass our GP Apple which is Gaussian pyramid for Apple and then the index here will be i in the next step we are going to create the laplacian uh, variables is equal to cv2 dot subtract so there is a method in cv2 which is called subtract and then we are going to take our gaussian pyramid for the apple so gp apple and the index here will be i minus one and the second argument for uh, this subtract uh, method will be our Gaussian extended variable so we are going to just pass this Gaussian extended variable and in the next step we are going to just append to our Laplacian pyramid for the apple so lp underscore apple dot append and we are going to just append this uh, Laplacian variable to the Laplacian pyramid for the apple same we will do for the orange image also so we are going to generate the Laplacian pyramid for the orange orange here and this will be the copy of uh, the orange copy here and here also and uh, then this will be the GP orange right this also will be GP orange this also will be GB orange and here instead of LP Apple we are going to just say LP orange and then we are going to just pass this variable here also so now we have finished three steps one is to load both the images second is to find out or generate the Gaussian pyramid and the third step is to generate the Laplacian pyramid for uh, both the images now the fourth step is to just join the half of uh, these two images so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to just uh, create one more variable which will be apple underscore orange underscore let's say pyramid is equal to and also we are going to create a variable called n and we are going to see uh, later how to use uh, this uh, variable and then we are going to use the for loop and then we are going to create two uh, variables one for uh, the first image so I'm going to uh, just say apple and then uh, lap comma orange lap okay so these two uh, variables I'm creating just same as uh, this uh, I in this for loop in zip so there is a method zip which we can use to zip uh, the Laplacian pyramid uh, one which is for the apple and for the orange also so I'm going to just say LP for apple 
comma lp for the orange and inside this for loop first of all we are going to just uh, increment the value of n by one each time so n plus equals uh, one and in this next step we are going to find out the shape of the apple image so the apple image shape gives us three values first is columns so i'm going to just say c o l s for columns then uh, rows and then the third value is the number of channels and then we are going to just say apple lap dot shape in the next step we are going to just create a variable called laplacian and we are going to just uh, join the two halves of uh, these two images which we are getting inside the variable apple lap and orange lap so we are basically doing this step after applying the gaussian uh, pyramid and the laplacian uh, pyramid on both the images so np dot h take uh, method we are going to apply in this step so i'm going to just write np dot h stack and then as an argument what we are going to do is we in the form of tuple first of all we are going to take our apple lap variable which is uh, this one and in the square bracket we are going to just write colon comma zero comma int so we are going to just typecast the number of columns in the apple shape so this we got from the shape of the apple uh, index and then divided by two so we are going to just uh, uh, dividing the columns into half and same we will do for the orange lap so we are going to just say orange lap in the square bracket colon comma int and then once again uh, in the uh, parenthesis we are going to just say calls for the number of columns divided by two and then colon as we have done in this step also and at last we are going to just append this laplacian variable to this uh, list which we have created so apple underscore orange underscore pyramid dot append and then we are going to pass the laplacian variable here now the last and the final step is to reconstruct our image so let's reconstruct our image so now what we are going to do is we are going to once again create a variable called apple orange underscore uh, reconstruct is equal to this will be uh, the first index of our apple orange pyramid so i'm going to just say apple orange underscore pyramid and this will be the zeroth index and once again we are going to use the for loop so for uh, i in the range so we are going to go from one until six and the default step is of uh, one so we don't need to give the third argument and inside the for loop we are going to just take this variable once again and then we are going to apply the pair up method on this so cv2 dot pair up and as an argument we are going to pass the same variable so we are going to just uh, apply the pair up on uh, this uh, apple orange reconstruct from the zeroth index of the pyramid up to the sixth level and the last step will be to add all the layers so uh, apple orange uh, reconstructed once again or reconstruct uh, is equal to cv2 dot add so this is also one method which is called add and here we are adding apple orange pyramid and the reconstructed apple orange uh, image okay so this is uh, this variable which we got by uh, just adding the left and right halves of each level and then we are uh, just reconstructing uh, this image using the pair up method and thus just adding the pyramid level so this should be i think the index i right we cannot uh, just add the list to the image directly okay so this will be uh, at each layer we are just reconstructing and adding it to the image which we got 
by just uh, add addition of this half of the images. Now in the end let us try to just uh, load this uh, reconstructed apple orange image in the I am show window and let us hope it works. I have not checked it yet so I am not sure it will work or not and you can see it is working in the first go so that is a good thing so you can see the difference. So this result we got by just stacking this apple and orange image side by side but this uh, line is clearly visible but when we applied the Gaussian pyramid and the Laplacian pyramid technique for blending the images then you can see this line is perfectly blended and this line is not uh, any more visible. So, this is the perfect blending of the orange and the apple image. So, this is how you can use the Laplacian and Gaussian pyramids to reconstruct and blend two images together and result is in front of you. So, you can see how it can blend two images so perfectly. So this is how you can blend images using image pyramid technique. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I am going to see you in the next video. Hey guys welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video we are going to understand what contours are and we are going to see how to find contours and how to draw contours. So first of all what are contours? So contours can be explained as the curve joining all the continuous point along the boundary which are having the same color or intensity. Now contours can be a useful tool for shape analysis or object detection or object recognition. Now for better accuracy we generally use binary image for finding the contours. So first of all we are going to uh, generate the binary image and then before finding out the contours we are going to apply the threshold or Kenny edge detection to find the contours on the image. So let us start with an example. So here I have a simple code which reads an image and then converts this image into a grey scale image and then I am just showing both the images using I am show method. So let us run this code and let us see what result we get. So this is the original image with uh, these colors and after the conversion of uh, this image to the grayscale image this is the result which we are getting and then we are going to find out the threshold or the Kenny edge. So in this example we are going to just uh, apply the threshold. So for applying the threshold on this image we are going to define first of all two variable ret comma thresh is equal to cv2 dot threshold. So there is a method called threshold which we have already seen how threshold work in detail in the previous videos. So the first argument which this threshold method takes is the image. So we are going to pass our grayscale image as the source. The second argument is the threshold value. So because it is a binary image let us set the threshold to 127 which is around half of uh, the 255 right. The third argument is the maximum value. So, the maximum value here will be 255. The next argument will be the type and type here will be 0. So, this is going to give us the threshold value for this grayscale image and after finding out the threshold of this image we are going to find out the contours. So, for this we are going to define two variables. One is contours and the second is the hierarchy because uh, the method which we are going to use which is cv2 dot find contours this is the method it is going to give us these two values contours and the hierarchy and we are going to see what are contours and hierarchy in details after applying this method on this image. So the first argument will be the thresh which we got 
using this threshold method. The second argument will be the contour mode. So this is called the contour retrieval mode also and there can be several uh, possibilities here which we can apply but for simplicity and in the most common case we use retr underscore tree here okay as the mode the third argument here will be the method which we want to apply and this is also called the contour approximation method and here also several uh, possibilities are possible but for now what we are going to use here is this will be cv2 dot approx none so now as you are seeing here this uh, fine contour method gives us contours and the hierarchy so the contour is a python list of all contours in the image and each individual contour is a numpy array of uh, x comma y coordinates of boundary points of the object and the hierarchy is the optional output vector which is containing the information about image topology and this we are going to see in the later videos. So for now we are only concerned about finding out the contours. So for this as I said this contains the number of contours right. So we can uh, print out these number of contours is equal to and then we are going to just uh, convert this number into the string and there is a method called length and then inside this length method we are going to pass our contour variable so this line is going to print out the number of contours which are found inside the image which we are providing so let's run this code and let's see what result we get so we already know that this gives us a grayscale image and the original image but we are interested in this uh, print message and the number of uh, contours which are found is 9 inside the source image which we are providing here. Now we already found out the number of contours now we need to draw these contours on the image itself so how can we achieve this but before this let's see the individual contour also so I'm going to just print out the value of the first contour which will be at index 0 so let's run it once again and let's see what happens so we are running uh, this uh, code once again and you can see after printing out the number of contours it's going to give us the numpy array of the x and y coordinates so if we plot or join all these x and y coordinates we are going to get the boundary of the contour so now we are going to just take these contours and pass it to a method called draw contours which is going to draw or join all these coordinates of those contours so to get this we are going to just say cv2 dot draw contours and then the first argument here will be our original image because we want to draw the contours on our original image so this will be the img uh, and it's the original image and the second argument will be the contours so we are going to just uh, pass the contours which we found inside the image the third argument will be the contours indexes so if we uh, just gave here minus one then it's going to draw all the nine contours which were found inside the image these all contours so first of all we will give a minus one here as an argument and then we will see uh, how to give other arguments uh, as the numbers here also the fourth argument here will be i think the color so we are going to just uh, give the color uh, 0 comma 255 comma 0 let's say and uh, the next argument will be the thickness so we are going to take the thickness 3 here so using this method what we have achieved is we have drawn the contours on the original image so let's run this code once again and let's see what result we get so you can see this was the grayscale image and this we have used for finding out the contours but the interesting image here is this one and here you can see all the contours are drawn 
on this image. So all the green lines or green uh, uh, boundaries are all contours. So because we have given minus one, it has drawn all the contours on this image and we can also give the contour index. So let's say we just want to uh, find out the contour zero, which will be the first contour which is found inside the image. We are going to just uh, run this uh, uh, code once again. And the first contour which was find out found out is this contour, this uh, P contour, right? In a similar way, we can go up to uh, eight, so zero, one, and let's uh, rerun this code again. You will see that the second contour is this contour. So this whole contour from uh, the boundary of this image is the second contour. And in a similar way, you can go, uh, let's say two, I'm going to run this uh, code once again. You will see the next contour here. And similarly, you can go up to the index eight because the total number of contours are nine and we are starting from the index zero. That's why we can go up to eight. So this value depends on the number of contours, okay? So because we found out the number of contours are nine, so that's why we can go up to eight and let's run this code and the last contour which was find out and we have drawn this contour here on this uh, blue circle, right? Now, if we go beyond this index, let's say we give nine here, we are going to get the error, right? So you can go up to eight here and if you want to just draw all the contours, then you can just give minus one here and it's going to draw all the contour on the image which you are providing. So this is how you can find out the contours and draw contours on the images using find contour and draw contour methods in OpenCV. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can create a very basic and simple motion detection and tracking system using Python and OpenCV. So let me show you what we are going to achieve at the end of this video. So I have this uh, video, which is a sample video, and you can see some people are walking around inside this video. Now what I want to do here is I want to show these rectangles around uh, these moving people or persons. So this is tracking and when some movement occurs, I also want to show this kind of status that status is movement because somebody is moving inside the video. So if nobody is moving, the status will be blank and if somebody is moving, then this status uh, will be movement. So this is what we are going to achieve at the end of uh, this video. So we are going to try to track each and every person. And also we are going to uh, track this person with this rectangle. And also we will show the status uh, as movement when somebody moves inside the video. So let's get started. So to start with, I have this uh, basic code, which just reads a video using video capture class. And then if uh, this video is valid, then I'm going to just show this uh, frame by frame inside I'm show window. And I'm sure you might be knowing all this code because I've shown you step by step how to capture the video or how you can read the video frames using video capture method. Okay, so this is just to uh, load this video and show it frame by frame using I am show method. So, so let me run uh, this code first of all to start with. So our original video looks like this. So some people are moving, 
but we want to track the movement of each and every person and also we want to show a rectangle around them whoever is moving so let's get started so under this uh, video capture code line what i'm going to do is first of all i want to read two frames from the cap uh, instance so i'm going to just copy uh, this code and paste it here so this will be our frame one let's say and similarly i'm going to just read the second frame so uh, simply we are just uh, declaring two frame uh, one after another okay and we don't need uh, this uh, code anymore so first of all i'm going to declare a variable uh, diff and using uh, cv2 dot abs diff method so absolute difference we are going to find out the difference between the first frame and the second frame so this method abs diff is for finding out the absolute difference between the first frame and the second frame now once we have the difference then we are going to convert this difference into a grayscale uh, mode so we are going to just say gray is equal to cv2 dot uh, convert color so cvt uh, color and the first parameter here will be our difference which we uh, have found between the two frames so i'm going to just pass diff as the first argument and the second argument will be cv2 dot we are going to convert this bgr color to the grayscale uh, mode and why we are finding out the grayscale uh, mode of uh, this uh, diff because we are going to find out the contour in the later stages and in the last video we have learned that it's easier to find out the contours in the grayscale mode uh, as compared to the colored mode or the bgr mode so once we have uh, this grayscale mode we are going to just blur our grayscale uh, uh, frame so we are going to uh, just declare a variable called blur and then we are going to apply the gaussian blur on our gray uh, variable so cv2 dot uh, gaussian blur the first parameter here will be gray so let's uh, give this uh, gray parameter which we have de defined here the second parameter here is the k size or the kernel size so let's say we want to provide the kernel size 5 comma 5 and the third parameter here will be the sigma x value so we are going to just pass uh, 0 here as the sigma uh, x value now we are going to find out the threshold so we are going to just say underscore because we don't need this uh, first uh, variable and then the second variable will be thresh is equal to cv2 dot uh, threshold and the first parameter which it takes is the source so we are going to pass our blurred image as the source and then the second parameter here will be the threshold value so we are going to just provide 20 here then the maximum threshold value will be uh, 255 then the type will be uh, cv2 dot thresh binary so in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to dilate the thresholded image to fill in all the holes this will help us to find out the better contours so there is a method called cv2 dot dilate so we are going to just uh, declare a variable called uh, dilated and then we are going to apply this uh, method so cv2 dot dilate which takes few argument the first argument will be our thresholded uh, version of uh, the image the second argument here will be the kernel so kernel let's say for now we are going to provide none here okay so the kernel size will be uh, none and then uh, third parameter will be the number of iterations so let's provide the number of iterations and the number of iterations we are going to provide here will be three so 
if it doesn't work we can increase or decrease the number of iterations now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to find out the contour so as you all know that contour or find contour method is going to give you two results one is the contours and other is the hierarchy so we are going to just say contour and the second uh, result we are going to just say underscore because we are not going to use this uh, second result and then we are going to uh, just say cv2 dot find contours and we are going to find the contours on this dilated image so we are going to say dilated now the next argument here will be the mode so the mode which we are going to use here will be retter underscore uh, tree so i'm going to just write retr underscore tree which is uh, most commonly used and then uh, the next argument here will be the method so the method here will be cv2 dot uh, chain approx simple and once we have our contours we are going to just draw the contours because we already uh, found out the contours so we are going to just say uh, draw contours and the first argument here will be uh, frame one because we want to apply all the contours on the original frame right so we are going to apply all the contours which we have found using all these method on the frame one and then the second argument here will be the contour so you can uh, just give the contours here and the third argument here will be uh, the contour id i can uh, just say minus one which is uh, going to apply all the contours and the third and the next argument will be the color so let's say we want to provide the green color so i'm going to just uh, say zero comma 255 uh, comma zero and the next will be the thickness so let's say we want to provide the thickness of two here so now it's going to draw all the contours which we have found with the difference of frame one and frame two right and then we are going to just uh, display this frame one so we can just say this is our uh, feed and the result after applying the contour will be saved in the frame one which we will display now in the next step what we are going to do is we are going to assign the value inside frame two into frame one so we are going to just say frame one is equal to frame two and then inside our frame two we are going to read a new value so we are going to just say r e t comma frame two is equal to cap dot read okay so we are reading the new frame in the variable frame 2 and the, before reading the new frame we are assigning the value inside the frame 2 to the frame 1 in this way we are reading the two frames and finding out the difference between uh, the two frames so let's run this code and let's see if it works or not uh, let's test this so you can see now there are these contours which are drawn around all the moving uh, persons also there are some contours uh, which are drawn around this rope which is also moving right so we have successfully determined the contours and we have already drawn these contours on the frame one but this was not the result we are looking for we want to draw the rectangle around these moving uh, persons and also we want uh, some noises to be removed so we don't want to uh, draw the contour on the moving uh, rope let's say okay so how to remove these uh, noises and how to draw these rectangles let's see so now in the next step what we are going to do is under or before we are drawing these contours we don't want to uh, draw the contours now we want to draw the rectangles right so what we are going to do is we are going to iterate over all the contours so we are going to just say uh, for contour so 
from contours we are going to find out contour in contours right so this is the list and we are iterating over this list so inside this for loop the first step will be to save all the coordinates of the found contours okay so we are going to define the x coordinate then the y coordinate and then we are going to uh, just say width comma height and there is a method called bounding rect which we are going to apply on the contour so we are going to uh, just say is equal to cv2 dot bounding rect this is the method which we are going to apply which is going to give us uh, the x and y coordinate and the width and height right and we are going to apply this bounding rect method on the contour which we are getting using this uh, contours list now in the next step we are going to find out the area of the contour and we are going to just say if this area is less than certain value then we don't want to do anything we don't want to uh, draw a rectangle or anything we just want to continue otherwise if this uh, contour area is greater than uh, let's say uh, some kind of a person's area then we want to draw a rectangle on it so inside this for loop we are going to just uh, define a if condition so we can say if cv2 dot contour area so there is a method called uh, contour area which is this one where we can pass our contour so we are going to pass our contour and if the area of this contour let's say is less than 700 then we are going to just say continue so this code essentially mean that if the area of the contour is less than 700 then we are going to do nothing we don't want to draw any rectangle otherwise if the area is greater than 700 then we want to draw the rectangle so we are going to just say cv2 dot rectangle we have already learned how to draw a rectangle on an image using the rectangle method the first argument here will be the source which will be frame one the second argument will be the point one so we are going to just say point one will be x comma y the third argument will be point 2 so we are going to just say x plus w comma y plus h the next argument will be the color so let's say the color will be the same 0 comma 255 comma 0 the next argument will be the thickness let's say we want to give the thickness uh, 2 as we have done uh, with the draw contour we have provided the thickness of 2 here right now in the next step we are going to just uh, uh, print some text on the image if some movement is observed so we can just say cv2 dot uh, put text this also we have seen in the previous videos how to put text on an image so this time the source will be our frame 1 the second will be the text so we will uh, just say uh, status let's say and if there is some movement we are going to just say uh, colon in the curly brackets we are going to just use the format method so this is just uh, formatting the result using the string and we are going to just say movement the next argument here will be the origin so where we want to put this text let's say we want to put this text on uh, 10 comma 20 coordinate and then the next uh, argument will be the font face so we are going to just say font face will be cv2 dot font font hershey simplex let's say so we are going to use uh, this font and uh, the next argument will be the font scale so let me just uh, uh, do this on the next line so font scale will be let's say one the next will be the color of the font 
So let us say the color will be 0, 0, 255 and then the last argument will be the thickness. So let us say the thickness will be 3 and this code is going to put the rectangle around your moving uh, persons if the area of uh, that uh, contour is greater than 700. Okay. So let us run this code and let us see if it works or not. So I am going to just uh, run this code and you can see that status is movement because all the persons here are moving and you can see these rectangles which are drawn around the moving persons and this noise which we were uh, seeing in the previous result is also gone around the movement of uh, this rope okay so sometimes uh, this uh, uh, rectangle is drawn on the movement of the rope also so in this case you can also increase the expected area. Let us say we just want to find out the contours which are greater than 900 and we can uh, now you can see uh, these rectangles are drawn around uh, these moving persons with the area which have the uh, contour area more than 900. So, you can remove these kind of uh, noises from uh, the frame uh, using this area. So, this was a very basic example how you can uh, detect the motion and track your uh, moving object inside your uh, video using Python and OpenCV. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we are going to see how we can detect simple geometrical shapes using OpenCV. So to start with, I have this simple code which reads an image and then show it into a I am show window. So let us uh, run this uh, simple code first of all and let us see what it does. So you can see I have this image which I am loading into a uh, OpenCV window using I am show method and here we have uh, some shapes. So we have a pentagon, circle, rectangle, square, triangle and this uh, star shape right. And let us say we want to detect using OpenCV which shape it is based upon uh, the geometrical shape and we want to write the name on top of this shape. So how we can achieve this, let us see using OpenCV. So as you can see, if the first step is to read an image and then in the second uh, line, I am just converting this image into a grayscale mode image. So using this code, I am just converting this uh, image into a grayscale mode. And in the next step, we are going to find out the threshold. So I'm going to just say underscore comma thresh is equal to CV2 dot threshold. So CV2 dot uh, threshold and we are going to pass our image, which is a grayscale image, which we have converted as a source. And then the next two values are the threshold values and the maximum uh, value of uh, the threshold. So for now, I am giving the threshold value to 40 because I know this will work. But if you want to be more flexible, you can always use the track bar to find out uh, which threshold will work with your image. The second value is the maximum value of the threshold. And the next value will be the type. So the type here will be CV2 dot thresh binary. So we are going to just say CV2 dot thresh binary. Now in the next step, we are going to find out the contours. So contours we have already uh, seen in the last uh, videos how to find out the contours and what are contours. So for that, I'm going to define two variables. One is contours variable, other is uh, the underscore variable because we do not need the second uh, uh, result. And then I am going to just say cv2 dot find contours 
the first argument here will be the thresholded image and then the second argument here will be the mode and third will be the method so let's give these two values so cv2 dot r e t r tree and the method will be cv2 dot uh, chain approx none okay so let's uh, give uh, this method so this is the simple procedure to find out the contours inside an image now in the next step i'm going to iterate over all the contours so i'm going to just say for uh, contour in contours so we are going to iterate over all the contours and then we are going to first of all use a method called cv2.approx poly dp so i'm going to just uh, declare a variable first of all i'm going to just say approx is equal to cv2 dot this method which i have mentioned which is called approx poly dp so this method approximates a polygonal curves with a specific precision and the first argument which it takes is the curve so our curve here will be the contour which we have found on the shape the second argument here will be epsilon so epsilon is the parameter specifying the approximation accuracy so here what we are going to do is we are going to define epsilon is equal to 0.01 and then we are going to multiply this number by cv2 dot arc length so there is uh, this method called arc length and what does this arc length method do it calculates a contours parameter or a curve length so here in this arc length uh, parameter we are going to pass once again our uh, contour variable and the second argument here will be if it's closed or uh, the open contour so in our case we know that all the shapes which we want to detect are closed so we are going to just pass true here and the next argument in the approx poly dp uh, method will be uh, once again if it's a closed shape or the open shape so once again we are going to pass true here because all the shapes which we have are closed shapes now once we have this approximation we are just going to draw all the contours first of all so we are going to just say cv2 dot draw contours on which image on our original image so we are going to draw these contours on the original image and then we are going to pass the second argument and this will be our approximation so we can uh, in the square bracket this is uh, one other notation of uh, just uh, giving the number of contours as an argument to the draw contours uh, method so in the square brackets you can just pass uh, the approx the next parameter here will be the contour index so because we are iterating over all the contours that's why the index will always be zero because there will be only one contour which we are working at a time so this index will be zero the next argument here will be uh, the color so you can give any color here i am going to give uh, 0 comma 0 comma 0 let's say and then uh, the next will be the thickness so thickness i'm going to give here is 5 now the next step is to print out the shape so which shape it is we want to print on the shape which shape it is in uh, simple english let's say so for that we need to find out the coordinates on which we want to uh, print this text on the shape so we need to find out the x and y coordinates so we can find this x and y coordinates using uh, this approx uh, variable and we uh, can uh, just say approx dot revel so this is a, a method called ravel and then the first 
index here will be the x coordinate and in the same way we are going to just say approx dot ravel and on this method the second argument or the second index at index 1 will be the y coordinate. So, on these x and y coordinates we are going to print our uh, text. Now, in the next step what we are going to do is, so because this approx poly dp is going to approximate the number of polygonal curves. So, based upon the number of polygonal curves we can uh, just uh, approximate which shape it can be. So, if this approx length, so let us uh, just find out the length of uh, this approx and if the length of this approx uh, variable is equal to 3, then we are going to say that it is a triangle because triangle can be made with 3 points. So, this length of approx variable if it is equal to 3 then we are going to say that it is a triangle because if the number of curves here are 3 then most probably it is going to be a triangle. So, if we know that this is a triangle then we can uh, easily uh, just uh, print or put text on uh, that image. So, we are going to just say put text and uh, the first variable here will be the image. So, we are going to put text on the image. The second variable will be the text and we know that this will be a triangle. So, we are going to just say triangle here and then the next argument here will be the uh, coordinates on which you want to print this text. So, we already found out the, the coordinates at which we want to put this text. The next argument here will be the font. So, we are going to just say cv2 dot font Hershey complex and the next argument here will be the font scale. So, let us say font scale will be 0 0.5 and the next argument here will be the color. So, you can give any color. Let us uh, say we just want to print this text in the black color itself. So, we are going to just say 0, 0, 0. Then using this logic we can also say that if the length of this approx is equal to 4 then it can either be a square or a rectangle. So, here if the approx length is 4 then it can be a square or a rectangle, but we do not know if it is a square or a rectangle. So, for now we can uh, just write that it is a rectangle and we are going to decide if it is a rectangle or a square in the next step, but uh, let us define the other uh, if else conditions also. So, this was uh, L if. Similarly, if number of approx points are 5, then we are going to say that it is a pentagon. So, we are going to print out uh, the pentagon text on the x and y coordinates and if the number of uh, points are 10 then we are going to just say that it is a star shape. So, we are going to just say star because in the star the number of points are 10 and then we are going to say that in any other condition. So, we are going to just say else and we are going to just remove this condition from here, else in any other condition it is going to be a circle. Okay? So, if uh, approx length is 3, it is a triangle, if approx length is 4, it is a rectangle or a square, if 5 pentagon, if it is 10, it is a star, if it is uh, nothing out of all these options, then it is a circle. You can also find out uh, for example, octagon or hexagon here, if it is 6 it is a hexagon, if it is 8 it is a, um, a octagon and so on. Right? Now, let us uh, once again come to this step and in this step we uh, just know that if 
the number of points are 4, then it's a rectangle or a square. But how can we find if it's a rectangle or a square? So let's decide that now. So what we are going to do for that is we are going to just say x comma y and then we are going to just say uh, w comma h for width and height and there is a method called cv2 dot bounding uh, rect which is going to uh, give us the x and y coordinates and the width and height of the rectangle right so we are going to apply that method so cv2 dot bounding rect on our approximate variable or approx variable which is going to give us the x and y uh, coordinate and uh, width and height. Now based upon the width and height we can find out the aspect ratio. So we are going to just say aspect uh, ratio is equal to float. First of all we need to typecast uh, the width into a float. So we are going to just say a float w divided by height and this will be the aspect ratio of the rectangle. Now if this aspect ratio, let's print out the aspect ratio also. So we know what aspect ratio uh, we are getting using uh, the rectangle or the square and we are going to just say if this aspect ratio is between uh, 0.95 and 1.05 then it's going to be a square right because the width and height are almost same okay so we just give uh, some room for uh, some noises that's why we are providing here ideally it should be a one aspect ratio should be one uh, in order to have a square but let's say uh, we are uh, just uh, approximating so we can just say if it's 0 0.95 if it's greater than 0 0.95 and if it's uh, less than so aspect ratio is less than or equal to 1.05 then it's a square okay in ideal situation you might want to give here one but uh, in images uh, it can be a little bit different so we are just giving this limit so if uh, the aspect ratio falls in this limit then it's going to be a, a square otherwise it's going to be a rectangle right and i'm going to just say that if uh, this is the case then it's going to be uh, square otherwise so in the else condition so let's uh, give uh, this else condition here else it's going to be a rectangle so let's uh, print rectangle uh, in the put text okay so this is the code which we have uh, written and now finally what we are going to do we are going to just uh, show the shapes image including all the contours and the text which we have put on these shapes so let's run this code and let's see if it works or not so you can see now it's going to uh, work like this so all the contours are drawn across these shapes and you can see uh, the text on top of uh, these shapes so circle, rectangle, pentagon, star, triangle and squares. What you can also do here is you can uh, just change uh, this uh, text position using the x and y coordinates. So uh, let's say I just want to change this y position to just little bit uh, top of the shape. So I just added minus 5 offset here in the y axis. And now you can see it goes little bit up this text, right? So now it's uh, much visible uh, this uh, text. And you can see rectangle and square text is not going up because we have declared the local x and y here also. 
So we can uh, just say x1 and uh, y1 here and then run uh, this code once again and you can see this uh, rectangle and square text is also moved a little bit up. So I think the offset of 5 is okay to show these uh, text on top of uh, these shapes. So this is how you can uh, detect simple geometric shapes using OpenCV. So I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will discuss about histograms in OpenCV. So what is a histogram? So you can consider histogram as a graph or a plot which gives you an overall idea about the intensity distribution of an image. So let me give you uh, some examples and then I will be able to explain you better how histogram works and why uh, they are useful. So to start with I have this example which uh, is a very normal example. Here I'm creating 200 by 200 uh, pixel image using uh, numpy zeros which essentially mean that uh, we are going to get a 200 by 200 pixel image of uh, black uh, pixels. So let me uh, just uh, just start this uh, example and you can see uh, this is the final result so all the pixels here in this image are black and the size is 200 by 200. Now let's say we want to calculate or find out the histogram of this image. So there are several ways of finding out histogram of an image so let's see uh, them one by one. So first of all, we are going to find out the histogram using the matplotlib uh, because uh, the plot using matplotlib you can draw easily. So let's uh, use that first of all. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use plt because I have already imported uh, this matplotlib library as plt. So plt uh, dot hist, there is a function called plt dot hist, which calculates the histogram of an image. And because it's uh, just a grayscale image or it's just a black image, so it's easier to find out uh, the histogram. So you what you uh, can do here is the first argument here will be uh, your image or your uh, source. So I'm going to just say image dot ravel okay so there is a method called uh, ravel the second argument here will be a uh, maximum number of uh, pixel value so I'm going to just say 256 the third argument here will be uh, the range so the range will vary from uh, 0 to 256 okay so this is all you need to find out the histogram using the matplotlib and uh, you just need to show this plot in a matplotlib window so you can just say uh, plt dot show so that's it so let's uh, run this code and let's see what happens so you see uh, this plot using matplotlib and also our original uh, image so as uh, we have created the image of 200 by 200 uh, pixel of black pixels so all the intensity of uh, this graph you can see is uh, zero so you can see here 200 multiplied by 200 is equal to uh, 40,000 so these are the number of pixels so on the y-axis you will see total number of pixels and here the intensity so intensity starts from uh, 0 to 256 so this graph is showing how many number of pixels inside an image which have 
this uh, pixel values. So in our example, all the pixels inside this image have the pixel value zero. That's why this graph is like this. So all the 40,000 pixels inside the image have the pixel value zero. So you will get this type of uh, histogram. So once again, the histogram is a graph or a plot which gives you the overall idea about the intensity distribution of an image. Now histogram is just another way of understanding the image. By uh, looking at the histogram of an image, you can get the intuition about the contrast, brightness, intensity, distribution, etc. Now let's uh, improve this example which we have. So I'm going to just close uh, this uh, window. And let's say I want to add some uh, white pixel also inside this image. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to just CV2 dot uh, rectangle. So I'm going to just add the rectangle inside uh, this image. And the source here will be uh, the IMG variable. Then uh, where I want to introduce this uh, rectangle. So I want to introduce this rectangle at uh, this point which will be let's say which starts from uh, 0 comma 100 and the second point here will be let's say 200 comma 200 okay so this will be uh, 200 and the next value here will be uh, the color so let's say we want to add the white pixels so this will be 255 which will be the maximum value and then the next argument will be the thickness. So I'm going to just say minus one, which will fill this rectangle inside this uh, image. So when I run uh, now this uh, code, you will see uh, this graph and this image. So you can see half of this image contains black pixels and half of this image contains the white pixels. And we already know that the size of this image is 200 by 200. That's why uh, here in the graph, you will see 20,000 pixels are uh, black, which means that uh, 20,000 pixels have the pixel value zero and 20,000 pixels have the pixel value 255. That's why you see uh, this here so you can see you can easily find out the pixel intensity of an image easily using histograms now next we are going to add some more pixels into this image and this time what we are going to do is we are going to add the rectangle uh, inside the same image so let's say it goes from uh, 0 comma 50 to 100 comma 100 and the color here we are going to uh, provide the pixel value of 127 let's say okay so which is the half of uh, 0 and uh, 255 uh, approximately so I'm going to run this uh, uh, example once again and now you will see uh, this kind of image so you can see half of the pixels here are white that means 20,000 pixels have the pixel value of 255 so you can see here now around 15,000 pixels here in the half of this image have the pixel value of zero that's why you can see uh, this line here and we have added uh, the rectangle of uh, pixel value 127 also so around uh, you can see around 5,000 uh, pixels here have the pixel value of 127. So this is how uh, the histogram is going to uh, work. So let's use now the original image. So some kind of uh, image instead of uh, this black or white image. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just once again uh, declare a variable and then I'm going to just say cv2 dot uh, I am read and uh, we are going to read some files. So let's say I have this lena.jpg uh, image. So I'm going to just uh, uh, read that. I hope the extension is uh, correct, jpg. And we are going to read this image in the grayscale mode. So I'm going to just say zero here. 
and now I'm going to run uh, this uh, example once again and you can see this Lena image is uh, loaded in the grayscale mode and here is the histogram of this image so these are all the pixel intensities inside uh, this image so you can see from uh, this uh, graph that most number of uh, pixels contained inside this image have the pixel value around uh, 150. Now you can also find out the pixel intensity of uh, different colors. So till now we have been uh, just using uh, the grayscale mode or black or white uh, pixels but you can also uh, use the same histogram for the BGR values also. So let's see how we can do that. So what we are going to do is, let me uh, just remove uh, this code or I'm going to just leave it commented. And here I'm going to just say B comma G comma R. And there is a method we have already seen which is called CV dot split, which is going to split your uh, image into BGR values. So we are going to just uh, give the source which is our image and then if you want to uh, show these BGR uh, values you can uh, just show in uh, the I'm show window so BGR and here also B G and R and when you want to uh, it show the histogram of uh, BGR values then also you can use uh, matplotlib.hist uh, method you just need to change this uh, source from image to uh, BGR so B uh, G and R okay so now what we are going to do is we are going to run our code and let's see what happens so it's giving me uh, this error because I'm reading this image in the grayscale mode. So I'm going to uh, remove this extra parameter from I am read because we want to read uh, this uh, image in the color form and then only we will be able to get the BGR uh, channels, right? In the grayscale mode, there are no BGR channels. So I'm going to run this uh, script once again and let's see what happens. So you can uh, see uh, this histogram of blue channels and green channels and the red channels. And these are the images which are loaded in these different uh, channels. So this is the Im image which is loaded in the, the blue channel and this is the green and this is the red channel. And you can see uh, the histogram of each channel differently using uh, matplotlib. So let me uh, just uh, close all these windows. Now there is a method in CV2 also, which is called calc hist, which is going to give you the histogram of an image. So for uh, that, what you can do is, I'm going to uh, just just uh, comment all uh, the this code because I just want to show how you can use the CV2 uh, calc hist. Uh, method okay so what you can do is you can use a method so let's say hist and then cv dot calc hist and this method takes a few arguments so the first argument here will be the image so it's the source which you give but the only special thing is you just give uh, this image in the square brackets okay the second argument here is the channels so it is the index of channels for which we calculate the histogram so here in our case because we are going to uh, read the image in grayscale mode we can uh, just uh, give the channel zero here so for one channel you can give a zero here for different channel you can give a zero one two uh, value the next argument here is the image mask so to uh, find histogram of full image 
it is given as a uh, none because our uh, because our image is loaded in the gray scale mode so we can give here none the next value is the hist size so this hist size is the representation of bin counts and this is also given in the square bracket so we are going to just say 256 here the next argument is the range so range will uh, vary from 0 to 256 so minimum and the maximum range of uh, the x-axis you can say so 256 and then we can just show this uh, hist or histogram inside the plt so plt dot plot method so dot plot and then we can just uh, give this uh, histogram value here okay so let's run this code and let's see what happens so you can see you get the histogram of uh, this image using the opencv calc hist method and what are the uses of uh, the histogram so a uh, histogram can tell you whether or not your image has been properly exposed so when you take a digital image uh, it's very useful it, it can also tell you whether the lighting conditions were flat or harsh when you took that image and using the histogram you can also make the adjustments uh, which will work best for your uh, digital images so this uh, the usefulness of the histograms we will see in the later videos this was just the basics about the histograms uh, in OpenCV so I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video Hey guys, welcome to the next video on OpenCV tutorial for beginners using Python. In this video, we will discuss about template matching in OpenCV. So first of all, what is template matching? So template matching is a method of searching and finding the location of a template image inside a larger image. In OpenCV, uh, there is a method called match template for achieving this purpose so let's get started and let's see an example about it so i have uh, this simple code which just loads this image and let's see uh, what this image looks like so this is uh, the image and this is the messy image and what i want to do is i want to uh, match the face template which i have which uh, looks like this which is the smaller template which is also available inside this image so this will act like a template for us and we will try to find this template inside this larger image so let's get started and let's see how we can uh, search this template inside this larger image so first of all what we need to do is obviously we need to uh, load this image and also load our template so before uh, loading our template image I'm going to just convert my original image which is the larger image into the grayscale image so I have declared uh, this variable gray underscore image and then I'm going to just say cv dot cvt color which is going to convert my image img and let's convert this image into cv2 dot color underscore bgr to gray now let's load our uh, face image which is called messy underscore face uh, dot jpg so I'm going to just change this name mercy underscore uh, face dot jpg and this will be our face image or you can also say uh, this is a template and i'm going to also load this image as a grayscale image so i'm going to just pass the second argument in the read method as zero which is going to load this messy image as a grayscale image 
Now in the next line we will uh, simply uh, use this method which is called match template and we are going to uh, save it into some variables. So we can just say res is equal to cv2 dot match template which is this method which takes few argument. First is our image so I am going to pass our grayscale image here. The second argument here will be the template which we are trying to search inside uh, this uh, image. So this will be our template. The third is the method. So the method can be uh, a several method. There are several methods available for the template matching. So I want to show you these method for the template matching. So you can see a uh, type of template matching operations and there is separate formula involved in order to match that template inside that image. So, so for now we are going to use this method which is tm underscore c cof underscore normed dot tm underscore c cof uh, normed which is this method. Now let's try to print this uh, result and let's see what uh, is the content inside uh, this result. So I'm going to just print the content inside uh, this uh, result which we got. So I'm going to run this code and this image is loaded. But for now we are interested in uh, this uh, array matrix which you are seeing here. So you can see when you observe these values carefully, you will see uh, all are relatively uh, smaller values. So uh, you can see uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 almost uh, every value is around uh, until 0 0.3. So the maximum value I can see here is 0 0.3. So let me just show this image once again and the, the template also. So what this result contains is uh, these all values and there will be one value which contains uh, the number for example 0 0.8 or uh, uh, the brightest point. Okay. So if here this uh, uh, matrix contains a value which have the value 1, it is the brightest point and it will be there inside this image after applying this match template method which will be around this point at this point at which uh, this template matches. So top left corner of this template. So at the point at which this left top corner of this image will match inside this large image there will be a brightest point there and that brightest point will be reflected inside this uh, image in the form of uh, this uh, decimal number and all the other values will be slightly uh, darker, darker values. Okay, So that's how uh, this matrix, from this matrix we will come to know the, the top left corner of uh, the template inside this larger image. So now how can we uh, filter out that value which is the brightest point inside this matrix. So all the points uh, you can see looks like uh, under 0 0.3 but there are some points here you can see three dots and there are thousands and thousands of uh, values uh, will be available here. All the values are not printed. Okay. So what we are going to do is we are going to try to find out the brightest point. So this we can uh, find out with the numpy method. Uh, there is a method called where uh, using which we can find out uh, or filter out those values which are greater than certain number. So I'm going to uh, first of all uh, declare a variable called uh, threshold is equal to I'm going to declare the value of threshold initially as 0 0.8 which will be a relatively brighter point uh, inside the matrix which we are getting uh, using this result uh, uh, variable right. 
and then there is a method called uh, where numpy where so i'm going to declare once again loc variable and then np dot uh, where method and here we are going to pass our uh, result which we got and we are going to filter out using uh, this expression so this will be a boolean expression so i'm going to just say give me all those values which are greater than or equal to the threshold inside this result matrix okay so this where method is going to uh, just evaluate this expression each and every value will be evaluated and if this value inside the matrix is greater than 0.8 which is our threshold then it's going to uh, give those values to us so let's print out those values after the filtering out of uh, most of the values and let's uh, just print this loc variable also so i'm going to run this uh, code once again and uh, you can see here this is the matrix which we uh, got so you can see this is the array which we got so still we can increase this threshold in order to find out only one point so there are several points available here so let's say i'm going to increase uh, this uh, value to 0 0.9 and let's run this code again and you will see only two points 85 and 220 so this is what we were expecting so we wanted to find out uh, this point which will be the brightest point uh, inside this uh, result matrix so once we got the brightest point uh, which will be around uh, here which will be the top left corner as I said of this template and it will be located somewhere here in the original image then we can draw the rectangle uh, around this original image uh, same as the size of this template so this will be uh, the easier task because we already know the width and height of uh, uh, this template we already know how to get the width and height of uh, this template and same size uh, rectangle we just want to uh, draw on this original image so let's see uh, how we can do this so there is already uh, a method so I'm going to just declare two variables width and height and uh, you already know uh, the method so template dot shape is going to give you the shape of uh, your uh, image right so I'm going to just say template dot shape and then inside the square brackets we are going to just give uh, two colons and uh, minus one this means that we uh, want to get the column and the rows value in the reverse order so width and height that's why uh, I have given this minus uh, one index here now in the next step what we are going to do is uh, we are going to uh, just draw all the rectangles uh, where the template is is matched so uh, by seeing this uh, template image and the original image we know that there is only one uh, messy face inside uh, this image but let's say there are several number of uh, uh, matched templates inside our original image uh, for that we need to iterate over uh, the result which we got after applying the filter on the result so for that we are going to uh, just iterate over that result in our case as we know that there is only one point uh, so uh, we don't even uh, need to iterate over it but if there are multiple number of uh, matched templates then this uh, for loop will be uh, handy so for uh, pt in your uh, uh, loc variable so we are going to just say the zip which is going to iterate over this loc variable so asterisk loc and then we are going to find out the width and height here also so uh, we are just reversing the x-axis and y-axis right 
So, we are going to just uh, say colon colon minus 1 here and then uh, once again inside this for loop. So, cv2 dot uh, rectangle method and the first argument here will be our original image because we want to draw the rectangle on the original image. The second uh, argument will be the first point of the rectangle. So, the first point will be uh, this one p t which we are getting using the loc uh, uh, variable. So, as you all know that the first point here will be the top left corner of the rectangle and the second point here will be the bottom right corner. So, how can we get the bottom right corner? We will get the bottom right corner using uh, this p t uh, variable and then uh, on the 0th index we are going to just add the width comma on the first index. So, p t uh, square bracket first uh, we are going to add the height. Okay? So, essentially we uh, have just found out the width and height of our template and we are getting the second point using this addition on the first point width and height. So, it is going to give us this uh, bottom right uh, corner of uh, this template or this point. So, this is how we are getting uh, our two points to draw the rectangle. Now, the third and fourth variable will be uh, simple which uh, are the color. So, you can just say uh, 0 comma 0 comma 255 which will be the green color and the width let us say 2 here. So, we want to give the width 2 here. So, let us run this code and let us see what happens. So, I am going to run this code and you can see uh, this red uh, rectangle is drawn on the face of the messy and you can uh, here also see this rectangle will match our template image. So, whatever uh, image is inside this rectangle will be uh, exactly same as our template. And once again you can see the result. Uh, let me explain uh, this code once again. So, if this point, this threshold will be uh, uh, point 0 0.08 let us say. In the case of point 0 0.09 threshold we are only getting two values uh, this 85 and 220 right. That is why we are seeing the clear rectangle here. When we uh, are uh, giving the th threshold 0 0.8 here, let us see what happens. So, I am going to run this code once again. You can see there will be uh, this rectangle, but it will be much thicker. Why it is uh, much thicker? Because we are getting several number of values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, we are getting the 9 points on the x axis and the y axis. So, this for loop will iterate 9 times and this rectangle will be drawn 9 times on the image and that is why this uh, rectangle is much thicker. Let us uh, uh, just change this value to 0.9 once again and you will see this rectangle is uh, you know the single rectangle that is why it is uh, much thinner right. Now, uh, when you give this value let us say we give the value 0 0.3. So, most of the point as you can see here have the value 0 0.3 and when we run this code you will see so many rectangles here. So, that is why this thresholding is essential for us to find out the brightest point or the value which have the maximum uh, value. Right? So, that is why we were filtering out uh, this these points and finding out uh, the values more than 0 0.9 threshold. And uh, about the methods, so let us uh, try different methods. So, let us try to uh, give different uh, methods here. These two methods uh, behave little bit differently. So, uh, we can uh, start with uh, this uh, TMCORR normed 
and uh, we can apply it here and it's going to give us uh, this kind of uh, result. You can see we are getting uh, several uh, points here after filtering. So, uh, let us try to uh, increase this value to 0 0.95 and let us uh, rerun this code and let us see what happens. So, now you are getting uh, 4 values. Uh, you can uh, also filter that out. Let us say 0 0.99. Now, let us see what happens. So, now you are getting only 2 values. Okay, so, you need to uh, try to change this value to the maximum point. So, try to change this value and you will uh, get uh, this kind of uh, rectangle, only one rectangle. So, every method is going to give you different uh, uh, result and that is why you need to uh, try all the result. Not all the result will give you the perfect uh, rectangle or template matching. So, you need to try different methods uh, on your uh, images. So, so, this is how you can uh, do template matching in OpenCV. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video.